ARC 5 The History Engraving Stars Chapter 44, Nothing Left Unsaid Otto raised his hand and dropped that bombshell, plunging everyone in the room into a state of shock. The unverified existence of the Book of Wisdom was just confirmed, not by anyone else but by one of their own. It was only natural that they'd be shocked, with Subaru being the most shocked of them all. Subaru, why would you have the Book of Wisdom? Otto, before you misunderstand, let me explain. I was indeed the one who brought the so-called Book of Wisdom into the city, but the book isn't mine. I was pretty shocked when I heard the witch cult's request as well. Anastasia, so-called? That's a curious way to put it. What do you mean? As Otto's answered the shaken Subaru, Anastasia picked up on that descriptor and asked. At that, Otto looked around at the others, and... Otto, you guys all know about the Book of Wisdom, right? Simply put, it's like the Gospels. Those suspicious-looking books of prophecy, that the witch cultists have. Except it seems to be the original, I heard that the difference in accuracy is huge. Anastasia, the Gospels original? It might be a stretch, but that reminds me of the prophecies of the Dragon Annal Stone. Though of course, their credibility, reputation, and standpoints are nowhere near the same. Otto, I've never seen the Dragon Annal Stone and the Gospel's prophecies in action so I can't say anything about their reliability. And the same goes for the Book of Wisdom, I'm afraid. By the time I got my hands on it, the book was already nothing more than mostly burned remains. Subaru, burned remains. Otto's description matched the fates of both volumes of the Book of Wisdom in Subaru's mind. One belonged to Beatrice, and was lost in the flames of the burning Forbidden Library. The other belonged to Roswell, and, according to Ram, was lost in the burning sanctuary. It was hard to say how much of its creator, Akidona's testimony could be trusted, but if her words were to be believed, then both volumes should have been burned. In that case, what Otto obtained must be its charred remains. Anastasia, I see. I think I know why Otto Kun brought the book into Priestella now. It's to seek the help of Restoration Master Darts, isn't it? Otto, that's correct. With that simple reply, Otto nodded to Anastasia's conclusion. Though both Julius and Reinhard appeared to accept this with an air of understanding, Subaru seemed confused by the term he had never heard before. Subaru, hey don't all suddenly go ah and leave me out of the loop here. What's a restoration master? Anastasia, just as the name implies, they are light magic specialists who can restore objects to their original forms. Darts, who lives in this city, is quite a famous member of their circle. Even books that are more than half damaged can be restored with pretty good results, if given enough time. Otto, I managed to make contact with Master Darts and give him the remains of the Book of Wisdom. So the book should be in his workshop at the moment. With Otto's testimony, the Book of Wisdom's whereabouts has finally been revealed. Garfield, but then, when did Otto Bro meet that guy? Otto, yesterday, after the negotiations with Muse Company fell apart. Once everyone went their separate ways, I paid a visit to Master Darts. We had a chat in private, and he seemed pretty enthusiastic about taking on the job. Subaru could just imagine Otto going pale in the face when he heard Book of Wisdom come up during the upheavals today. That explains how the burned Book of Wisdom survived and why it was brought to this city, but Otto's motives were still unknown. Just why would he want to restore the Book of Wisdom? Honestly, Subaru had no good impressions for the Book of Wisdom. It was an ominous book not only associated with its creator, Ikidona, but with the Gospels in the hands of the witch cult. It was the reason Beatrice was bound in the Forbidden Library for four hundred years, and the reason Roswell's plots wrought violence upon the sanctuary. The truth is, Subaru was relieved when he heard that the books were destroyed. Otto, I won't go into the details of how I acquired it or why it's here to be restored. I only intended to clarify the Book of Wisdom's existence and its current location. Anything beyond that is an internal matter within our faction. Julius, but now we have the witch cult listing the Book of Wisdom as one of their demands. Whose responsibility do you think that is? Otto, I don't think anything the witch cult does can be blamed on anyone other than the witch cult. But if you insist on it, I'll have to make some unfriendly remarks of my own. 
Otto stood his ground in front of Julius' protests. And, seeing Otto turn his gaze to Anastasia, Julius quickly shook his head. Julius, my apologies. I said something useless just now. Naturally, I have no intention of laying the blame on you. The witch cult's crimes will be properly repaid when we exact punishment upon them. Otto, agreed. Otto nodded to Julius' determined words while stealing a glance at Subaru. But, seeing that secret gaze, Subaru couldn't say a word. What was Otto thinking? Even if Subaru had no intention of suspecting him, he still had no idea what he was up to. Seeing Subaru like this, Otto quietly moved his lips. Otto, let's talk later. The message got through. He'll explain everything, then. In that case, they better put the matter on hold for now. Reinhard, now that the Book of Wisdom's existence has been confirmed, we can't be so sure that the part about artificial spirits is just delusional ramblings. With that settled, Reinhard started off with a new topic. Though it was only going with the flow of things, now that Otto has already revealed something potentially disadvantageous to himself, there was no reason for Subaru to continue withholding his. Subaru, Anastasia San. Anastasia, I know I know. Well, this won't be easy. Seeing Subaru seeking her consent, Anastasia took off the scarf around her neck. She spread it out on the table, while everyone else tilted their heads at her determined expression. But, what she did next turned all their tilted heads straight. Anastasia, no need to play possum anymore, Echidona. You can speak up now. Scar Fox, in my case, rather than playing possum, wouldn't playing fox be more appropriate, Anna? Dash. Following Anastasia's call, the white fox scarf stretched out its limbs with a will of its own. Seeing this, the same expressions of shock washed over Julius and Ricardo's faces. It seems Anastasia had hidden artificial spirit Echidona's existence even from the members of her own faction. Ricardo, hey miss. I do know that thing. The hell is that thing. Anastasia, sorry for hiding it from you, Ricardo. Julius too. This child would be the artificial spirit we're talking about. Her name's Echidona, and she's been my partner in crime for a long, long time. Scarf Fox, hey Ricardo. It'd be pretty awkward to introduce myself like we've just met when I've technically known you for ages. We can be all buddy-buddy just like usual if you want. Echidona was exceptionally friendly to a Ricardo who looked like he was looking at something creepy. And, as off-put as Ricardo was by the white fox's attitude, Julius' face looked even more shocked. Faced with the secret his master had hidden from him, his pupils were wavering with a rare and unconcealable dismay. Julius, then that means, Anastasia Summer is also a spirits arts user? Anastasia, NNNN not exactly. There is no spiritual contract between me and Echidona. I just don't have the knack for it. And also, unlike ordinary spirits, Echidona can't fight at all. Scar Fox, that's right, I'm as incompetent as it gets. I'm afraid I might even be the weakest spirit there is. So weak that even the spirit knight couldn't sense my presence. Julius, is that, so? No, but then... Julius' suspicions were dismissed by Anastasia and Echidona in turn. But, rather than being assured, he turned his gaze toward Subaru, who was standing at the sidelines. There was a certain sharpness in the yellow gaze he directed at Subaru. Julius, why does Subaru look like he already knows? When I, as your knight, didn't know, how could he? Anastasia, it's not like that, it's... Subaru. It's because she's an artificial spirit, just like my partner, Beatrice. After we heard the witch cult's demands, Anastasia San explained it to me, so I only found out really recently, not much different from you. Julius, she's an artificial spirit? Anastasia Summer, is this true? Cutting Anastasia off, Subaru explained to the stupefied Julius. Seeing Anastasia nod to his question, Julius muttered, Is that so? and briefly closed his eyes as if to take it all in before exhaling a deep sigh. Julius, I'm sorry I interrupted you. Please forgive me for any displeasure I might have caused you, 
Anastasia Summer. I am deeply ashamed. Anastasia, I've no right to chastise you when I've been keeping it secret all this time. I should be asking your forgiveness instead. Julius gave Subaru a nod and apologized to Anastasia. But, seeing Julius' apology from the side, Ricardo grabbed Ikedona off of the table. Ricardo, still, that's really mean, miss. How long have we known each other? Why do you keep something like that from me? I'm kinda hurt. Is that all we are to each other? Scarf Fox, I'd appreciate if you don't handle me so roughly. Even in this form, I'm still quite finicky about my hair. And we wouldn't want to damage Anna's adorable appearance, now would we? Ricardo, pretty glib-tongued, ain't ya? Uck, never mind. I'll let it go this time. After pulling and squishing it to his heart's content, Ricardo seemed satisfied and let the white fox go. Landing on the table, the white fox quickly scuttled over to Anastasia, wrapped around her neck, and became inanimate once more. Having resided there for long, it was impressive how quickly it could return to its lifeless state. Anastasia, and so, the artificial spirits exist as well, that said, just like Otto Kun's Book of Wisdom, I've no intention of handing this child over to the witch cult. Subaru, sorry for keeping it secret. But, it's the same with me. Biko is my partner. I won't even let her hold hands with those lunatics. Anastasia and Subaru both asserted their decision to refuse the witch cult's demands. Hearing this, Reinhard nodded, and... Reinhard, I know, of course. We cannot accept a single one of their demands. Although, perhaps the one about wedding their bride could be overlooked. Subaru, absolutely not. Because the bride those assholes are talking about is Amelia. Otto, PFF? Amelia Summer's been taken? And here I was wondering why I haven't seen her around, so she's in trouble? Couldn't you have brought it up sooner? Reinhard widened his eyes and the shocking news sent Otto's eyes spinning. Subaru clenched his teeth in front of those two's reactions and continued with, Sorry. Subaru, it was all my fault, I watched her get taken away. But, since they're talking about a wedding, they shouldn't have done anything to hurt her. So we have to go over there, kill them, and bring her back. Absolutely, absolutely. Reinhard, yes, we will. We absolutely cannot allow this. Just the thought of regular scent rage boiling within Subaru's mind, and, in support of that indignation, Reinhard burnished his intent to fight. It was an aura so dependable, that it was terrifying. Without a doubt, his presence was tremendously reassuring. And, at this thought, Subaru turned his gaze to the corner of the room, toward the man who had stayed out of the conversation thus far. Sitting there, Leaning against the wall, his expression was hidden behind his helmet. Subaru, hey, Al. You should join the conversation too. You haven't said a word since the end of the speech. Our most lethal weapon got held up all because of that guy you brought. You better do something to make up for that, you know. Walking over, Subaru called to the downcast Al. And, sighing at the lack of a reaction, Subaru brought up Reinhard's father, Heinkel. Heinkel had taken Felt hostage and effectively pinned Reinhard in place. This clear-cut betrayal by turning a weapon on a royal selection candidate was not only a crime of les majesty, but fell nothing short of treason. Normally, there's no way an offender could escape the death sentence after committing such a heinous crime, but just how will Reinhard handle this? At least, Subaru couldn't lean it from the side of Reinhard's face. Al, I'm sorry, but I'm out. Subaru, huh? Perhaps distracted with his thoughts on Reinhard, Subaru didn't react until Al had already stood up. Taking his back off of the wall, Al looked like he was about to walk right past Subaru. Realizing this, Subaru quickly grabbed Al's shoulder, turning him around. Subaru, W wait. You're out? What are you talking about? We need every fighter we can get right now, and you want to leave us. What are you crazy? Al, crazy or whatever, you'd be crazy to count me as a fighter to begin with. Any random guy you pull from the shelters who's been in a fight'll be better than me. So it doesn't matter if I go. Subaru, 
the hell is that? Don't give me that moody bullshit. What's going on all of a sudden? If you got something to say, say it. Al, you're the only person I don't want to hear that from, bro. Shaking off Subaru's arm, Al's penetrating glare pierced into Subaru from inside his helmet. That indiscernible gaze and uncharacteristic tone sent a chill crawling up Subaru's back. It was unlike hostility or murderous intent, but a fiery emotion all the same. Subaru felt as if he had seen that inexplicable emotion from somewhere before, but he couldn't remember where or what it was. And he went without understanding as they continued their standoff, when... Question mark my inspiration is flashing. Listen if you please, your gaze makes heat swell in my chest. Subaru, shut up. Question mark by Aichi? Subaru reflexively lashed back at the happy-go-lucky voice that came out of nowhere. The target jumped at that shout and tumbled flamboyantly over the table behind her. Rolling around, moaning and wailing, it was a girl with auburn skin. Subaru, you're... Liliana? Liliana, you're Giaoo. My elbow. My knee. Every bone that can be called a bone in my body is shattered. All six of my ribs are broken. There's no mistake about it. The one energetically rolling on the floor in front of Subaru was the bard, Liliana. Seeing her the same as ever, Subaru didn't even bother pointing out that humans had more than six ribs but only patted his chest in relief. Subaru, I was pretty worried after we got separated, but I'm glad to see you safe. That's a relief. Liliana, safe? Can't you see I'm on the verge of death here? How can you pat your chest in relief in front of a damsel in distress, what kind of sick humor is that? My inspiration is flashing. Listen if you please, fingers, ears, and eyes tilde. Subaru, you're still pretty lively, aren't you? Sitting up cross-legged on the floor, she strummed her lullily, suddenly a picture of health. Although the abruptness of her recovery was rather unsettling, Subaru was just glad that she was all right. Subaru, but, how did you get to the city hall? It must have been dangerous wandering around outside. Question mark naturally, isn't that for me to decide? Commoner. Subaru, G.H. Before he could ask Liliana how she got here safely, an arrogant voice answered the question in her place. With the ringing of high-heeled footsteps, a woman in resplendent red stepped into the meeting room, adorned in rouge from head to toe, she swept her blood-red eyes across the room. Priscilla, looks like all the actors are gathered. It was good of you rabble to have gotten ready for the star to arrive. Be sure to keep it up in the future. Smiling in a good mood holding a spread fan over her lips, it was Priscilla. Her sudden entrance surprised everyone including Subaru, but the first to react was none other than her servant, Al. Al, P. Princess San. So you're all right. I was worried when I couldn't find you. Priscilla, mm, is that Al? What is the meaning of you dallying with these peasants instead of serving me? Is it not your duty to look upon my figure, listen to my voice, inhale my scent, and obey my commands? And Schult, making me have to look for him myself, there should be a limit to your insolence. Question mark P. Please forgive me, Priscilla Summer. While Priscilla mercilessly berated her worried servant, a little boy in butler's uniform peeped out his head from behind her, timidly clinging to her dress. It seems that Priscilla not only saved Liliana but her butler as well while strutting around a city overrun by the witch cult. Subaru, what kind of crazy audacity is that? Subaru spilled a sigh at the fine line between exceeding bravery and recklessness. Hearing this, Priscilla turned her glare to Subaru. Snapping close her fan, she briskly walked over to him and. Priscilla, you there, don't move. Subaru, HK. With a swoosh of wind, she held the tip of her fan to Subaru's throat. As usual, moving with inconceivable speed, she reached him before his eyes could even register her motion. But, since Reinhard did not intervene, Subaru figured he was in no actual danger. Subaru, what are you doing? We're having an important conversation here, we don't have time for. Priscilla, good. So that clumsy broadcast earlier was your voice, then? 
Subaru, yeah, what about it? As pathetic as it was to rely on Reinhard's lack of movement as his indicator, Subaru chose to huff back at the huffing Priscilla. At that response, she narrowed her eyes. Priscilla, decidedly, I will not tolerate anyone getting more attention than myself. So, I'll prove how obviously superior I am to the likes of you. Subaru, huh? Ow! Flicking up the fan at Subaru's neck, it snapped against his chin so hard that tears came pouring out his eyes. With this, Priscilla left him, and imperiously sat herself down in one of the seats at the round table. Priscilla, such a worthless chair. I can tell how cheap it is just by sitting on it. Making that scolding remark about the quality of the furniture, she swept her gaze across the faces seated at the table. Then, opening her red painted lips, a splendidly gruesome smile rose on her face. Priscilla, come now, I will allow you to tell me everything about the current situation. Be good slaves and fulfill your responsibilities to your utmost. As reward, I will lend you my help. Remember to be grateful. Al, wait, Princess San. Now that we've found each other, there's no reason to stay here, right? We should get out of this dangerous place and... Priscilla, are you suggesting I run away, Al? If so, then you are gravely mistaken. Seeing Priscilla reclining into her seat as if intending to participate in the conference, Al hurriedly protested, but Priscilla shot back a glare, instantly freezing Al inside his metal helmet. Priscilla, are you listening? I am the one who decided to stay in this city. And I will be the one to decide whether to leave it. I do not accept instructions from anyone. Besides, you want me to turn my back on these rabid fools and shamelessly run away? Who do you take me for? Al. Priscilla, everything in this world works in my favor. So why should I leave and allow this obnoxious mess to continue? If you wish to call yourself my servant, then know this, Al. I am favored by divine providence, and thus, my actions are divine providence. Priscilla's will could not be swayed. Everyone present, most of all Al, knew this. Seeing Al slump his single shoulder, the young butler, Schultz, quietly snuggled against him. And, wryly smiling at his consoling gesture, Al made up his mind as well. Subaru, Otto, you have a minute? Otto, yeah, let's go. As the round table began briefing Priscilla on the current situation, Subaru whispered to Otto. Apparently having anticipated this, Otto complied without a hint of surprise. Subaru, Garfield, let me know when they're done. Leaving this instruction behind, Subaru left the meeting room with Otto. And as soon as they were outside, they turned and faced each other in the hallway. Meeting Subaru's gaze, there was no confusion in Otto's eyes. He knew exactly what they needed to talk about. Subaru, why the hell are you trying to restore the Book of Wisdom? No, before that, when did you pick up its remnants? Otto, it was a year ago, after we've settled the problems in the sanctuary. After Amelia Summer's snow disappeared, I was wandering around the premises when I... Well, it wasn't exactly by chance. I heard what happened from Ram San, so I was actively looking for its burned remnants as well. Subaru, so then, the one you found was Roswell's Book of Wisdom? Otto, yes. I was unusually lucky since that happened to be the place I wanted to check out. Unusually lucky must be a jab at how usually unlucky he was. Although Otto was wryly smiling, Subaru was in no mood to share that sentiment. Because Otto's reasons for doing this were still a knot inside Subaru's chest. Otto, tell me honestly, Natsuki-san, what do you think of Margrave Mathers? Subaru, Roswell? As Subaru sank into silence, Otto posed him this question. It sounded both somewhat relevant to the topic at hand, and yet not relevant at all. For a moment, Subaru pondered on the question. Subaru, well, I think we definitely can't let down our guard about that guy. Not after everything that happened a year ago. But, since that guy's goals are clear now, and assuming they haven't changed, I don't see him as an immediate threat. In fact, now that we understand each other, I kind of feel like an accomplice. Otto, I don't trust Margrave Mathers at all. Otto declared, 
pointing out how naive Subaru's thinking was. Hearing this, Subaru widened his eyes at the sharpness of that statement. Otto, you mentioned what happened a year ago, yes, that's true. But he has been plotting long before what happened in the sanctuary. You and Amelia Summer seem to be awfully forgiving about that. Subaru, it's not that we forgave him. Everything that guy does makes me want to scream what the hell, and I'm still super pissed off. But, the fact is, we need that guy's help. So there's not much we can do, and Amelia has the same considerations. Otto, that's called being forgiving, though I'm not saying that's a bad thing. Otto shot an impatient gaze at Subaru, conveying his sense of urgency. In other words, Otto was telling him that he wasn't nearly wary enough. Of course, Subaru knew that it was something he had to keep eye on, but... Otto, it's fine. The way you're approaching it is fine. There's no need to change that. Since I'll be seeing to the necessary precautions. Subaru, precautions? Otto, as the internal minister, I've had plenty of opportunities to interact with Margrave Mathers. From what I've seen over the past year, I didn't notice any signs of scheming or strange behaviors. But, that's not to say he couldn't have already laid his plans before that. He could easily have put some sort of delayed activation in place. Subaru, dash dash. Subaru closed his mouth. Otto's wariness and concerns got through. He had every reason to distrust Roswell. It was just the natural consequence of that man's actions, be it good or bad. Though in this case, mostly bad. Otto, if he follows the Book of Wisdom's every word and believes that it foretells the future, then one look inside the book will let us know everything that he is planning. That way we can take the necessary measures to guard against any betrayals in the future. Subaru, you mean, you want to restore that book? Because you don't trust Roswell? Otto, quite the opposite. It's precisely because I don't want to distrust my allies that I want to make sure. At least, I want to know for sure that nothing unfortunate is going to happen. So I kept the Book of Wisdom in hopes of restoring it, I didn't consult you before doing this, sorry about that. With this apology, Otto lowered his head. But, in front of him, Subaru couldn't say a word. He did not feel like he had the right. Otto's concerns and the actions he took to resolve them. They were all things that Subaru and Emilia should have noticed. In fact, the pains he took to do this were entirely for Subaru and Emilia's sake. Now that he realized how Otto had been silently helping him, Subaru felt at once ashamed, remorseful, and incredulous that he hadn't realized this earlier. And why would Otto do this for him? Was it just because they are friends? Otto, I won't tell you why, though. It's pretty boring anyway. As if having read Subaru's thoughts, Otto replied. Being beaten to the punch by the smiling Otto, Subaru breathed a deep sigh. Subaru, somehow, it's like you're always bailing me out, you know. Otto, that may be, but I think you're good just the way you were when you made that broadcast, Natsuki-san. Otto scratched his head, while Subaru clicked his tongue and dropped his shoulders, a bit embarrassed by his considerations. Subaru, I understand. I'm on board about the Book of Wisdom. But the problem is, those assholes are still looking for it. So what do we actually do? Otto, regardless of whether it's successfully restored or not, I think we better get it back. There's a great chance that Master Darts could get hurt, and that'd be the last thing I want. Subaru, but we're going to simultaneously attack all four control towers. We don't have any forces to spare for that. Otto, I may be a non-combatant, but I can more than handle myself if I travel by the waterways. I may not look like it, but duping animals like water dragons is one of my top strong suits, you know. Putting his hand beside his mouth, Otto must be boasting of his divine protection of anima whispering. In fact, when it comes to running away, Otto's divine protection would actually be quite handy. Besides, the enemy's main forces were concentrated at the control towers. Assuming they didn't bring any extra which cultist lackeys, Otto shouldn't be in too much danger. Otto, rather than worry about me, you should be thinking about the assault teams. You have to save Emilia Summer, after all. That's quite the responsibility. Subaru, understood. 
I'll take that greedy asshole's head myself. That white-haired monster who took Emilia flashed across his mind. That, and the fact that he was a sin archbishop, meant that he was an enemy that must be defeated. Otto, shall we head back? They must be about done with the debriefing. Seeing the invigorated Subaru, Otto turned his head to the meeting room. But, just as Subaru nodded and was about head inside with him. Question mark Subaru Dono. He was stopped by a call from the stairway. There was no mistaking who that voice belonged to. The person upstairs, watching him with his stern blue pupils, was Wilhelm. Subaru, Otto, you go on ahead. Otto, all right. We'll continue this later. Otto went back into the meeting room while Subaru walked up the stairs to meet Wilhelm, waiting on the upper level. Then, as soon as they were at the same height, Wilhelm lightly bowed his eyes. Wilhelm, sorry I could not join the conference. I apologize for the inconvenience. Subaru, with the situation as it is, no one would think to blame you, Wilhelm San. So, um, how is Crush San? He heard she wasn't well. Or, not just unwell, but in quite a terrible state. As a woman, she probably wouldn't want anyone else to see her like that, either. Thinking back on the wretched state of his leg, he could imagine what kind of damage Crush must have sustained. And that thought alone made him regret imagining it. To Subaru query, Wilhelm softly cast down his eyes. Wilhelm, Crush Summer has asked to speak to you, Subaru Dono. May I trouble you to come with me? Subaru, Crush San asked for me? No, of course I'll come, but... Is that really all right? Wilhelm, it is her sincere wish. Though Ferris will not be happy about it. Subaru, I guess not. Ferris would probably have some bitter words to say to Subaru. After all, the only two who faced off against Capello on the top floor of the city hall were Subaru and Crush, and Subaru alone should have protected her. Wilhelm, if Ferris says something disrespectful, please do not mind him. And please forgive him, if possible. Deep down, he does understand. It's just that he is facing emotions that he could not process. Subaru, watching the person most important to him suffer. I can understand why he'd want to curse the people around him, if only just to take his mind off of the one he's worrying about. If venting his rage could ease some of his pain, then who could blame him? And so Subaru was prepared to take on some of his abuse as well. Wilhelm, this way. Without remarking on Subaru's reply, Wilhelm led Subaru towards the place where Crush would be waiting. Tick, tack, the regular rhythm of their footsteps echoed through the hallway. And on the way. Wilhelm, Subaru Dono, there is something else I need to tell you. Subaru, what is it? Is it something other than Crush San? Wilhelm, it's about the two swordsmen accompanying the Sin Archbishops. Unwittingly, he stopped his breath, it should have been so obvious, how did he let it slip his mind? Mimi's unsealable wound, inflicted by the divine protection of the Death God. The true identities of those super-class swordsmen should. Wilhelm, one of them is Eight-Armed Kurgan. A formidable swordsman who had been a general of the Volakian Empire, a man who should have died ten years ago. Subaru, a man who. Should have died? Um, Wilhelm San. Wilhelm, and the other. Wilhelm cut Subaru off just before he could ask his question. He stopped his steps, and Subaru followed suit. Then, Wilhelm turned his back, and sank into a momentary silence. Subaru took a step forward to peek at the side of Wilhelm's face, but instantly regretted it. He should not have seen it. Wilhelm, the other, is the previous generation sword saint, Theresia van Astria. My wife. Who should have died in battle against the white whale fifteen years ago? Subaru, dash dash. The fact that he could have kept his voice so steady must be a testament to the strength of his will. But when Subaru saw the wrenching agony that twisted the side of Wilhelm's face, all that impression fell away. Chewing his lips, with rage and grief interwoven within his eyes, a crazed passion contorted his wrinkled face beyond recognition, one look at that expression, and all his emotions were clear as day. 
Subaru, your wife. And a general of the Empire? Unless, they're actually still alive? Wilhelm, if that's... No, that isn't possible. Whether it's my wife or Kurgan, both of them are dead. That cannot be overturned. The dead are still dead, but being defiled. Subaru, if they're still dead, then... It's something like necromancy. Necromancy, magic that manipulates the dead, is quite common in fictional universes. Of course, as far as fiction is concerned, magic that can return the dead to life is quite common as well. Although, nothing so convenient exists in this world. This was something Subaru had painfully come to understand in the year and several months he had spent here. Wilhelm, magic that manipulate the dead are forbidden. Though I do know of someone who once used it. In the Demi-Human Wars, the civil war in Lugnica between humans and Demi-Humans decades ago, she was one of the three enemies of the kingdom fighting on the Demi-Humans' side. Subaru, three enemies of the kingdom? Wilhelm, the Demi-Human hero, Libre Fermi. The great strategist, Valga Cromwell. And, after pausing for a moment, Wilhelm, the witch, Sphinx. The abominable existence who, without batting an eye, ruthlessly spilled the blood of human and demi-human alike. The only witch besides Satella whose name remains in the history of the kingdom. Arc 5, Chapter 45, An Inescapable Curse. He only knew about witches aside from Satella from having met the six witches of sin in Echidna's tomb. That witches other than those somehow existed was devastating news. Subaru, then, Wilhelm San, if that sphinx which is involved with this raid by the witch cult. Are you saying, other than the archbishops there's another witch too? If so, the main enemies numbered four archbishops and two warriors, adding to that a witch joined to their forces made the already difficult power cost for the task become a desperate matter. At Subaru's concerns, Wilhelm, while raising his hand. Wilhelm, pardon me, my wording was unclear. The existence of the witch known as Sphinx perished in the Demi-Human War. That one could not have been involved in this raid. Subaru, the witch is dead? Is there no mistake? Pretending to be dead, and even after really dying having lots of freedom is the impression I have of witches. Satella was like that. Whenever Subaru violated the taboo it would draw her out, and in the Citadel of Dreams enjoying her afterlife, Echidna was the same. Even hearing they were dead guaranteed nothing at all, that was a witch. Wilhelm, what impression Subaru Dono has of witches I am unaware. But Sphinx is only named a witch, it is merely an existence which was called that. The fact is, the forces of the kingdom referred to it as such, but the concerned party never called itself the same. Subaru, calling them a concerned party. Did Wilhelm San ever meet them directly? Wilhelm there were many times during the Civil War. For the end of the Demi-Human War, the deciding moment may even have been the beheading of the Sphinx. Roswell, Bordeaux, and his wife were leading figures of that time. Subaru, Roswell? An unexpected name popping up caused Subaru to open his eyes wide. At that reaction from Subaru, Wilhelm slightly lowered his head for a moment and became immersed in thought. Wilhelm, I knew the Roswell Dono of two generations ago. Although back then I wasn't too friendly. She took care of me. Subaru, two generations ago. Ah, is that that case? Then the name Roswell is inherited from generation to generation. Wilhelm, unfortunately, she passed away soon afterward, and after that I grew distant from them. The current Lord Mathers is only a passing acquaintance. But this is all superfluous talk. He was now lending an ear to tales of surprising relationships, but the original topic was definitely not about that. Subaru nodded his head, and then Wilhelm with and so continued his tale. Wilhelm, not the Sphinx, but somehow a being using a spell that acts similarly, is my thought. The method of controlling the dead was at the time called cases of corpse soldiers. Subaru, corpse soldiers, that... Does it have anything like weaknesses? Wilhelm, from what I know, the corpse soldier is limited to a technique for moving the body. 
It is not such that it can bring back abilities possessed in life. It merely shames the dead while keeping the appearance, and actually reflects the skills of the culprit instead. Subaru, but, the, eight arms, and, that. He was at a loss for words. The one turned into a corpse soldier whose very death was being profaned was Wilhelm's wife. Nevertheless, at Wilhelm who had accepted it Subaru was speaking of it like he was hesitating. Wilhelm made a bitter face at Subaru's reluctance. Wilhelm, I thank you for your concern. But, it is necessary. M.H., my wife and Kurgan's skills are close to how they were in life. It simply exceeds the power corpse soldier can pull out. Subaru, then, isn't possible that this is something other than corpse soldier? If so, then your wife might not even have died. Wilhelm, my wife is dead. Because my strength was lacking. The side hanging onto a fragile hope here was Subaru. That Subaru's feelings Wilhelm's clear voice cut down with a single stroke. And the words Subaru could say to that elder swordsman's profile were none at all. Wilhelm, even at the time, that which could not simply be judged as merely a corpse soldier did very rarely exist. Whether it was due to aptitude in the procedure, or if rather another factor I do not know, but, we have to consider the strength of those two as such. Subaru, do you have a way to take them down? Wilhelm, thoroughly destroying the body, or cutting away to the curse mark somewhere on the body. Then the corpse soldier will return to a simple corpse. It must be done this way. The deeply thinking Wilhelm's voice could not easily be heard. Searching for what he should do, coming to conclusions with effort he was searching for it. His trembling voice, his clenched fist, his scrunched eyes, he was hiding nothing. Wilhelm, I apologize for holding you this long. Crush Summer cannot be made to wait any longer. Now, this way. Wilhelm bent his back and indicated the door at the room they had come up to. On the innermost part of the fourth floor, with a crumbled plate labeling it as a lounge was the room. Inside, Crush who had called Subaru was waiting. Passing Wilhelm's side, Subaru with the sound of footsteps headed for the door. Definitely, the distance to the door felt awfully long. The soles of his shoes stuck to the floor and interfered with Subaru's progress, that was the impression he got. That it was his defeated self's weakness, Subaru was clearly aware of it. Subaru, it's me. Natsuki Subaru. Is. Krush-san? He knocked on the door, and with a voice so quiet he wondered if it reached the other called out. Like that, after a moment's brief silence, the other side slowly opened the door. The face that appeared was Ferris. But, his appearance had changed entirely. Ferris, Subaru Canyon. Red eyes puffed up from crying and disheveled brown hair. Covering his body was, not his, but someone else's blood staining black, and with his white skin splattered he must not have had time to clean. His cheek and neck was also smeared with fresh blood. At that miserable appearance, his breath inadvertently caught in his throat. Subaru, Crush San called me, I heard. So. Ferris, yeah. Inside, she's on the bed, definitely don't do anything unnecessary please. A firm voice, with some hatred near the end. However, that hate was not directed at Subaru. It could be said to be directed at everything. Hating everyone in this world, rage with nowhere to go was now controlling Ferris. Taking a deep breath, Subaru followed Ferris inside. Even calling it a lounge, it was not a very spacious room. Long tables and chairs were arranged in two rows, and further back, the small room was divided by a threshold. The bed was past it. And, on that shabby bed lay her. Crush, nah, ski summer. The conscious Crush recognized Subaru had entered and called him by name. Reacting to that girl's voice, Subaru's neck grew rigid. Readying himself, feigning calm, calling out assuring words. To be unable to even do something so simple. Crush, my appearance is not presentable. My apologies. Subaru colon comma dot dot no, that's not, like that. It's not like that. Seeing the frozen appearance of Subaru,
Crush apologized in a lethargic voice. At that girl's sorrowful attitude, the shaken Subaru spoke with vague words. Having been drenched in Capella's blood and clothed in its curse, Crush was in a wretched state. Her neck, the back of her hands and feet, over all skin that could be seen dark blackened veins shone. It was not difficult to imagine that under the towels and blankets and clothes the skin there would be afflicted with the same, these black blood vessels that pulsed instead of circulating blood, as if a writhing serpent seemed to be strangling the thin crush's body instead. That formerly white, unblemished skin of hers was now being violated horribly. Of course, the damage was not limited to below the neck. The gallant crush's clever visage, reminiscent of a long-drawn sword, its left had received disfiguring stains. Compared to that, the right side of her face retained her beauty. That rather emphasized the contrast between the two sides, and made the unfairness of a noble person being defiled more apparent. As if covering the left eye, a patch was hung there, and the sight underneath it was difficult to imagine. Subaru, this is, the same curse of dragon's blood as on me? If it was just the same, then that much was not cruel at all. Knowing Crush Carsten, Subaru's worry did not end at that. He looked down at his own right leg. Like Crush's skin, it also was mottled and wrapped with blackened veins. However, Subaru's leg, terrible sight notwithstanding, was otherwise unaffected. Neither pain nor feelings of soreness were felt by him at all. But Crush was definitely different. Her breathing was labored, and whenever the dark veins pulsed, she sighed as if resisting pain. Subaru, Ferris. How is it not cured, he turned to gaze at the greatest healer in the kingdom. However, that Subaru's brief thought only served to hurt Ferris, who was gritting his teeth helplessly, even more. Biting down on his lips, stabbing his own arms with his nails while bowing his head was Ferris. Ferris understood his lack of power and was dismayed by it more than anyone else there. Knowing the relationship between the two, Subaru had no reason to doubt all possible methods beyond his imagination had been exhausted already. Subaru, Crush San, to me, what is it? Why, in such a painful situation had she called out for him? That there was something he could do, he didn't think so. Maybe there was something she wanted to say, to ask for revenge on the, lust, that had made her this way. Perhaps even some resentful words would be directed towards Subaru. Even if fed insults, even if curses are poured on, he'll accept it all. At Subaru's question, Crush opened her mouth as if it pained her to do so. Lending those lips his whole body, not missing the feeble sigh she gave, he focused and listened. And. Crush, un, unharmed, I'm relieved. Subaru, dash dash. Crush, the same, as me, were cursed too, I heard. Subaru felt a burden lift from her in the softness of her relieved sigh. At the same time, he understood the true feelings in his heart, and he grew so angry at his own stupidity he wanted to die. He had been thinking it would be easier to be criticized. So he had doubted Crush's integrity, and cut down in his view her noble heart. And she had just been truly worried, that Subaru had been afflicted with the same pain as herself. Subaru, saw, I'm sorry, Crush San. Having suspected her feelings, the result of things having been her suffering, being unable to suffer instead on her behalf, in a voice mixed with all those feelings he squeezed out, without realizing what he was doing, he stretched out his hand and grasped the hands Crush had weakly laid over her stomach. The black blood vessels had no special texture even if touched. That the feel of skin with this ruined of an appearance did not change was even more pitiful. But. Crush, Fu, you. Subaru, Gu. The suddenly falling sound of Crush's sigh, and at the same time a pained noise from Subaru's throat overlapped. Agony as if he had grasped a hot iron stabbed into him from his palm. In an instant, Subaru released Crush's hand and stared at the palm the sensation had come from. That blackened erosion was spreading over it. Subaru, W.H., at. Ferris, show me, Subaru Canyon. Grasping the groaning and hurt Subaru's hand, Ferris inspected the erosion. 
The light of healing blanketed the spot, but there was no sign of either the pain or the affliction fading away. Instead, Subaru, Ferris, crushed San's hand. Ferris, eh? The wide-eyed Subaru's gaze pulled Ferris to where he was looking, and those yellow eyes, seeing the same thing as Subaru now widened too. Subaru had grasped Crush's left hand, on that hand, though slightly, the blackened erosion had thinned. That change, and looking down at his right hand, what was passing through Subaru's mind was. Subaru, no way, it moved from Crush's body to mine, is that it? It could only be thought of like that. The touched hand and the change on his own was directly A plus and a minus. That the lightened curse had traveled to Subaru's body from Crush, there was no reason to doubt. Ferris, boo, but, I haven't changed at all. I examined Crush Summer's body, I touched her many many times since. Me, for me. At Subaru's hypothesis, Ferris shook his head. That was not joy at a possibility for healing being found, but rather an appearance of suspecting that the hypothesis was false. No, his own feelings were definitely different. Ferris, I can't make Crush Summer feel better. Subaru, then let's try it one more time. Pushing aside the taken aback Ferris, Subaru once again stood before Crush. Crush, with a face that was unaware of what had occurred yet was directing glistening eyes at the approaching Subaru. To not show a frozen face for that eye patch wearing single-eyed gaze, Subaru took a deep breath. To check it again, this time, he lightly brushed Crush's cheek. Subaru, goo, you. Immediately after, Subaru's brain was stabbed. With pain as if magma spilled into his veins. Through the tips of his fingers, the body-violating curse in Crush's body flowed in and burned his senses. Subaru, ga, ah. Feeling stabbing pains which were difficult to bear, Subaru loudly screamed and yanked his body away. Like that, falling back with the momentum, the hand which was touching Crush fell away. Subaru, ah, ha, ha. His lungs shivered, and his eyeballs cramped. Like a fish on land, parting his lips Subaru desperately sought oxygen. Ferris, Sue, Subaru Canyon, are you okay? Seeing his breathing start to calm, Ferris spoke to Subaru. Barely able to spare enough feeling to notice the hard floor he had landed on, he raised his body with difficulty. And gazing up at the face of Crush lying in bed. Subaru, how is it, Ferris? Was it a little effective? Ferris, ah. With a plop, Ferris who had confirmed Crush's condition sat back down again. He too would have seen with his own eyes. The cheek which was eroded by the curse was, from that curse, relieved a little bit. If such treatment was possible, then saving Crush was also. Crush, you can't, Natsuki Sama. To try once more Subaru rose. However, it was none other than Crush herself that stopped him. Not understanding the meaning of her words, Subaru asked. Subaru, did you not, notice? Your hand is. Crush, hand? Hearing this, she looked down at her right hand. And it was then that she finally realized the change that had occurred. Just like the right leg blackened veins spread over the skin. That much was fine. If it was that much, his resolve to take on Crush's curse would not be shaken. But, there was definitely something strange here. Compared to the erosion which had been taken from Crush, the extent was much greater. The erosion on her body, the darkened parts of her left hand and cheek had grown a shade lighter due to Subaru's touch. However, Subaru who had taken it up onto his right arm from the elbow down to the back of the skin had been completely covered by the blackened erosion. The degree of it was definitely not comparable at all. The ratio the curse was transferred it was not one to one. It was more on the level of ten to one. Subaru, no, even then. Whether that was cause to hesitate was another matter. There was pain in the moment of transfer. But, once it had been accepted onto the body, there was no sign yet that the curse would actually hurt Subaru. Compared to Crush's constant hellish suffering, what Subaru received was but for a moment. There, between man or woman, which side should bear the burden of its torture, 
there wasn't even any need to consider it, whether it was his right leg or right hand blackening, if it was for the sake of saving Crush it didn't matter. Crush, Natsuki Summer, that cannot be, I am unable to accept those feelings. Subaru, don't be silly. It only stings a little so it's fine. Compared to getting a tattoo while showing off and regretting it later, let's think about it as dirtying a body that was like that in the first place. I can take away the pain too. It's strange, but it doesn't give me any trouble. So. Crush, can you guarantee that will be true in the future? It could be that both Natsuki Summer and I become unable to fight. In this current situation that would be a fatal blow. Worrying more for the city and the people than her own body, that was Crush's judgment. It was logically sound, but not everything should be pressed forward with just that. Crush, Ferris, please stop Natsuki Summer. Ferris, I, I am. Crush, please. Because Natsuki Summer is now one who is needed by others than just myself. Ferris, if Subaru Canyon resolved to help. K. Crush Summer's suffering. Dot. The hesitating judgment of Ferris was one which kept Crush first. That nobody could blame him for. None of those present was in the wrong, after all. The notion that whatever is not wrong is right was mistaken. Crush, you must not be overwhelmed by the emotions of a single moment. Natsuki Summer, I ask of you. Subaru, Crush San, even then I am. Crush, didn't, you say so before. What's left, leave it all to me. Subaru, you. Crush's pleading eyes took hold of Subaru and would not let go. Had those reliable words come from his mouth? Hearing that, for Crush to say all that, was she telling him to? Crush, please say that to, me as well. Subaru, dash dash. Crush, all that's left, to leave it all to me. A pained smile was awaiting Subaru's words. Swallowing his breath and shifting his tongue in his dry mouth, Subaru quietly closed his eyes. Without thinking of the future, only immersed in what was in front of him, he was making her say things that didn't need to be said, so at least. Subaru, Crush-san, calmly rest here, please. Crush, Natsuki, Summer. Subaru, because everything that's left, you can leave it all to me. Crush, yes. If it was just filling the needed role and saying the desired words, then it just had to be done. Hearing Subaru's reply, Crush took a deep breath and seemed to relax. Her eyelids weakly blinking shut not a moment after proved that, up until now, by any means possible she had been holding onto attentiveness. At that moment breathing a quiet sigh, Crush once more began her time of battling with the effects of the curse. Subaru, sorry, Ferris. But I have to go now. Ferris, I'm, what should I, is it all right? Draping a towel like a blanket over Crush and standing up, Subaru heard a small voice as he was leaving. It was the first time Subaru had seen Ferris showing weakness. In his innermost thoughts, what he wanted now was to remain at Crush's side. But in the current situation, Ferris' ability would not allow for such a thing. Subaru, I need your strength. I'm not saying to leave City Hall. But if something happens, I'll let them know to evacuate the wounded here. So, I'll leave that that to you. Ferris, the one I wanted to save most, and I can't help them. Subaru, Ferris. Ferris, sorry. I said something silly, just give me a moment, please. While looking away, Ferris sat down on a chair next to the bed. Subaru finally lightly patted his shoulder and stepped out of the lounge. Unchanged from when he had entered, Wilhelm remained waiting in the hallway. Wilhelm, thank you very much for considering Crush Summer's feelings. Towards the returning Subaru Wilhelm said this. Did what happened within leak out outside, or perhaps Subaru's expression was just easy to read? Subaru, it isn't some noble tale like I considered her feelings. Since it's more a story of how I was encouraged, my body, what's up with it anyway? Taking on Crush's curse, and its effect being weakened against him in the first place, going back even further, the so-called witch factor and, return by death, all of it was really vague. One day, would he get to see their reasons and their end? Subaru, 
Crush San will leave it to Ferris. When everything is solved, I'm thinking of trying what I did before once more. Wilhelm, is that right arm all right? Subaru, at first glance it's a bit iffy. If I wore long sleeves and wore gloves it might be okay, for the sake of rescuing a pretty girl, just one scar that doesn't fade away isn't any trouble at all. Even though he had some aversion to it, that was Subaru's true feelings. If there wasn't any other solution, then taking on Crush's curse fully was also fine. Even if his body became pitch black because of it. Amelia, Rem, and Beatrice, he would have to beg forgiveness from all of them. Subaru, but, that's all talk for after we pass this hurdle and live. Wilhelm San, let's head down. They're probably talking about the plan to retake the control towers right now. Probably, all the top-class powers that this side could muster would already be gathered there. What followed after would depend on the cooperation and abilities of the Archbishops of Sin, as well as the timing and execution of the plan of attack. From the deadline imposed by the witch cult, only six hours were left. Wilhelm, Subaru Dono, regarding that matter I have a request. Subaru, a request? Wilhelm's words stopped Subaru as he headed for the stairs, the elder swordsman nodded his head with the lobby door behind his back, showing concern in his eyes for his mistress within. Wilhelm, if it is possible, please recommend for me the task of subjugating, lust. Since I understand well its powers of mutation and super-regeneration, I will request this of you. Subaru, is that revenge for Krush-san? Wilhelm, it is so, but beyond that, it is essential to capture, lust, alive and hear from it about what was done to Krush. For that I will even become a demon. Before cutting off its head, I will definitely pry from it the truth. The killing intent given off by the sword demon felt like a wave of heat to Subaru. Furiously, darkly, having been unable to do anything, Wilhelm's ardor to avenge his mistress now rose up like flames. Subaru, that spirit is fine, but are the corpse soldiers all right? Wilhelm, dash dash. Subaru, your wife, wouldn't you know her best? No matter what happens, Wilhelm will be needed to make judgments. Wilhelm, Subaru Dono, has Reinhardt arrived below? Wilhelm suddenly interrupted as he spoke of his concerns. Awkwardly, Subaru nodded. Reinhardt's powers could not be left out of the attack. However, that the warriors would be there as obstacles for him was certain. Wilhelm, the true nature of the corpse soldiers, could you avoid speaking of it to Reinhardt? Subaru, huh? The perplexed Subaru was unable to grasp the reason for the abrupt request. Subaru, then, don't tell that guy about Wilhelm's wife, is that what you mean? Wilhelm, yes, it is so, for Reinhardt. For my son, I want to avoid him meeting my wife in the form of a corpse soldier. He will surely blame me because the fault is none other than my own. Subaru, Wilhelm San's fault, to say that kind of thing. It's not true, he wanted to say, but Subaru could not carelessly remark so. Because the image of Heinkel's appearance ruining the mood earlier in the morning had appeared in his mind. There was no credibility, but it could not be denied. Wilhelm considered Reinhardt the cause of his wife's death and such a difficult and unbelievable past he did not deny. Wilhelm, does Subaru Dono think that the blessing of the sword saint has something special? Subaru, honestly speaking, I would say I know little about it. Maybe the people called sword saint all had it and if you have it you become incredibly strong, I only have an impression like that. Wilhelm, to know of it as that isn't wrong. But if there is a difference between the blessing of the sword saint, and other blessings, is that, it can be inherited, Subaru, an inherited, blessing. At Subaru's breath, Wilhelm nodded. The elder swordsman closed his eyes as if recalling sorrowful memories. Wilhelm, that blessing has passed down without fail from the time of Reed Astria. The blessing became the inheritance of the Astria family, and always a member of the clan was chosen to be the next sword saint. My wife's blessing definitely passed down to Reinhardt. Subaru, so a blessing that is inherited down the clan, is it, is that so? And when your wife passed away, the blessing transferred to Reinhardt. 
while understanding that too, something caught in Subaru's head as he was growing convinced. After the sword saint was slain by the white whale, the line of succession led to Reinhardt. It was a sad past, but one that could also be described a proper passing on. That flow did not fit at all with what had been said in the argument between Astrias this morning. Wilhelm's heartbreak, Heinkel's mockery, Reinhardt's silence, was interfering with the idea of a proper succession, and the answer is. Wilhelm, it was, at the time of the white whale subjugation. Subaru, Wilhelm, San. Wilhelm, Reinhardt received the blessing while my wife was in the middle of the expedition against the white whale. During that conflict, my wife, abandoned by the sword, could only take on the battle as an ordinary woman. That was the truth of the Astria family division. In the midst of the battle to subjugate the white whale, the blessing had suddenly passed down during the fighting. And, on the battlefield, the result was that only the now former sword saint remained. Now left a predecessor and an ordinary person, to defend many other soldiers she had still fought with the witch fiend, and they had lost contact with her. Wilhelm, the one that took away the sword from my wife was none other than me. Overruling my wife who was loved by the sword, forcing her to cast it aside, and turning her into an ordinary woman, it was none other than myself. That, was what called forth the death of my wife, Subaru, dash dash. Wilhelm, the sword that my wife betrayed did not forgive her, and so her blessing was taken away on the battlefield. She could rely only on a single blade, I think of how she must have felt then, it was true that I could not accept it, and defamed Reinhardt whom the blessing had chosen. As he was weeping over the death of his grandmother and bearing the heavy new burden, I impetuously could not forgive him, I, regret that now. Last night, the regret that Wilhelm had revealed to Subaru, it, was that mistake. Even knowing that Reinhardt had not done anything wrong, Wilhelm had been mourning his wife's death and was unable to accept it. As a result, the Astrias had split apart. Wilhelm, I do not want to repeat it again. Reinhardt has no blame in my wife's death. I have no reason to blame my grandson at all. And so, instead of revealing it to Reinhardt he was saying he would bring this to a close himself. That feeling, he now understood painfully well from this talk, if Subaru could do it, he wanted to as well. But, the burden Wilhelm bore was too high. Subaru, about Crush San and your wife, it will be buried there, Wilhelm San. Even if I don't talk about the corpse soldiers, the question of where they might appear is. Wilhelm, that is definitely a needless worry, Subaru Dono. Subaru, huh? Wilhelm shook his head at Subaru as he was about to point out that it was not certain. And the sword demon spoke as his expression twisted into a fearsome grimace. Wilhelm, because, there is no chance of my wife not coming to meet me. ARC 5 the History Engraving Stars Chapter 46 A State of Mind When going back to the rendezvous point with Wilhelm, everyone had been looking forward to Subaru's return. With Reinhard looking at Wilhelm, the grandfather welcomed the reunion with his grandchild while pulling his chin. While the two stood together along the wall exchanging sidelong glances, Subaru sat down next to Otto at the round table. Subaru, I'm sorry for being late. How did the negotiations turn out? Otto, we just ended up with the same matters we got from the start. It will surely be better from Natsuki-san's side. How is Crush Summer doing? Subaru, it seems she isn't doing well. However, it's not like we can already say that there is no hope. Once we get to the negotiations after driving out the witch cult, we might be able to do something. Otto, is that so? If that's the case then that alone is good news. With Otto stroking his chest with a hoe, everyone else having listened to the story also made a similar gesture of relief. While viewing their reactions, deep down, Subaru wanted to give them a heartfelt apology. Although it wasn't a lie, it was a statement which was far removed from reality. There might be a way to save Crush, which would also be considerably risky for Subaru. If her conditions were among the same conditions as Subaru's, he would expect her chances to rise considerably. Tien, 
probably referring to the conditions needed for the dragon's blood injected by Capella to not be rejected or something like that. Subaru, either way, Crush San's return to the front lines for this battle is impossible. Since it seems that Ferris also doesn't want to be separated from her, I think it would be best if the relief party were to stay behind at the city hall. Additionally, where we'll be meeting, there is the possibility that we will become unable to communicate. Anastasia, that means the plan to attack the four places simultaneously hasn't changed. Seems that get into the location from the city hall in the center as seen from each controlled tower comes first, right? Then. With a clap, Anastasia looked out over everyone's faces. In that case, shall we finally truly go into the main issue? There are four controlled towers and four sin archbishops. For the sake of defeating them, we will hold a war strategy meeting. From Crush's faction was the sword Devil Wilhelm. From Felt's faction was the sword Saint Reinhard. From Anastasia's faction were the valuable Knight Julius and the leader of the Iron Fang Ricardo. From Emilia's faction were the spirit Knight Subaru and the shield of the Sanctuary Garfield. And then, from Priscilla's faction was. Priscilla, me and Al will be together. Subaru, although you said such a thing, will you fight as well? You're a royal selection candidate, aren't you? When each faction's fighters were affirming, Priscilla boldly raised her own name. When Subaru scowled at that, she snorted at him so as to try and scoff at him. Priscilla, I would surely be a candidate for the throne, don't you think? Since the previously important fool has become useless, you've united every last one of the untaken weakling fighters. I stand above everybody both at the sword and on the stage precisely because I am who I am. Wilhelm, now you've become difficult to ignore. With fool, surely you mustn't mean my lord by that? Priscilla, since I have something in mind, just don't stand in my way, I guess. There's a devious expression, old soldier. Through withdrawal by losing a fly to catch a trout and the like, the tales of the chosen cannot be told. From the start of the discussion, Wilhelm and Priscilla already clashed with a dangerous presence. Seemingly habitually ignoring the scene, because of various circumstances Wilhelm's side could not afford to waste time. Since Priscilla's side generally operated in an excessive manner, that also did not leave out hateful language. Anastasia, yeah yeah, let's move the discussions forward, because both the weakling and the fool stuff is all fine by me. We ain't gonna turn on each other. Priscilla, oh, that's boring. Isn't my obedient listening to the weakling's story to a manageable degree? Anastasia, I guess it wasn't like the story was about the victory of the weak. If you do not show the extent of your magnanimity, then nobody will follow you. Everyone is getting equally irritated. Have some patience. Priscilla, humph. As Anastasia's remark was missing its target, Priscilla did not object as she only snorted. As she watched the weapon being pointed at her, Wilhelm, who had been staring daggers at her, had also withdrawn it. Since it was natural that there were disagreements between the factions, he made a serious face. Wilhelm, well then, Priscilla Summer's faction will be Priscilla Summer and Al together, even if your boy cannot expect to be taken into consideration? Priscilla, can something even be done by such a very delicate and weak child? That child has been accompanying me throughout merely for the sake of serving me. Naturally, we will put him aside beforehand. Wilhelm, understood. Then it's been decided that we'll capture the four locations with no less than eight fighters. The boy who was Priscilla's butler dash, Schult, while drooping his head, was exactly evenly split between fighting and not fighting at the round table. Leaving out the names of the eight combatants, the non-combatants were Anastasia, Schult, Liliana and Otto with Crush and Ferris on the upper floor making six people. Anastasia, before we split up our fighting force, shall we go ahead and reaffirm our knowledge of the Sin Archbishops once more? Let's see, the person who has seen all their faces, is just Natsuki-kun, right? Subaru. Yeah, I think so. Although even I am disgusted with talking about the witch cult's leaders, I will try to get myself to give an explanation. I know about their abilities, though to a certain extent. While gathering everyone's attention, Subaru began to speak. About the witch cult who which had attacked this city and the horrible sin archbishops who controlled it. Subaru, first is wrath. 
This sin archbishop, who calls herself Sirius, is a fellow who's completely wrapped in bandages. I don't know what she looks like, though I believe she's probably a woman. She attacks using the chains wrapped around her arms. In addition, it seems like she also uses fire magic. Reinhard, if it's only that then she doesn't seem to be a significant threat. Is she considerably talented? Subaru, if it's said by you, then it's difficult for anyone to answer, Reinhard, if we're talking about simple fighting strength, then Wilhelm or Julius will be able to provide sufficient opposition. Her other abilities seem to be an equal match with Emilia though. Nevertheless, she has the authority of Roth. Reinhard, an authority. Reinhard frowned that sound as he brought his hand to his chin. Subaru continued as he nodded back at him. Subaru, the biggest point about a sin archbishop's repulsiveness, is their characteristic ability called their authority. Being an incomprehensible force which differs from both magic and sorcery, it's useless to even think about how it works. Since every one of them is powerful, defeating the authority will become the crux of defeating a sin archbishop, Wilhelm, since Subaru Donner had supposedly defeated Sloth in the past, was that the authority itself? Subaru, it was. The Archbishop of Sloth's authority, the Unseen Hand was Sloth's second ability. The authority can grow an unknown number of powerful arms which are not only invisible, but also have incredible strength. If someone were to be caught in them, they could easily completely tear their body apart. Julius, having witnessed them myself, I've also verified their repulsiveness. In practice, it's believable that just by snatching a body its power could gouge out someone's flesh. Julius followed up on Subaru's explanation. During the united front against Petelgeuse, it was Subaru lending his eyes that made him see Petelgeuse's unseen hand. He was in an ideal position to reinforce his explanation. Subaru, moreover, Sloth has the ability to forcefully snatch away the energy of people in his range. Whether this was the authority is difficult to tell, but we overcame it by using spirit art users who were immune to it. This was also because it was me and Julius. Julius, even if we were able to tell whose ability it was, assuming the Sin Archbishop was holding such a terrifying ability, it's not like we would definitely succeed if we were to assign a capable fighter to the right opponent. Subaru, you said an unusually good thing, Julius. It's something like that. When Subaru praised him in his own way, Julius looked at Subaru with a discerning though lukewarm eye. While getting an uncanny feeling from that gaze, Subaru once again clearing his throat continued. Subaru, so, let's go back to the discussion about the authority of Roth. What we know as of now about Roth's ability, is the sharing and propagation of emotions and senses. Question mark sharing, emotions and senses? Since Subaru's explanation didn't really make sense, most of the discussion members tilted their heads. Because it was difficult to explain, it was necessary for Subaru to choose his words carefully. Subaru, I mean, it's that Roth is able to unipolarize the emotions of people in its range, it makes one person's anger into everyone's anger and one person's sadness into everyone's sadness. Anastasia, what the heck's that? If that's what it means, then it's simple as to why, tn, interpreting as why. Probably wrong still. Subaru, Certainly if it were just that you would just forcefully make yourself use your ability to sense the mood, but it's not like that. The scary part of this ability is when it's able to unipolarize until it reaches hostility. That is, if Roth is your opponent and directs their hostility towards your perceived companions, it will definitely also be transmitted to the people in the perimeter. Otto, so it turns the townspeople in its perimeter against us? Subaru, exactly. By snapping his fingers, Subaru indicated that Otto had drawn the correct conclusion. Although it gave everyone depressed looks, the problems didn't end with just that. Priscilla, foolish commoner, did you say that Roth or whatever can share emotions and senses some time ago? As the first to finally reach an understanding, Priscilla reclined on her seat, piercing through Subaru with her crimson eyes, while concealing her mouth with her folding fan. Priscilla, if the explanation from just now was about sharing emotions, then sharing senses is again different. And if we then assume that that is just my way of imagining things, is it not a considerably repulsive ability? 
Subaru, I don't know how you're imagining it, but it's the worst. Roth's authority shares the wounds of people in its range. This does not exclude Roth's wounds. Ricardo, if even the person himself ain't no exception, hey, bro, that ain't true, in it? Ain't that the worst? In other words, wouldn't other fellas die if Roth were Tarby killed? He had already once realized that terrible scene in practice by Reinhard's hand. Even if they crushed Sirius, who was the source of the malice, that act alone would inflict permanent wounds to the people surrounding them. They wouldn't know if anyone dragged into the fight would be fine if they managed to kill her. Priscilla, interesting. To this hopeless information, everyone held their tongue without coming up with countermeasures. In such a midst just one person, only Priscilla was cheerfully warping her cheek into a sneer. Priscilla, very well. I will give that wrath fool a picking. You're free to rejoice. Subaru, well, wait, wait, wait up. Although I don't know why you're so eager, it's not something you can take so lightly. Were you listening to what I said? Priscilla, let's settle that I was listening. Thus upon having listened to that, I have declared that I will go. They are indeed a disgusting opponent with cowardly methods, so it's appropriate for me to cut them down. Without even listening to Subaru's attempts to stop her, Priscilla looked over everyone while folding her fan to make a sound. With that sharp gaze and zeal, she overwhelmed even strongest fighters present. Priscilla, if you've said everything about the authority, then there is a verse that comes to mind about those Karakuri, wanting to be accompanied by the same masses who disregard you, and the like is impertinent. The vulgar masses exist entirely for my sake. If some insolent worm turns their hand to me, I immediately throw them out of my garden. Al, P, Princess, aren't you bragging even a little too much? Priscilla, what kind of foolishness are you saying, Al? Knowing your cowardice, what is it about that you get cold feet from the insolent opponent who sours my mood? With me, there is no point in being afraid if the singer is there. Al, it's not like I'm saying it because there's nothing to be afraid, singer. When Al tried to stop his master's irrational behavior, he stopped as he heard an unexpected word. While generously nodding at her followers' surprise, Priscilla, pointed with her folded fan at Liliana who sat at the corner of the round table. As she suddenly became the topic of the discussion, Liliana opened her eyes wide at the fan that was thrust before her. Liliana, did mean M me with that name? Why are you doing that so suddenly and neglectfully again? Priscilla, you mustn't be forgetting about your travels. How long your songs have shaken the hearts of the masses. You should do the same thing with that. In short, you should fight for the emotions of the vulgar masses and such. Liliana, seems like I was making you anxious just because I raised my voice a little. You might say that under no circumstances you are overestimating me too much, but pressuring a weak young girl like me. Priscilla, oh. So, if it's your choice, you allow the song you inherited from your ancestors to be defeated. As Priscilla snorted, Liliana's facial expression changed to Priscilla's words which sounded like she despised her wholeheartedly. Showing a forced smile, she wore a facial expression with an earnest charm as she menially tried to ward it off. Liliana, that is, what do you mean? Priscilla, it seems like it even if you do not think so. Does your song, which has been passed down so zealously, seem like it is being sung when the hearts of the people, which are begging for help, are exposing their sometimes unsightly cowering? That kind of loser's whining, is that not all a bunch of idle futility? Even a dog's barking is still better than insisting on being selfish. There, how is it sinking in? It's like the praise of a loser. Liliana, ah ah. You're going so far as to say it? Are you blurting it out? Fine. I'll go. I've understood all right? Catching me, the minstrel Liliana, like that. Using such language. A woman will become obsolete with this silence. Even the late Kiritaka-san will come crawling out of his grave with regret like this. Because of Priscilla's fierce provocation, Liliana became excited as she intensely exploded back at her. With her face becoming a bright red, she violently strummed the musical instrument placed on top of her lap. Liliana, 
Stop it if you were thinking about letting even a requiem be sung to comfort Kiritaka-san's soul who pitiably fell into the city's waters. I'm a scramble of emotions. Bring it on. I, the person who has come to inherit the song, and my song, which has dazed the people of the world, will we lose to an unknown power due to something like that? We don't know the song's power after all. GRRR. TN, probably somewhat inaccurate in some places here. Liliana's manner of speech feels weird in general. Shultanotto hurriedly dragged down the thoroughly excited Liliana who was performing while lying sprawled on top of the round table. Taking a distant view to the corner of the room where Liliana who started playing was held down, Subaru had shifted his focus to Priscilla. Subaru, her manageability aside, you seem sure of her success. But even if you're right, to just throw her into this when you don't know her chances. Priscilla, I am not planning to lose or anything. Everything in this world will be made to my liking. Besides, it is because I was together with that singer that I have come so far as to this city hall. After taking her around with me precisely because I recognize that singer's usefulness, I have again decided to take her with me. Subaru, are you saying that Liliana is an opposing force to Sirius? Priscilla, it would be my defeat if it were not for that singer and something like my defeat is impossible in this world, therefore, it is because of that singer. Need I explain this any further? Because none of the insufficient explanations were feasible, it steadily became unbearable for Subaru. However, it was Schult who raised his hand instead who tried to follow up on Priscilla's remarks. The butler boy's adorable eyes quivered as he chose his words with utmost care. Schult, you, are well. I think that it's true that Liliana's song has a special power. It's true that they were released from anxiety or irritation when they listened to Liliana Summer's song, that is also what we learned from several refuge shelters which we passed by before we came here. Subaru, you were letting Liliana sing to the refuge shelters you were visiting? Priscilla, I believe I said so. Subaru, you didn't say that. Even the insufficiency of her explanation was excessive. While being troubled by Priscilla's attitude, Subaru turned his head to Reinhard. Subaru, hey, Reinhard. Do you know of an innate ability that can see people's, or rather, oh right, their divine protections? Can't such things like divine protections be seen? Reinhard, I think there's a divine protection which learns about people's divine protections. I've heard that the owner of the divine protection of judgment can see them. They aren't in Lagunica, but in Volachia, aren't they? I see, so we want to check what kind of divine protection Liliana Summer has? It will certainly become one of our main questions. When he understood the purpose of Subaru's question, Reinhard went deep into thought. Since he just tried to ask because he had nothing to lose, even he knew that he had asked something unreasonable from Reinhard. Subaru shook his head to the pondering red-haired youth, and said never mind. Subaru, although I strangely expected something since you said that you heard all kinds of incredible things, it's not like you'd be convenient to that extent. It's fine. For now, we'll be able to cancel Roth's authority somehow with Liliana's song after testing it a little. Reinhard, you don't need to worry about it, Subaru. Dash, I've received it now. Subaru, huh? Patting the shoulder of Subaru who tried to propose an experiment with Liliana's song, Reinhard smiled. After that, while narrowing his blue eyes, he gazed at Liliana who was performing in the corner of the room. And then. Reinhard, I was surprised. Liliana holds the divine protection of telepathy. Subaru, I was surprised by you because of the divine protection from just now. A. Eh? What did you say just now? Did you say that you received it? What did you receive, the treasure that is children? Reinhard, Subaru, it's not a situation to be making fun of. I have been able to confirm Liliana Summer's divine protection. The divine protection of telepathy is, so to speak, a divine protection which transmits the owner's thought to others. It's a divine protection which primarily just transmits trivial thoughts to companions whom the owner shares a close bond with, but, a song, huh? I hadn't even thought of something like that. While Reinhard was honestly admiring Liliana, Subaru's jaw dropped after seeing him with such a face from his side. 
since Reinhard's power was already a cheat, this guy, who was said to be beyond superhuman, was being loved way too much by the gods. The divine protection he needed, that divine protection which he thought of turned up in his possession or something if he wished for it. Subaru, dash dash. Barely managing to reach even a thought, Subaru picked up on what happened. He could acquire a divine protection he thought of if he wished for it. At least it could only be expressed with what happened to the present Reinhard himself. Though that in and of itself was an extremely and reassuringly enviable power. Since it seemed likely that he was mistaken about something, Subaru did not finish his remark. The members of the Roth capture group were decided Dash, Priscilla, Al, and Liliana. Arc 5, Chapter 47, Recapturing the City Outpost A's leave the work of dealing with, Roth, to Priscilla's team, we have assurance from Reinhardt that Liliana has a blessing. Reinhardt, an unfamiliar blessing may not sound very reassuring. But certainly, if it is Liliana Summer's song, I believe it may be an effective countermeasure for what we've heard about, Roth. Following Subaru and Reinhardt's remarks, the gazes of the round table participants turned to Liliana. She was playing with her braid, and while holding it under her nose, she was play-acting as if it was a, beard. Liliana, e ye, please leave it to me. This Liliana, once she gets a request, she definitely gets the work done. Rest assured, I only sing. In a place where my singing is desired. And if wanted I trill. Isn't this such a happy thing? If I could even get some tips, then that's time to throw up my arms and celebrate. Subaru, something like a tip won't be coming out of this, so first quit with the capitalist pig talk. Liliana, boo hi. The excited Liliana deflated, and now Priscilla let out a snort instead. With eyes like red flames, she turned to inspect Subaru and Reinhardt in turn. Priscilla, seeing two boys gossiping in whispers, I looked into what they were plotting, but it seems they are merely wasting their energy on a useless consultation. That singer's worth by mine own self has already been confirmed. I will deign to crush this mere fanatic fool. Subaru, even saying that, to be certain it's necessary to check. Priscilla, how amusing. A singer is one who stakes their life on singing. This singer who ran her mouth, why would she take on some uncertain danger to her life? To take that kind of risk, there is just no point. Subaru, dash. Saying those words, didn't leave Subaru much to reply with. In truth, the one that suggested using Liliana, and believing it enough to face off against, Roth, was Priscilla herself. Unlike her words and attitude, her prudence and cleverness were exceptional, and already well known. Al, princess, don't be bothering bro too much, let's just stay quiet, us too. Priscilla, what's that, Al? Worm, are your thoughts and your views still crooked? You've aged quite enough as a man but still just act like a girl, I see. Do not lower your worth bit by bit even further in front of these commoners. Al. Is not like that. Turning away his gaze with a swish, Al rested his chin on his right arm and entered a complete observer mode. Priscilla also gave a snort and got off his back about it. Finally, it seemed like the story could flow into the next part now. Subaru, and with that, the attack on, Roth, will be left to Priscilla's team. For the others. It's about, lust. About who to handle that one, I would like to nominate Wilhelm San for the assignment. Julius, nominating Wilhelm Summer. May I ask about the meaning of that? Wilhelm, I have humbly requested as much from Subaru Dono, Julius Dono. Towards the wondering Julius, Wilhelm raised his hand and answered. The elder swordsman collected his gaze and lightly shifted it upstairs, Wilhelm, as you all well know, my mistress Crush Summer is suffering still under the effects of the witch, lust's cruel power. I am under obligation to fight for my mistress as Crush Summer's servant. This is also a wish of mine that goes beyond my sense of duty. Anastasia, if possible, you want to capture the Sin Archbishop alive, and ask him about those symptoms. Wilhelm San's motive must be something like that. Wilhelm, as you say, and for that, if the subjugation of, lust, could be left to me. 
Those blue eyes with strong will behind them, gave off a darkness which pressured the room. Wilhelm's deeply held determination, and his righteousness towards his mistress, with eyes that showed those feelings, nobody could raise half-hearted words against it. Except only, of his own flesh and blood. Reinhardt, in truth, I am opposed to it. Wilhelm, Reinhardt. While everyone was overwhelmed by the swordsman, only Reinhardt's expression did not change. Staring at Wilhelm with his usual serious expression. Reinhardt, currently grandfather, has lost his composure. Of course, to feel hostility towards the sin archbishop who harmed Crush Summer is understandable. However, I do not believe that you will be able to achieve the objective with that feeling. Wilhelm, losing your calm, is a distraction from achieving the objective? Is that what you are saying to me? Reinhardt, considering Crush Summer, the failure to capture, lust, is not forgivable. Therefore, I will take on that task. At least, I will be able to face that side with a better mental state. Reinhardt's words were correct, and formed with sound logic that considered possible situations to ensure as much certainty as possible. That Wilhelm was being too forceful, and was losing his composure was not incorrect. But, when Reinhardt gave that opinion, Wilhelm loosened his lips. Surely not gently, but instead with a smile like a wild beast's. Wilhelm, losing calmness here is a given, Reinhardt. Reinhardt, nevertheless, grandfather. Wilhelm, just who, are you thinking your grandfather is? I am the sword demon Wilhelm, giving my effort all to live as just a sword, but unable to stop myself from coming to love a woman too, only half. Though in my method of existence I only came halfway, in the end, for what needed to be done, I have never let it stay unfinished. A fierce smile, came over Wilhelm's clear and mild impression. It now reminded one of, blood and iron and life burning with flame, the ghost of one whose daylight feelings were taken away. Wilhelm, when I decide to wield the sword, my heart is uplifted. Even not being calm, on the battlefield it is all the same to me. That is how I have lived on to this age. This time also, I have no intention of rotting away without repaying my obligation to my mistress in full. Your pointless worry is not necessary. Reinhardt, that reasoning, is not just that mentality. Wilhelm, a mentality held to the end becomes certainty. Even if it takes fourteen years, even what some may call a blunted sword will fulfill my vengeance on my wife's enemies. If, by the white whale fight, Wilhelm said his revenge for his grandmother was paid in full, Reinhardt could not say anything more to that. But even then, Reinhardt was lowering his eyes unconvinced. At the obstinate posture of his grandson, Wilhelm with, besides, continued on. Wilhelm, the battlefield which needs you is not here. The scene you are needed in is elsewhere. Reinhardt, the scene I am needed in. Wilhelm, Subaru Dono. My grandson, please take him with you to your battlefield. To rescue Amelia Summer, you will need to battle, greed. This Reinhardt, would act as a sword for you. Suddenly having his name called, Subaru opened his eyes wide. As if pulled along by the nodding Wilhelm, Reinhardt's gaze also turned to him. At that appearance, Subaru scratched his head as if thinking it can't he helped. Subaru, honestly, I wanted to wait to say this until after the talk of, lust, was sorted out, yeah. Your power is frankly, something I want to borrow for the fight against, greed, I'm in charge of. For that annoying fucker, I definitely think I'll need your strength. Regulus of, greed, floated into his mind. According to his fragmented knowledge of the Sin Archbishop abilities, the power Regulus possessed was the most dangerous of them all, unless the target was a crowd. Though he could not say for sure, in the current situation, he could not imagine calling it by anything other than a stupid word like, invincible. Of course, he did not want to think of him as a simply, invincible, existence. Some kind of weakness or limit had to exist, that was what he wanted to believe, but. Subaru, to break through the, invincible, protection of Regulus, to fight that guy we need strong attacking ability. His offensive and defensive ability, simply compared with the other the Sin Archbishops, I think is at the top. 
so I want to borrow Reinhardt's power for when we attack him. Reinhardt, an untouchable opponent. Certainly, for a monster such as that, I would be the right choice, however. Even after hearing of Regulus' absurd power, Reinhardt's hesitation did not disappear. But, seeing Reinhardt's worrying, another voice rang out. That sound was coming from, none other than the one next to Subaru. Question mark then. Wilhelm Gramps will just be going with my amazing self. Striding forward was Garfield, gnashing his sharp fangs as he glared at Reinhardt. Reinhardt was making a surprised face at him, as if wondering, you are? Garfield, the captain is proper in you. Yeah skills, my amazing self knows about that too. For rescue in Emilia Summer, my amazing self's not needed, then. Right, Captain? Subaru, no, Garfield. For me, even if it's like that I don't want to just tell that to you. Garfield, I don't need comforting. And I'm not saying this stuff just cause I'm sulking. It's the other way around. For my amazing self, this time there's another bastard that needs seeing to hear. His brows furrowing at the roughly breathing Garfield's attitude, Subaru realized too late. That was it. Among those whose appearances had been changed by, lust, during the city hall recapture, there had been a person who was like a friend to him, turned into a black dragon, such a person had existed then. Then, for Garfield, lust, was not just an unrelated opponent. Besides, Garfield, it's true that we can't forgive that damn woman, but it's not you that. When we fought against that second one, it was where, lust, was last time. Subaru, dash. Garfield, cause of my amazing self's mistake, there's an idiot that got injured without need into there. So my amazing self, I have to give as good as they got for that one. And so, my amazing self will be following Gramps over there. At Garfield's keen gaze, Wilhelm slowly lowered his chin. Here, the elder swordsman and the young warrior both, were united together in a fight for vengeance. At the root, they both shared motives born of thinking strongly about women they care about, so they had even more in common. Towards Garfield's expression, Subaru too had nothing more to say. Subaru, I might be repeating myself here, but, lust's power is variation and change. She alters herself and can also force mutations onto others. And, her blood. No matter what, do not let her blood touch you. It's what caused Crush Sand's injuries. Personality-wise, they're all terrible, but she's especially bad. Wilhelm, understood. Garfield, stomp on em and crush em. At Subaru's last confirmation, neither Wilhelm nor Garfield showed any sign of backing down. When Subaru finally made eye contact with Reinhardt to check what he thought, the sword saint who had been firm up to this resolute scene seemed to have lost the desire to speak. Reinhardt, it does not matter. Garfield's ability is certain. And if Grandfather is there, then by whatever means necessary he will cut them down, that can be relied on. Garfield, you say in it like that, is unconvincing. It's like, the talk toy's mild butts taste superb. Reinhardt, it is the truth. Your, and grandfather's, victory I believe in it. I will act as Subaru's sword. As Garfield scratched his face with an uncomfortable look, Reinhardt nodded his head at Subaru. From the sword saint's believable words, Subaru felt like he had earned a lot of help. Subaru, I'm sorry about this selfish desire, Reinhardt. Reinhardt, it is fine. No matter where the battlefield is, I will give my utmost efforts. If that will be of help to you, then that is what I wished for. Subaru, for just relying on you, I'm really sorry. The situation is, I'm relying too much on you being really strong, the parts where you're lacking, I'll fill them in somehow, so please look forward to it. Reinhardt, dash. Hearing those words, Reinhardt suddenly widened his eyes and shut his mouth. Subaru tilted his head at the rarely seen reaction, and Reinhardt right away with a, no, laughed a bit. Reinhardt, for you, that would be, nothing at all. Ah, I will look forward to it, you filling in for me, the parts I cannot reach. Subaru, dash. Then, look forward to it a lot. So, 
I think we know the flow by now, but inevitably there's, gluttony, the last one. Julius, then, me and Ricardo, are left to be in charge of that. Following after Subaru's words, the one agreeing in a low voice was Julius. Hearing him speak in a rough voice which was unlike him, Anastasia directed a concerned gaze at the knight. Anastasia, Julius, you all right? Since before, your complexion isn't looking so good. Julius, I apologize for causing you anxiety. However, I am fine. When speaking of comforts and discomforts of the body, I cannot make something like weak complaints in front of Subaru. Subaru, what do you mean, by that? Julius, of course, I was thinking of your difficulties with your leg when I spoke. Please do not snap at me like that. In a situation like this, I have no intention of getting into arguments with you. Subaru, Mew. He took a lot of damage from a motive that he hadn't thought of. At the same time, he felt a strange sense of something being out of place. Julius' appearance seemed suspicious to him just as it had been for Anastasia. Why that was, he still didn't know, but even then. Julius, Ricardo and I will be taking the leftover responsibility of handling, gluttony. Originally, Subaru and Wilhelm Summer would have served as his opponent. Due to their ties with him, they would have wanted to manage it themselves. Because you assigned this task to us while enduring those feelings, we will definitely carry it out for both of you to see. Subaru, ah, it's like that. What Julius felt was, Subaru would have wanted to subjugate, gluttony, himself. Wilhelm would too, and above them now the still suffering crush would have felt the same. By the memory eating, name consuming, gluttony s authority, thinking of the still sleeping Rem who had suffered that damage, Subaru wanted to crush, gluttony, completely with his own hand. Hitting, kicking, stomping on him, forcing him to regret the atrocities he has committed, to turn his face into a teary mess as he forced him to bow down to the ground until he felt catharsis, that was what he wanted to do. That role, he had given over to others. Subaru, no matter who it is, honestly, I don't want to leave it to them. Rem. I wanted to restore her. I wanted to get her back myself. I believed that doing that was my role. Julius. Subaru, but, if it won't do unless I entrust it to someone, then I'll leave it to you. Don't get the wrong idea. It's the process of elimination, that it's by process of elimination there's no doubt, but I will leave it to you. For me, you're the only one I can tolerate handing this role to, even if I don't like it. Rem's very memory and existence, was being held hostage. Emilia's freedom had been taken away, and she was still waiting for help to come. Both of them were precious relations to Subaru, both of them were precious people he had to get back, and so to both of them Subaru wanted to show them his cool side. However, Subaru was Emilia's knight, and Rem's hero too, so. Subaru, I will topple, greed, and I will rescue Emilia. Blowing away, gluttony, I'll hand it to you, don't screw it up. Julius, to your expectations, I will respond. Especially this time, definitely this time. With a firm nod, Julius accepted Subaru's yielding. The knight called the, greatest, then gazed towards Wilhelm, and inclined his head slightly. Julius, Wilhelm Summer. Wilhelm, of what I wanted to say, Subaru Donna has spoken most of that for me. It is true that I do not have the most harmonious feelings for, gluttony, and so too, I will entrust it to Julius Dono. There are too many scoundrels caught up in this. From that sword demon growing sharp, Julius seemed to gain a bit of courage. Ricardo, who had until then quietly observed their talk, now said. Ricardo, and what's this, my thoughts don't even seem to be heard in this talk going on. I don't even get to be cared that much, is that it? Now that this line-up so far is the best, I can agree to that. Anastasia, Ricardo really is wanting attention, getting miffed like that with your big size doesn't really look cute, you know, Julius, I will ask of you. Ricardo, relax. Have you ever seen me lion? Anna Bo. Anastasia, using that title, could you rightly stop that? I'm, Ricardo's mistress you know. 
Ricardo guffawed loudly at the sight of Anastasia's miffed face and puffed-up cheeks. The black iris eyes that gazed down on Anastasia, had a very kind glint in them. Subaru, then, with this, the lineups are decided, right. Following Subaru's remark, all those present at the round table nodded their heads. Subaru, for the attack on Sirius of, Roth, Priscilla and Al. Counting Liliana, that's three in all. Priscilla, the notion that mine self may succumb to the toying of emotions is a laughable one indeed. Showing mine opponent how they were in the wrong place at the wrong time while facing the wrong enemy, such a helpless fool deserves a lesson. Liliana, I only sing Tilda, I only sing it's what I am, just a lump of meat that sings. Do not cherish your life, cherish the stage. Okay, good, I feel like I can do it. Right now, I really feel like I can do it. Subaru, dash dash. Fanned herself as Liliana engaged in questionable self-hypnosis. Al's face could not be seen, but the impression that he was still not convinced seemed to come from his whole body. Though it was a mildly unsettling trio, confidence-wise they were the strongest there. Subaru, next up, for the capturing of, Lust, Garfield and Wilhelm San. Garfield, got it. My amazing self will grab him by the throat, and make him cry, and say sorry. Wilhelm, please leave it to me. With the both of us, it is assured. The pair with the most fighting spirit, could it be said to be these two? The sword demon Wilhelm had his mistress obligation, and also his wife, who he could not forget even for a moment. As for Garfield, there was some form inside him that could not be grasped, some emotion that made his feelings shake. Perhaps these two warriors both sought some answers in the battle ahead, he couldn't be sure if that's how they felt. Subaru, and for the conquest of, gluttony, it's the two of you, Julius and Ricardo. Julius, by none other than you both, we have been entrusted this task. It will certainly be resolved. Like this, then, I will negate him. Ricardo, my family, those damn bastards made him suffer. I don't need to hear those words to know. I'll punch him, hit him hard and make him cry. This pair had the least connections to the witch cult. And yet they could safely be expected to not fall behind the others, since it was definitely certain that both were highly respected opponents. Together, he had already overcome hardship with them. Nowhere in these comrades in arms lay any cause for doubt. Because of that, the choice to yield the detestable, gluttony, was made possible. Subaru, the last one is, greed, with Reinhardt and I making two. I'm counting on you? Reinhardt, ah, leave it to me. I am depending on you as well, Subaru. At Subaru's request, Reinhardt nodded his head, with his usual resolute attitude. But something in his draped mien seemed soft, and while in the middle of battle it may strike one as insincere, but now his appearance seemed to overflow with humanity. Why it was such a reassuring look, Subaru could not know. Subaru, then, with this, the choices for the fights are decided. And on the matter of choosing places to set up communication mirrors for reports, there are three of them in all. Assuming I leave one in City Hall, for the others left, what should we do? Subaru, personally, I definitely want someone to take one for, Roth. And one to? Lust, or, gluttony, one of those two would be nice, I think. Question mark what are your reasons? Subaru, Roth, is someone with influence, over the whole city. By whether they fall or not, the situation that befalls the city will be changed. Therefore, that news is something I want to be able to share quickly. Regarding the use of communication mirrors, they all nodded as if Subaru's suggestion was the truth. As for the reason for bringing a different one to, greed. Subaru, it doesn't really need to be said, but Reinhardt will be with, greed. Assuming anything more about, greed, than his power being unknown is optimistic, but I can't say that the possibility of it being handled instantly doesn't exist. If it becomes like that, I want to set up a situation where Reinhardt can be sent as reinforcements. Reinhardt, however, unless the team at, greed, possesses a communication mirror, then sharing that information is impossible, is it not? But, 
I certainly believe that Natsuki-san's opinion is largely correct. Subaru, the answer to that is simple. Use the broadcast magic device. With a city-wide broadcast, I want us to keep everyone informed of places that need help. Using the communication mirror, Anastasia-san will organize all the information, and will take on the responsibility of conveying it to everyone. How's that? Anastasia, I'm thinking that's wise. Your head seems to work well sometimes, Natsuki-kun. Anastasia laughed with an impressed look, and tossed a communication mirror at Priscilla. Priscilla caught it with her fan, and rolled it in front of Liliana. Liliana, wah, wah, wah. Priscilla, singer, you take it. Since mine self cannot lift anything heavier than tableware. Liliana, that fan, it's almost as heavy as some dishes. Don't say pompous things. Priscilla, do not speak so foolishly, inspect this design. Gold is hung and inlaid from it luxuriously, and from just that it is weighty. Do not toss it in with the likes of dishes. Liliana, isn't that heavier than the dishes? Regardless of what she said, in the end Liliana wound up taking it. Ignoring Liliana, who was quickly fixing her hair in the mirror, the last communication mirror was passed to Wilhelm. Subaru, considering the number of enemies, the, lust, side will need a mirror more than the group for, gluttony. Two people will be fine, I thinking, but contact Anastasia right away if it seems dangerous. Wilhelm, understood, I will be sure to contact her. Showing consideration for Julius, Wilhelm placed the mirror in his breast pocket. However, it was a slightly worrying judgment, as it is, Wilhelm could become hot with fury and ignore the instructions from now. And Garfield, needless to say, was the type to explode at the slightest provocation. Regardless, like this the battle preparations were complete. Subaru, I'll leave, a little more time. When that ends we will start, the control tower's recapture operation commences. At Subaru's words, all present replied by nodding their heads. However, seeing their quiet, tense appearances, Subaru thought the mood was bad anyhow. Subaru, if you're making angry faces, don't you get the feeling that bad stuff gets closer? Otto, once more a sign that Natsuki-san will say something strange occurred. Subaru, it's not weird. It's important. No matter how large of an army gathers, if morale is low, it can turn into a rabble. I'm not saying our morale is low here, but I don't think my motives are bad. So, let's raise our voice. While clapping his hands, Subaru stood up. Subaru, let's clean it all up, everyone. With this fight, get rid of the the city disturbing bastards. The witch cult fails and we get a happy end. Others, dash. At Subaru's urging, they looked at each other's faces, then, nodding. Others, who? Like that, a high morale reply came back. If they can give such a strong answer, then they'll definitely be fine. This many members, this much of a vanguard, it wasn't something that could just be prepared again. The city recapture, began in earnest. Subaru, this fight, is our victory. With Subaru saying whatever he wanted, the round table meeting concluded. Sometime later, her muffled sensations recovering, her consciousness slowly returned to reality. As reality started to permeate through drowsy senses, the feelings in her hands and feet naturally returned. Then, while feeling spread through the rest of her body, her first sensation was of something soft embracing her. Warm, it was relaxing like a large animal's fur had wrapped her up. She had felt something similar quite a long time ago. A long time ago, back when she was young, a time when her body could not follow the fairies, a time when she feared sleeping alone, now far from the feeling of that first texture, quite some time had passed since then. Amelia, ah. At first, her eyes welled with tears from its nostalgic touch. Putting aside her silly desire to keep feeling the warmth, she slowly opened her eyes. Her long eyelashes shivered, and amethyst irises blankly noted the world. She was in a room with high ceilings, and decorations she had never seen before. Lying on a bed there, 
she found herself wrapped up in a summer blanket crafted from quality fur. A stranger seated beside her had been cleaning her face with a wet towel. Amelia, you're? Question mark dash. Looking down on her when she opened her eyes was, a beautiful woman with a pure white face. On the rather sickly, blood-drained face, a pretty and expressionless face like a doll's was attached. Her beauty was such that she would surely light up the room if she smiled, but her face was rigidly held like a mask which could not laugh. Rising, her long hair waving behind her, the woman in a black dress left the room right away. She quickly tried to call out to her, but as she fretted on how to call her while not knowing her name, the door clicked shut. As such, she found herself alone. Amelia, here, I wonder where that is? Hesitantly, she sat up on the bed. Though she was faintly weary, no pain or signs of poor condition could be felt. The heaviness must be from using too much magic she was not yet used to, as it was a sign that her body was unable to withstand it. Having gotten that far, right away she remembered the rest of what had occurred in her situation. Amelia, right. Ah, at the square, I fought a strange person, and... Continuing on, in her head the events from just before she lost consciousness came to mind. A monster with a face wrapped in bandages, the one Subaru had called, Roth, had come for her with fearsome combat prowess and downright creepy amounts of anger. For a moment, she had taken on the fight at an advantage, but then losing to the force of fiercely burning flames, she had been sent flying, Amelia, and then, I must have passed out. But, I'm still alive. As she was outmatched, there was no doubt it had been a desperate situation. Someone had probably come to her aid. Subaru and Beatrice had been there, it could be she was rescued by those two. Even then, her heart was crushed by her own patheticness. Amelia had struck such a pose at Subaru, and had talked really loudly, but not only had she lost, she needed to be helped too. Amelia, MMH, there isn't any time to be dejected. Even if I don't do that, I'm already late to depart, so there isn't time to pause in my steps and repent. I'll repent while walking. Tapping her snow-white cheeks with both hands, she raised her spirits. Time spent depressed was time squandered. Having been provided a bed and blanket. And even being watched over by a caretaker, this place must be a benevolent someone's home. Since she hadn't been taken to her own place, her situation may have been quite severe. Amelia, but I can't feel any pain, so maybe a skilled healer, E. Eh? While moving to stand, Amelia came to realize something about herself. Amelia, I'm, naked. At the point bare feet touched the floor, she noticed that not a single piece of cloth was draped on her body. Amelia's head tilting, she first wrapped the blanket around her body and got down from the bed. Gazing around the room, she looked around hoping for something to wear, but regrettably could not find anything. Amelia, MMH, what should I do? If I leave the room like this, I'll be thought of as bad-mannered. Before leaving the forest, when she was studying matters on leaving the forest, and learning lots of things from Puck, that point had been energetically enough placed in her head. She shouldn't show skin in front of others. Following that rule, then her own appearance right now was completely a problem. Amelia, but, since I'm worried about everyone, it's an emergency so it can't be helped. The battle with the Sin Archbishops, how it had concluded, she had to find out as quickly as possible. With that task as justification, Amelia emerged from the room garbed in a single blanket, walking out to the corridor, it was definitely not a building she had ever seen before. Just, compared to how she imagined it, the outside of the room gave an oddly unsophisticated impression of a cold hallway. Amelia, I thought I was somewhere like a mansion, but that was totally wrong. MMH, is it just this room that's strange? Turning back, she saw the room where she had slept in. A big bed, and a small wardrobe. However, upon closer inspection, she could not escape the impression that something was unbalanced about it. It gave the impression of a bed and other furniture bought and messily piled inside an empty room. And that might not be wrong. By checking the atmosphere of the corridor, this was definitely not a place meant for people to live in. This was a place where people worked. If she focused her ears, 
the faint sound of water and a hint of something could be heard. While Amelia puzzled over that, there. Question mark R, it seems you've opened your eyes, how relieving, what a relief, I'm relieved you're safe. Spoken to so, Amelia turned back. Just then, at the far end of the corridor, a young man emerged. Having discovered Amelia, the white-haired youth grinned at her. Question mark however, I'm not comfortable with you walking around right after waking. Various things happened and you had a big day, so if there's something with your body it's a headache. That part, I'm telling you to go about your work with certain care. Moreover since it's not just your body, I mean. Amelia, then, you are? Blinking, Amelia gazed at the young man speaking to her. That attitude of narrowing the gap between others with a single step was somewhat close to Subaru's. However, the crucial difference between Subaru and him, was that his attitude had no intention of respecting the other person. That was Subaru's timid virtue, and the young man in front of her did not show any hint of it. It was as if he did not have any remorse for others. At the same time, Emilia was recalling a feeling she could not reveal to the young man in front of her. Question mark is that so, sorry, sorry. I've even seen your sleeping face, but this is your first time seeing me I'd say. I haven't even given you my name yet. No matter how you're in a relationship with me, this kind of impolite attitude won't do. I was too hasty on that point, it is my fault. Truly, like I'm sorry I will apologize. Since I am a human being capable of such things. Emilia, why yes. Emilia's reply to that endlessly, fluently speaking young man was quite heavy. The reason for that may be that his attitude overwhelmed her, but a more significant meaning was contained within. That was, Emilia's subconscious was appealing to her. This young man, somewhere, I remember seeing him before. Question mark it's a waste of a scene, it's a shame that this place place lacks atmosphere. But I believe this too, when you look back, will think of as a special moment. If you look at it that way it's not even a bad thing. A small happiness day by day is just, more than enough to make the path known as life brighten up. If it's with you, then I definitely especially think so. Not just as being in a bad place, but seeing the nice sides of it, that's the way of life want to try. Do you not think so too, Emilia? Emilia, I, do not remember telling you my name, so, you are? Question mark oops, sorry. When my feelings get too lofty, Without knowing it myself I stop noticing my surroundings, it is a bad habit of mine. It is for that reason, that I sometimes dislike my affectionate personality. It could be that you are the one making me feel so deeply. And, my name, was it? After an incredibly long and flexible detour, this young man was barely entering the main building. Feeling warning tingles burn her skin, Emilia did not take her eyes off of the young man's actions. That her own safety was at risk, she intuitively understood. And the cause of that intuition was, the young man in front of her. Regulus, my name is Regulus Corneas. I hold an executive position in a certain group, but something like that is not important to you. What is indeed important to you is just one thing. That I am your husband, and that you are my seventy-ninth wife. Emilia, E? The young man gave a name what Regulus marvelously spoke of, the meaning of it she did not understand. Emilia fretted, and her pretty brows frowned. But, Regulus was not paying Emilia's reaction any mind, and was staring at the body of a girl covered only with a single light cloth. Regulus, that appearance is poison to the eyes. I'll order a change of clothes to be brought over right away. You can relax. They are in the same situation as you, my other wives. Putting on wedding attire is something they would have gotten used to. Emilia, a wedding dress, what do you mean? No, it isn't just that. Calling me your wife, what are you saying? Regulus, right. I was forgetting something important. For one such as myself, that was dangerous. Emilia opened her mouth to ask another question, but Regulus was not listening. He clapped his hands, and lightly grabbed Emilia's shoulder as she was about to ask. As she felt the odd amount of force coming from those fingers, Emilia frowned. Drawing close enough to touch Emilia's forehead, 
Regulus gazed into her eyes. Regulus, I was forgetting an important, important question. Your awareness of the wedding comes after this. Amelia, this is important, so I want you to answer carefully. For our future, it's very important. Amelia, dash. At that weird level of pressure, Amelia swallowed her breath and was silent. Taking her attitude as assent, Regulus smiled. With a smile, he asked. Regulus, Amelia, are you a virgin? That's all, it's really important. With a smile, he spoke. ARC 5 The History Engraving Stars Chapter 48 The One You'll Come to Love Someday For a moment, Amelia did not understand the meaning of what had been said to her. Without thinking, she swallowed. The young man in front of her, Regulus, in response, raised a hand while smiling. Regulus, ah, I'm sorry for doing this so suddenly. I may have shocked you a little, honestly, I apologize on that point. It seems I keep on having to say it, but I am a man capable of apologizing. There are unsightly people in this world who do not acknowledge their own sins and blame this and that, too small to admit they make their own mistakes. They think they do not get a single thing wrong, even if you empty out everything they've done since birth to this very moment and examine it. Mistaken so, I think they become like that, but just how arrogant can they be? If they could just examine what lies under their feet a little more, and compare themselves to the vastness of the world and come to truly understand how small of an existence they really are, then they would not end up like that, just a single apology, is what they call a personality. It reflects their character. Don't you think so? Amelia, then, apologizing is important? Regulus, correct. That's right, apologizing is important. What a relief. It's obvious, and you seem to understand that point, so I am quite relieved. In this world, people that cannot understand something so obvious are unexpectedly many. It makes me dislike them. So, it seems there's no problem on the matter of adjusting understandings between the spouses about apologizing. I'm relieved, it seems like I'll be able to get along well with you from now on. And so, I apologized. The problem was, I was being a little impatient. Having spoken up to that point, Regulus' eyes looked Amelia up and down. As her body was only wrapped in a blanket, she froze up a little at that view. Regulus, yes, shyness is important even between spouses. On that point I think you are very good. Once again, it's about the question from just before, I'd rather you not misunderstand. I, more than anything, was not checking whether or not you are a virgin from a worldly point of view. I've said this multiple times, but I am your husband and you are my wife. It will not do for a marriage to lack strong ties of affection and courtesy. Connected with the long, long chain called love, devoting everything to your partner is obvious, therefore, that you have never been touched by another man, that's the kind of assurance I need. Amelia, assurance that, I wasn't touched by others? Regulus, of course, Checking whether or not you retain your maidenhood by sure evidence is nonsense. But as a kind of touchstone, I think it has such significant value. So, deliberately, even knowing it would be an experience you don't enjoy, I asked. I want you to understand that this is due to my love for you. Some stranger you don't love, who cares about how their virginity is. It's because I love you, that's why I'm checking. Regulus fluently and continuously spoke of the rationale behind his thoughts. Battered by these waves of words, Amelia felt something creepy about the coolie talking Regulus. Without knowing why, something about his appearance ceaselessly stirred a feeling of deja vu in her heart, and the contents of what she heard pouring like water were not retained in her memory. Only, she was aware of one thing, what he treated as important, the term virgin. That was. Regulus, and so, I want to ask once again. Hey, are you a virgin? Or not? Amelia, um, why virgin, what do you mean? Sorry. I, haven't heard it before. Regulus colon comma dot dot what? After being thrown a question prepared with flowery words, Amelia apologetically replied so. She knew Regulus had a strong attachment to the word, but Amelia did not know very well what it meant. Perhaps, 
It refers to a young girl, she thought. Inquiring in a low voice and hearing Emilia's reply, Regulus' expression clouded. Closing his eyes, he shut his mouth. Fallen in thought like that, his appearance caused anxiety to creep up, but the silence didn't last as long as imagined. Opening his eyes wide, Regulus reached his open hand towards Emilia. And. Regulus, excellent. You are, my ideal girl. Emilia, E. Holding Emilia's hand, Regulus wore a bright smile on his face. It was a truly happy face, unlike the smile from just before, he had the kind of expression, that a beaming child might make after getting a toy they really wanted from their doting parents. Regulus grabbed and shook Emilia's hand up and down, and repeated the gesture many times. Regulus, yes. That is how it should be. The virginity of the body this, the virginity of the body that, it's not really suitable for me as a touchstone, I had always thought so. However, the true sense of pureness is what lies in your heart. Your body being virgin is a given. What's really important, is that your mind remains virgin as well. I feel as if I have reached a truth. Amazing. You have brought something new to my previously satisfied self. Amelia, dash. Regulus, yes, yes, I get it. Rest assured, I will welcome you as my wife. Besides, because of that I realized something important. Henceforth, when welcoming a new wife, just inquiring as to their virginity will be insufficient. If they are not at the level of a child lacking knowledge of what virginity even is, that lowers the value of a wife, an adulterous heart will not do. It is unbefitting of my wife. Releasing Emilia's hand, Regulus stepped away with a very satisfied appearance. The meaning of his remarks were still not very well grasped by Emilia. In the first place, what he meant by husband and wife was a mystery to her. By Emilia's understanding, the wife was part of something the father and mother were, one each, but from Regulus' remarks, the image of many wives came to mind. Such was a notion far off from Emilia's common sense of the nature of married couples. Perhaps he was talking about a different concept with a shared pronunciation. Regulus, woe, and your appearance cannot be left like that. I will arrange for a change of clothes straight away. Dash number 184. Come here. Emilia, dash. Leaving the perplexed Emilia alone, Regulus suddenly spoke out a number. Then, from the other side of the corridor, the woman who had left the room Emilia was in now appeared. A young woman with long blonde hair and a polite manner, she arrived next to Regulus and demurely greeted him on the spot. Regulus nodded at her gestures, and... Regulus, for her, a change of clothes for number 79. As soon as that's prepared, I will hold the wedding. This child is in the same position as all of you. Get along, and do take care of her. Number 184, dash. Regulus, yes, you are no longer prone to laughing. Dash good child. A good wife. To the silently nodding woman, Regulus spoke as if satisfied. After that, approaching Amelia who still seemed lost, he ran a finger through the side of her silver hair, and stroked her head. Regulus, then, a little while later. Amelia, yes. Amelia's instinct was appealing to her, to avoid going against him. Accepting Amelia's short reply, Regulus then, with the sound of footsteps, disappeared to the other side of the corridor. Regulus had merely just been there, calmly too, even then, his existence gave off a strange pressure, which seemed to her a dangerous threat that reminded her of the time her old homeland had been threatened. Number 184, this way. The woman next to Emilia suddenly called out to her. She had been gazing at the back which had long since disappeared. Hearing the woman's voice for the first time, she was reminded of string instruments from its clear beauty. However, the voice, just like her expression, felt as if all feelings of emotion in it had frozen and hardened. Emilia, hey, sorry. I, have a lot of questions I want to ask. Number 184, your change of clothes. Emilia, the clothes are important, but there's also, yes, do you know where this place is? I was, at a plaza in Pristella with a witch cult person, ah, really. 
Ignoring Amelia as she tried to ask questions, the woman started to walk off immediately. Following quickly behind her, Amelia kept asking questions trying to somehow shine light on the situation, but that fully turned back replied to her with nothing. Guided by the woman in front of her, she arrived next to the room she had slept in previously. It was also a space which resembled a simply arranged room, in which furniture had been forcefully shoved inside. Amelia, this must have, originally, been a slightly different room. Number 184, the clothes chosen with care, and so on, husband Summer brought them over. Number 79, you are to change into them. Amelia, by number 79, do you mean me? Just now, I think Regulus called me by that, too. You're number 184, I am number 184. His wife, like you. Amelia, like me. As the door closed, only then did the woman, naming herself number 184, engage herself in conversation. There was no change in the voice which had lost its emotion, but it seemed barely possible to make conversation. Amelia, about the word wife, I've asked a few times, but does it mean the same as Mrs.? Then, I, don't think I've become regulus Mrs. Number 184, even if no such idea resides with you, he has such a notion. And if he has that idea, that means yours are irrelevant. Amelia, isn't that strange? To become a Mrs., you have to be married with your master, right? I, didn't get married with regulus, and don't have any thoughts to. Marrying is between a guy person and a girl person who say they will keep being together and have to keep liking each other after. I, can't make a promise like that with anyone yet. Number 184, if you mean a wedding, it will be held right now. With that, the matter will be concluded. Number 184 did not seem to possess any notion of listening to Amelia's words. Even as dialogue seemed established, it actually wasn't, and Amelia became more and more confused. In the meantime, number 184 had approached Emilia, and was trying to pull aside the blanket covering her. Emilia, ah, wait, what are you doing? Number 184, changing you into bridal attire right away. Fortunately, your clothes are already prepared. When undressing you to lay you in bed, your size was checked, so please rest assured. Emilia, you were the one who undressed me? Number 184, do you think I'm husband Summer? Please be assured. He does not make a habit of stealing peeks at women's skin, and he doesn't have any interest in women in the first place. After your virginity has been assured, he does not do anything. Amelia, you, are talking about that virgin, too? Number 184, it is surprising. Surely, but it wasn't acting, you really did not know. For the first time, Something resembling emotion slightly flitted across number 184's expression. At that faintly surprised look, Amelia opened her eyes wide, then slightly laughed. Amelia, what, you can be surprised, too. Then, you can talk while smiling. That is, much better suited for you, I think. Number 184, Husband Summer does not desire it. I will also leave this advice with you. Husband Summer likes your usual look. It is wiser not to laugh, rage, or change your expression. If possible, even not opening your mouth would be better, I think. Amelia, are you saying not to talk? Why? Number 184, since you won't know, whether it infringe on Husband Summer's rights. Stripping the bedding from Amelia, Number 184 proffed undergarments. After receiving it, she held it up to her body, and the size seemed to fit perfectly. Watching her putting on the undergarments while shaking her hands and feet, number 184 suddenly gave a long sigh. Amelia, is something wrong? Number 184 colon comma dot dot no, I was merely thinking that you were beautiful. Your narrow hands and feet, white skin, and long silver hair, especially. Amelia, dash? Thanks. Even if you don't really mean it, I'm happy. I only have Subaru, and Anne telling me things like that. Number 184, Subaru, a man, is it? Amelia, yes, my knight. 
he will really be worrying about me, I think. So, I want to find out where I am quickly. Probably, it would be causing him lots of worry. In Emilia's head, there wasn't any concern of Subaru having been done in. He had Beatrice with him, and the notion of Subaru falling into a situation where he would die didn't reach Emilia's imagination in the first place. Subaru, he would get through it somehow. And so, being captured without being able to say anything to Subaru was really pathetic. Number 184, that man you call Subaru, do not ever mention him to husband Summer. Emilia, ah, uh, why? Number 184, to borrow husband Summer's words, the virginity of your mind may become suspect. Emilia, again, it's about that virgin. Giving a term as the reason without explaining what it meant was really confusing. Without explanation beyond that for the pouting Emilia, number 184 took a pure white dress from the closet, and held it close to Emilia's body. With a brilliant-looking front, and many fancy ornaments stuck on, it was a beautiful dress. Emilia, but, it looks hard to move in. Number 184, complaints too, not speaking those would be wise. I will dress you now. Wondering, her head tilted ask you, whether such a wonderful outfit would even suit her, Emilia was putting it on as instructed by number 184, she was changing into the dress. Regulus, dash, ah, isn't that just great? As I thought, white suits you. Emilia, thanks. Regulus said in a bright voice when he saw that Emilia had changed clothes. His appearance too had changed from their hallway meeting just before. Emilia's expression suggested that she had noticed, and Regulus lightly popped his collar in reply. Regulus, a wedding is important, you know. Normally, I am of the thought not to not be attired as such, but I wouldn't want to embarrass you with some unfun stubbornness. It is the ideal for spouses to show consideration for each other, without thinking of it as uncomfortable. For this level of work, I do not wish to burden you with worried thoughts about all the consideration I have shown you. I merely want you to know that, if it is for your sake, I am a man that can accept making some changes. And for the venue, it will be ready soon, in just a little while. Emilia, the venue, you mean here? Dressed in a white tuxedo and robes, Regulus turned his head, and following him, Emilia also gazed around the space she was in. It was a cathedral, to be exact, it was a cathedral used only for the single important task of beginning a wedding ceremony. After having been changed by no. 184, Emilia had left the building for the first time, and quickly realized she had been resting in a room within one of the control towers. As such, Emilia had been led by number 184 from the tower and brought right to this cathedral. The outside of the cathedral was busy with laboring figures bustling about, for the wedding preparations which they were methodically continuing. And wordlessly, blankly carrying out the preparation of the venue, wherever one looked, were beautiful and fashionably attired women. Regulus, these girls are my wives, they're in the same position as you are. Altogether, they number 291, it's sad, but a lot of those kids died, you know. But still, for those that are still with me, I pour my love onto them equally, I think. That's obvious. Some principle of favoring and loving only one person is too distorted to be fitting for what you call a husband. I never do such absurd things. A fixed love, in a fixed amount, by fixed ways, I divvy it out. Here, there is no favoritism, no inequality, no injustice. Be relieved. For I, also love you in that same way. Emilia, what you are saying, isn't it? Question mark husband Summer. Briefly, a word. Isn't it weird? Emilia was about to say. Coming to the front, number 184 who had been waiting at their side spoke to Regulus hearing number 184's words, he vaguely furrowed his brows. Regulus, you know. I'm talking to her right now, you see that, right? Interrupting me now, when we're sharing in nurturing the sprouting of love between us, just me and her, don't you think you're smearing poison on it? Or is that just not on your mind? Such small courtesies between a husband and wife, I think they're really important. Didn't I keep telling you that? And yet, by still getting in the way, you're making my very minor wish go to waste. What do you think, 
Number 184. Number 184, I am truly sorry. However, this is important. I know it is presumptuous, but I am only acting out of concern for husband Summer. I humbly ask you, to hear my words. His speaking grew more rapid, and signs of danger erupted from Regulus' whole body. However, even exposed to that razor-sharp look, number 184's resolute attitude did not bend as she advised him. Naturally, at that sight, Regulus drew back the thorns from his appearance. Regulus, fine. Speak. Sparing some kindness for the wife, is a husband's generosity. I am not such a petty man that I can't even do that much. Number 184, I am truly grateful. Well, it is regarding the message of the broadcast from a while ago, will that be all right? If, potentially, a disturbance was made at the wedding. Regulus, the broadcast? Ah, the one that the trembling voice I don't really know made. Does it actually matter? If they just talk, it's not a problem at all. It's some complaint-filled coward that can't even speak of their own skills, listing off some fitting words, that's all it seems to me. If it's Capella, or Sirius, if it's for those trash then I don't know, but I don't care. Or, is it that you don't trust in my strength? Then, as a wife, are you doubting your husband's abilities? Number 184, no, I believe in it. If husband Summer is there, then we have nothing to worry about. I was merely hoping for husband Summer's words to wash away my anxiousness, that's all. Please kindly forgive a lacking wife, who failed to rely on you. With a seemingly prepared reply, number 184 tried to dodge Regulus' inquiry. With a feeble girl's words and an expressionless face and voice, number 184 compelled him. And Regulus shook his head as if impressed by her words. Regulus, is that how it was? That, I myself didn't think of it, sorry. Even if I wasn't asked, I still should have noticed your anxious thoughts. One must consider the thoughts of others, even if they are unspoken, so just how much was I acting as I pleased? I reflect on myself. Number 184, it is rather I that is deeply sorry. Husband Summer's words have given me courage. I, too, will immediately set out to help in preparing the venue. Regulus, ah, please do. Giving her farewell, number 184 turned away from Regulus. At the same time, she met Emilia's eyes and gave a furtive sort of wink. That was, probably, a warning to Emilia about the carelessness of her words from before she had been cut off. It was not wrong to describe Emilia as having neglected the danger Regulus poses. As such things were communicated, Emilia didn't hesitate to make a split-second judgment. Emilia, watch out. Number 184, huh? As number 184 was trying to make her escape, Emilia tugged hard on her arm. Clutching her tall but light body to her chest, Emilia took a big step backwards. The space in front of her, where number 184 had stood moments before, was caressed by the wind. Opening a long furrow in the cathedral floor, shattering it, and piercing straight through in a line of destruction. Without slowing down, the wind hit the main gate, turning the entryway into powder, then spread its destruction outwards. Emilia, dash. At that instant of overwhelming destructive power, Emilia, who was cuddling with no. 184, could not speak. Number 184 also, noticing the destruction while getting up from behind her, froze and completely curled up. And, standing at the destruction's point of origin in a pose as if he had swung his right arm moments before, was Regulus. Regulus, sorry, sorry. My hand just slipped. It's a relief that nothing happened to you kids. Amelia, dash. Regulus, I'll be in the waiting room until it's time, so call me when everything's ready, okay? Ah, while you're waiting too, wouldn't putting up your hair be better? That option is much more attractive, I believe. It is beautiful as it is, I think, but putting effort into being beautiful is something that must be done ceaselessly is what I'm thinking. Rather than trying to stay beautiful, trying to become beautiful, is more the minimum level of courtesy towards someone that likes you, I say. Of course, 
I myself remain satisfied with my currently filled environment, but I have no mind to limit what I have been given already. Talking as if the moment's destruction was nothing, Regulus, while smiling at Emilia, headed for the waiting room door on the other side of the cathedral. Blankly left staring at the leftover traces of destruction, she was taking in deep breaths. Emilia, just now, what was that? Number 184, thank you very much, for saving me. Saying so, number 184 pulled away from Emilia's bosom her previously frozen form fixed her disheveled hair, and she left Emilia's side right away. Her steps were taking her too, where the other women inside the cathedral were preparing. It seemed those women were continuing their work with looks that suggested they were completely unrelated to the destruction from before. Not only that, but several of them had gathered around the destroyed floor and door, and could be seen beginning to work on somehow hiding its traces out of view. Amelia, wait. This is weird. Don't you guys think it's weird? Others, dash. At that unperturbed attitude, Amelia raised her voice in confusion, as one, the women paid no heed to Amelia's voice, and merely continued to prepare in silence. If it's like this, then it will go on forever, Amelia thought, heading for the only person who her words seemed to get through to. Towards number 184. Amelia, just now, weren't you almost killed? If I hadn't pulled you back, surely your body would have been blown away. It was scary? Then, why? Number 184, well, what is it? I've already thanked you for saving me. Beyond that, what else do you want from me? Anything else, is that not a violation of my rights? Amelia, this isn't about rights or obligations. Let's talk about something more, more important. Amelia pointed to the women still hard at work inside the cathedral. Amelia, Regulus said they're his wives. They're all, that person's wife? And since they're wives, they do what he says? If you're a wife, then even if you're about to be murdered, you quietly accept it, that stuff, is weird. It's weird. Amelia, that is too strange, marriage is so happy, it's something happy people do, isn't it? To me, you, the others, none of them look happy at all, am I, wrong? Number 184, yes, you are mistaken. Even if you aren't happy, marriage is possible. Spouses do not have to love each other. If they keep on being together, they become spouses. Then, as spouses, they grow used to it. Number 184, did not deny that she remained in a position she hated. Not only was she not refuting it, she was even affirming her own situation. That was distorted, and wrong. Marriage, is for those who want to become spouses. It is not something you just want to get used to. Amelia, that marriage stuff, I have no intention of going along with it. I, will be leaving like this. Others, dash. Those women, who had not been paying attention to Amelia's words, had that they now raised their faces. As the wedding dress clad Amelia announced her rejection of the marriage, they stared. Weathering the storm of those emotionless gazes, Amelia squared her shoulders. Amelia, I have someone worrying about me. And there's a lot of things I have to do no matter what. So, I can't just end up in a place like this. Together with everyone, right away, I will do what I have to. Number 184, such things, husband Summer will not forgive it. Amelia, I, do not remember having become a wife of Regulus. So, I don't want something like forgiveness. Together with everyone, then, I will definitely return to save you all. Number 184, you. Amelia, all of you, I know you're not staying with Regulus because you want to. So I'll, talk to Regulus and free everyone. Anyone that still wants to stay with him then, can just keep being his wife. But, the people that want to be separated, I'll separate them. Even if you're forcefully married like that, it's meaningless if you're not happy together. The picture Amelia had painted inside her mind, was of two people who loved each other and looked forward to being joined together. What floated in her mind, from her dream before, were Fortuna and Juicy's appearances. Those two people had never wed, and had never become spouses, still, she thought it was good. If it was those two, 
then Amelia wished she could have married them. A happy marriage and marriage ties of mutual love guaranteed, their relationship was the right one. So. Amelia, I know of people who loved each other, but could not be married. And so, getting married and being unable to be happy after, I don't like that kind of relationship. Others. At Amelia's declaration, a stir spread throughout the indifferent women. But, number 184 rapidly extracted herself from that hubbub. She looked right at Amelia, and then at the destroyed entrance. Number 184, if you are choosing to leave, then that is your right. However, husband Summer would not forgive us. On the spot, surely, we will all be slain. Amelia, even though you're his wife? Number 184, a wife that cannot even fulfill husband Summer's wishes, is the same in husband Summer's view as one not able to fill all the requirements of a wife. If you leave, we will die. If you will still go, it will be you who kills us. Amelia, dash. Facing Amelia, number 184 while taking her own life hostage spoke. Her opinion, with its extreme contents. As if it reflected the opinion of them all, the women in the cathedral stood to surround Amelia, and restricted her movements. Of course, there was nobody there who could fight and stop her. They were all somewhat ordinary women. Born from ordinary households, having ordinary morals, having lived while yearning for ordinary happiness, ordinary women. At some point, a wheel had come loose, and they had merely become accepted as one of regulus wives. Others, dash. She was unable to refute one bit of their resolute determination. Emilia had seen regulus crimes with her own eyes. For just slightly talking back, he had simply tried to blow their life away in response, it was that regulus. When he learned of Emilia's escape, it was hard to claim that he would not take his anger out on them. It was none other than Regulus wives who understood this well. Emilia, how many, of Regulus wives are here? No, 184, husband Summer's spouses, total 291 people. Of those, 238 have already passed away, so the remaining number 53 in all. Emilia, those wives who passed away. Number 184, do you need an explanation? The question she received in reply, gave off a feeling of mocking her question. That answer, even without asking, Emilia came to realize it. And that answer lay in none other than the actions of those women circling around her without speaking. Emilia, if I left, then all of you would suffer something harsh. Rather than a harsh punishment, it would more likely be a certain, unavoidable death. Unmistakably, these women were hostages to Emilia's free will. Thinking of the damage leaving this place would incur, she should not move rashly. She thought about Subaru and his companions, outside of the cathedral in Pristella, worrying about her now. She thought of them, and in her mind, Emilia apologized. Then. Emilia, okay. The wedding, let's do it. After that, the venue's preparation proceeded at a rapid pace, though they weren't professionals, the damage was repaired so well that it was barely noticeable anymore. Just by looking at the fine workmanship, one could tell just how often those women had to clean up after regular tantrums. After Amelia agreed to proceed with the wedding, number 184 and a few of Regulus' other wives tended to her hair in the dressing room and decorated her with various adornments. Except for the times when Arnrose helped her with her hair, this was the first time Emilia's hairstyle had been so elaborate since Puck disappeared within the crystal. Her long silver hair was gathered up and woven into a braid. So as not to distract from the purity of her white dress, with only a few simple embellishments, Emilia's bridal gown was complete. Emilia, dash dash. Looking at her reflection in the mirror, Emilia admired the women's handiwork. Indeed, she looked very different from usual. With no one around to make demands about her hair aside from Subaru's occasional requests, it had been a while since she was imbued with such feminine charm, though she couldn't help but feel it was wasted on her. Number 184, well, let's go. Please take care not to damage husband Summer's mood. Number 184 reminded Emilia as they headed out of the dressing room. Turning into the chapel, 
Emilia saw that the attendees had already lined up, waiting for her arrival, all of them wives of Regulus, along with Regulus himself in a white tuxedo standing in front of the altar. Although she didn't know the exact procedures, Emilia stepped onto the red carpet laid from the entrance and walked towards the altar where Regulus was waiting. Regulus nodded with satisfaction when he spotted the beautifully adorned Emilia. Regulus, I almost didn't recognize you when you put on the dress, but the adornments took it to a whole other level. I was right to have kept number 79's seat vacant. I couldn't be happier with with my judgment. Emilia, number 79, why is that number vacant? Regulus, well, there used to be a woman who I initially thought would be a perfect fit for that number, but unfortunately I deemed her unsuitable before the wedding could take place, although her all-important looks was very close to my ideal, I nevertheless reluctantly kept that seat vacant. But thanks to that, I met you, so it was all worthwhile after all. Emilia, kept. Vacant. What's that supposed to mean? The mere sound of it reignited Emilia's already desensitized sense of Arinus. But even with this vague outline, she couldn't quite put her finger on just what it was. Meanwhile, Regulus adjusted his suit in front of Emilia in her bridal gown. Regulus, well now, shall we commence the wedding ceremony? I suppose it's a bit on the informal side, but I hope you don't mind? As long as the ceremony proceeds properly, the rest are just superficial details. I'm not one of those fools who prioritize the surface only to lose sight of the essence. Failing to see a matter's substance that way is simply laughable. How can someone be satisfied with only exteriors and outward appearances? Content with their ignorant, self-contained existence, they are too stupid to even notice that they're being laughed at behind their backs. Emilia, dash dash. While Regulus continued his convoluted tirade, no. 184 walked to the other side of the altar. Apparently, she would serve as the facilitator of this ceremony. Indeed, she seemed to be fulfilling a coordinating role among Regulus' 53 wives as well. Though it wasn't clear what that coordination amounted to when Regulus could kill any of them on the slightest whim. That was just another reason why this man was beyond forgivable. Emilia, say, Regulus. There's something I have to tell you before I marry you. Therefore, Emilia wanted to make it absolutely clear. Number 184's expression tensed at Emilia's words. But Regulus gave a surprisingly friendly nod in reply. Regulus, ah, that's right. There are some important things I want to tell you as well before you become my wife. Though I suppose I could gradually teach you after we are married, it's vital that you should be mentally prepared beforehand. To discover our differences here and thereafter we're already married would be tragic, don't you think? In order to make sure something so unfortunate doesn't happen, I think it's crucial that we openly share our thoughts with each other. Once we become a couple, we'll be bound heart and soul, so it's important that we sort this out first. Amelia, MMN, yeah. If it means being bound heart and soul, it's important, isn't it? Regulus, right? It's good that we get on the same page. So, my other wives must have already told you some of the rules, but why don't we go over them? First, once you're married to me, you are forbidden to smile. Emilia? Frowning, Emilia didn't seem to understand Regulus' meaning. But Regulus raised a finger and continued, Well. Regulus, it's quite important, you know. I like your face. I really like your face. I select my wives based on their faces. Beautiful, adorable, charmingly well-proportioned faces. I've had 291 wives in all, and all of them had beautiful faces. Your face is adorable too. And that's why you will become my wife. Do you understand? Amelia, dash dash. Regulus, here's what I think. There are many, many people in this world much more selfish than I. Don't you often hear about couples whose love begins to die the moment they get married? They went into a relationship because they liked each other, but as soon as they're living together all sorts of problems start popping up. Incompatible tastes in food. Incompatible habits. Incompatible hobbies. Incompatible schedules. There are all sorts of selfish excuses, and once the illusions about their partner fall away, 
they treat them like trash. I utterly despise such hopeless people. Smiling, Regulus happily extolled his views on love. Innocently, unreservedly, he raved about his indignation at those who scorned love. Regulus, who isn't a little selfish? But why the disillusionment? Someone you like may have different sensibilities than you, but why the disillusionment? How can people be so stupid? Isn't it absurd? That's why I select partners based on their faces. If my partner has a face I like, I won't grow disillusioned no matter what kind of person is behind it. Because I love that face. As long as that face is there, my love would never die. Amelia, dash dash. Regulus, even if they don't put away their clothes after they take them off. Even if they're a murdering maniac who indiscriminately butchers children. Even if their cooking skills are atrocious. Even if they sold their own brother to pay off their debt and ran away. Even if they don't separate different colored laundry that'll color bleed into each other. Even if they're a psychopath who secretly kills animals for fun. Even if they have godawful taste in clothing. Even if they're money-grubbing by nature. Even if they don't like to bathe and smells like a homeless person. Even if they seriously believe the apocalypse is coming and keeps on talking about it, I don't dislike them. One after another, Regulus pointed to the fifty-three women present, shouting. It wasn't clear which one which of those descriptions matched which one of the women. Nor could Amelia understand how he could claim to love only their faces and separate that from the person underneath. Regulus, I would never say it in past tense like I used to love. I love your face. Even if you're the witch who seeks to slaughter every person in this world in utmost, excruciating agony, I will not grow disillusioned. As long as I have your face. Amelia, what does that have to do with not smiling? Regulus, it's very simple. There are times when a girl who's normally cute and beautiful can suddenly turn repulsive the moment they smile, you know? As if I could allow such a thing. So, it's not only smiling, but crying as well. Either way, I won't allow your cute adorable face to be distorted in any way. So, no smiling. No crying. No sulking. Only adorableness is permitted. Holding Amelia's chin in his fingertips, Regulus quietly demanded. As for what would happen if she refused, those earlier events had already answered that question. But what made no sense was how he could he commit such senseless atrocities when he claimed to love their faces. Amelia, you said you love their faces and would never grow disillusioned. If so, then why did you attack this person earlier? Regulus, huh? Seeing Amelia pointing to no. 184, Regulus tilted his head. Without lowering her arm, Amelia broke free from Regulus' fingers. Amelia, if I hadn't pulled her away, this person would certainly have died. This is also someone whose face you love and therefore took as your wife, correct? If that's true, then how could you do such a thing? Regulus, ah, that's simple too. It's because, temperate as I am, she still managed to upset me. I don't ask for much, do I? But some people are just way too inconsiderate. I thought surely none of my wives is like that, but what else can I do when it's right in my face? Since there's no helping it, I had no choice but to fulfill out my obligations. Amelia, and so, you became disillusioned? You're contradicting what you said just now. Regulus, I'm not disillusioned. I still like her face, I still love her. Even if she's dead, that still doesn't change my enduring love for her. Don't you hear it often? Even when someone you love dies, that person lives on inside your heart, because your love for that person endures and will not fade? That's exactly how it is with me. Regulus twisted logic was impeccable. Impeccable, without the slightest confusion, his logic was complete within his mind. Without the slightest room for rebuttal, it was perfect, flawless. In front of the speechless Emilia, Regulus furrowed his brows. Because he spotted a color of distrust within the silent Emilia's eyes. Regulus, I've actually been wondering for a while now. Do you, maybe have a problem with me? If so, then that's really disappointing. I've already made concession after concession out of consideration for you, 
yet can't you appreciate my considerations at all? A person shouldn't be all talk, you know. If you have just the slightest consideration for other people's feelings, if you could just put yourself in other people's shoes, you wouldn't be like this, I don't think. If a person can't even make that modest effort, then I can't see how such a person can have any value whatsoever. It's disrespectful. More specifically, it's disrespectful to me. That, that's unforgivable. Amelia, I think marriage should be something really beautiful. Regulus, huh? Amelia, it's a ceremony that joins two people who love each other and want to be with each other. It's a really big deal to like someone, and so, to find someone out of all the people in this world and have that person also like you back, is an amazing thing, I think. Amelia in her bridal gown held a hand to her chest, while, listening, Regulus face contorted with disbelief. The expressions of the wives in attendance, including number 184 at the altar, began to darken. They must be worried for her, Amelia figured. It was proof that they were compassionate, kind-hearted people after all. Amelia, why do you call your wives by their numbers? Regulus, why get caught up on names? Just like getting bogged down by the superficials, it's a complete misunderstanding of love. I don't need these superfluous embellishments to be confident that my love is real. And so, there is no need to debase myself with such vain trivialities. For love to be equal, one has to let go of those inessential aspects, don't you think? Amelia, I see. But, I don't dislike being called Amelia Tan by Subaru at all. Regulus, Subaru? Hearing a name he could not let slide, a color of displeasure rose on Regulus' face, but Amelia ignored the shift in Regulus' expression as she continued. Amelia, when Subaru calls me Amelia Tan, his voice is packed with feeling. And, occasionally, when he leaves out the tan, I can immediately tell that it's something special. I don't think it's pointless at all. Names should. Carry that kind of feeling. Regulus, Heya, it's like you're just talking by yourself at this point, but, who is Subaru? It's a person's name, isn't it? Actually it's a man's name, isn't it? A girl who's about to marry mentioning a different man's name in front of the man she's about to marry, that goes against all common sense no matter how you look at it, doesn't it? Even if it's just some random stranger's name it still hurts, you know. It hurts. You know? Amelia, he is not a random stranger. Subaru is my chosen knight, a person who calls me by my name and tells me that he loves me. Regulus, huh? Hearing Amelia's answer, a flood of blood-curdling aura gushed from Regulus's body. Sensing this, number 184 and the other wives immediately tried to run for it, but... Regulus, don't move. Anyone dares move, I'll cut their head off. Amelia, dash dash. Regulus, I'll let you explain yourself. Try to choose your words carefully so I don't misunderstand. I don't want this wedding to turn into someone's funeral. You know? Heaving his shoulders, shuddering, Regulus suppressed his emotions as he spoke. Held in place by Regulus' threat, none of the attendants moved. But, without flinching, Amelia met his swelling aura head-on. Amelia, marriage should be between two people who love each other. But, I don't think this meets that criteria at all. Regulus, dash dash. Amelia, because, I still don't know how to love a man as a woman. Even though Subaru tells me that he loves me, I still can't return his feelings or even give him a straightforward answer. That's really unfair of me, and I know how much it hurts him. But. Regulus fell silent, but Amelia wasn't thinking about him. Anyone could tell. That Amelia's eyes did not see him at all. Amelia, even though I don't know how to love someone, I'm sure someday I will. One day I will love someone as a woman. And I've already decided who I'll love when that day comes. That's why. Taking a breath and looking up at Regulus, Amelia spoke. Amelia, I can never be yours. Regulus, HK. Ah, is that right? Well I don't want a selfish bitch like you as my wife either. All the better, ha? Huh? Regulus' face bursted red at Amelia's declaration. In front of Regulus' reaching fingers, 
Emilia's whole body surged with mana to meet his attack. To counter his unknown destructive mechanism, her first action should be... Dash? Just when their attacks were set to begin, a violent noise crashed throughout the chapel. Accompanying the sound was tremendous momentum as something shot straight into Regulus' body like a bullet. Crashing into Regulus in his white tuxedo and shattering upon impact was a wooden door panel, one of the two at the chapel entrance that they had just reinstalled. It had flown all the way from the entrance to hit Regulus. And... Question mark damn it, we kicked at the same time but the results not the same at all. What's with your leg strength? Question mark sorry I didn't adjust it properly. But it managed to hit the target I was aiming to hit, so it turned out all right, didn't it? Question mark the flashiness of the entry is nowhere near the same, okay? My kick only managed to open the door, but your kick landed a direct hit on the enemy. Two grumbling silhouettes appeared at the chapel entrance. One was a black-haired boy, and the other a red-haired youth. Emilia's eyes widened in astonishment, and in front of her, Regulus picked away the wooden shards like picking off insects. Standing there, unhurt, he was glaring at the two intruders with contempt in his eyes. Regulus, you certainly have the gall, crashing a sacred wedding ceremony. I don't remember inviting any male guests, but mind telling me who you are and what wedding presents did you bring? HHA? Met with Regulus Bellow, the two at the entrance looked at each other, then, giving each other a nod. Subaru, spirit knight without his spirit partner, Natsuki Subaru. Reinhard, descendant of the sword saint, Reinhard van Astria. Announcing his name, Reinhard took a step forward. Next to him, Subaru gave Emilia a wink before pointing at Regulus, saying, Subaru, I object to this marriage. And I'll be taking the bride with me. Arc 5, Chapter 49, Thus Opens the Crusade Against Greed A voice which seemed to summon Subaru, who had crashed through the entrance of the church and sprinted inside. It belonged to Emilia, who stood in front of an altar, clad in a wedding dress. Dressed in a snow-white dress, her long hair coiled in a braid on her head, she was too beautiful, lovely to a truly dazzling degree. In the right circumstance, Subaru, more than anyone else, would have wanted to admire Amelia's bridal attire. Subaru, I'll sort out my thoughts on emiddle.mmiddle.t later. Seems like we crashed this wedding here. Reinhardt. The ceremony was already going awry, it seems, though we'll still be regarded as the intruders here. From a ways away, Reinhardt snuck a glance at Amelia and Regulus as they glared at each other, and agreed with Subaru's mutters. The ceremony seemed to be proceeding poorly, offering them a perfect opportunity to intrude. Upon hearing their words, Regulus's already impatient face reddened with rage. He yanked at the front of his suit as his mouth twisted in a vicious pout. Regulus, sorry, though I feel for uninvited guests such as yourselves, this wedding will soon become a funeral anyway. The emotional preparation for such a joyous event to become one of lament. Ah, right you needn't consider such matters anyway. Since you'll soon go from the ones bidding farewell to the ones who should be bid farewell to. Subaru, hey now, what are you going on about when you were rejected right before the wedding? And the bride is so fed up with you she's taking a Narita divorce. Show me a little shame here. Besides, didn't you hear me when I introduced this guy beside me? Regarding Regulus's murderous rambling, Subaru taunted him as he eyed Reinhardt. Surprised, Regulus exhaled an up between his teeth. Regulus, who, the sword saint? I think I've heard of him once. Isn't that the moniker of some guy who knows of nothing but swinging a sword? What are you planning to do with that kind of guy? Could it be that you thought of him as some trump card? Aha, uh -huh, that's rich. Whether it be reputation from history or glory from the bloodline or whatnot, all that is nothing but old-fashioned traditionalism. Notions like that, when struck by a wave of progress, should crumble to ash. Isn't that just nature at work? You too, are you here to demonstrate? Reinhardt, knows of nothing but swinging a sword, huh? It's funny that you'd say that. In truth, many expectations of my roles all stem from that one fact. But, 
there's a slight problem here. Even faced with such arrogance, Reinhardt showed not a trace of annoyance. As he spoke, his hand crept quietly toward his waist. Sheathed there was a celestial sword, with engravings traced by the claws of the dragon itself, which Reinhardt always carried. However, as he clenched his palm around the hilt, he shook his head. Subaru, what's wrong, Reinhardt? Reinhardt, the, dragon sword, is an unparalleled blade which has been passed down since the start of the Astria line, but it does have one flaw. It refuses to be unsheathed in the presence of any enemy it deems unworthy. Subaru, which means. Reinhardt, it seems that the sword has concluded that this enemy isn't worthy of being drawn against. Subaru, HK. Regardless of whether Reinhardt meant it this way, Regulus had received a rather humiliating evaluation. But Subaru had personally witnessed how, during a confrontation with Elsa, the sword hadn't made its appearance, and so he understood what Reinhardt meant. But, even with that in mind, Regulus's unflattering appraisal remained. Regulus, a sword saint who can't even draw his sword, why should I even bother with you? Know your place, scum. In the first place, I'm not even on the same level as you, you, who struggle with your ugliness and unfettered excuses, can't even be compared to one who has already achieved perfection. A fool who can't assure his self-worth without comparing himself to others has no right to face my divine self. Subaru, sounds like, you really do think you're all that. Facing the burning obscenity in Regulus's eyes, Subaru found himself genuinely surprised. Ignoring all his threats, and listening to only the heart of his speech. Subaru, hypocrisy is your forte, isn't it? Claiming to have achieved perfection, when you fall short in every comparison to anyone you find? Regulus, HK. You lowlife, don't you condescend to preach to my flawless self? Infuriated by Subaru's jeers, Regulus finally put his threats into action. With murderous intent, he slammed the ground in front of the altar, instantly, the paved floor shattered with astonishing force. The torrent of destruction pummeled straight ahead, sweeping shards of wood and stone into its overwhelming embrace and shattering them even further. Subaru, Ua? Reinhardt, Subaru, over here. Just as the destructive wave neared him, someone caught him by the neck and yanked him to safety. A sudden gust of wind freed Subaru from the shackles of that torrent, this was Reinhardt's doing. With one hand, he'd pulled Subaru to his side as he evaded the attack. Gently depositing Subaru back on the ground, Reinhardt spun around, preparing to face Regulus. However, Regulus, don't move. Dare to try anything, and they'll all be dead in an instant. Reinhardt. Glaring at Reinhardt, who stood at attention, Regulus placed his hands on the walls of the church. Rows of elaborately dressed women watched him impassively. Clearly, they recognized the intent of his actions and the severity of the situation, but they only stood in their lines, indifferently accepting the surrounding chaos. Subaru, on that note, though I'd rather not look too far into it, who are these women? Regulus, all of them are my dear beloved wives. Lovely princesses who cherish and are cherished by me. Could you bear to allow such innocence to die? How could you be so cruel? Subaru, goddamn, I had a slight suspicion, but I can't establish a conversation at all. Had there ever any way he could? Regulus's rhetoric was completely illogical. To hold these women hostage, and yet to declare that they were his wives, existed in no realm of reason. The worst of it was that both the proclamation of, innocence, and the notion that, Regulus would kill them, were undoubtedly true. This illogical battle of hostages was indeed an extremely effective tactic. Regulus, it's not like I want them to die, or anything. Even so, if you still resist further, I'll have no choice. I'll start at the beginning and go in order. Isn't forcing me to do something so awful just heartless? Subaru, not like that makes any sense at all, but I don't remember pushing you to that point. Regulus, don't nitpick. Maybe I'd be the one directly killing them. But you ignited this fuse. Your murderous intent would be the true weapon. You're using me as a prop. You're the real murderers. Don't evade responsibility. 
you heartless wife murderers. Obscenities burned in Regulus's eyes as he gnashed his teeth. The murderer who spouted his twisted rhetoric seemed not disturbed in the least by his revolting statements. While trying to buy time with dialogue, Subaru snuck a meaningful glance at Reinhardt. However, their volatile opponent held about fifty hostages in his grasp. If both walls collapsed at the same time, even Reinhardt wouldn't be able to prevent any casualties. Subaru. If it went on like this, they'd be stuck in stalemate, no, this was developing exactly the way Regulus hoped it would. However, the moment that he thought so. Emilia, have you forgotten about me already? Regulus, huh? Celeste lights began to dance from beside Regulus. In one instant, the light enveloped the entire church, in the next, a sharp sound was born, the light and sound chained into each other, intertwined and resonating, a simple, clear melody filling the temple. At the same time, a grand enchantment of ice shone in the center of the room. That celeste enchantment centered itself on the altar, forming a sanctuary of ice around the women who Regulus had taken hostage. In addition, the ice had frozen Regulus's legs to the ground, and a frozen sword pressed itself against his bare neck, a sword which extended from Emilia's hand. Emilia, you were far too careless there. Even I can't expect to just jump into a fight with you, so I prepared long and hard to freeze you like that. You lost. Regulus, I say, you're truly incapable of reading the atmosphere, aren't you? Right now, aren't I about to force them to back down? This is an important scene, showing that I'm righteously capable of facing despicable enemies with resolve. And my wives too, everyone clearly believes in and prays for my victory. Who do you think you are? Emilia, free all of us this instant, although no one said it, some of them only stay with you because they're afraid. Even so, you should cherish them, since they're the ones who go out of their way to help you. Regulus, really, who do you think you're talking to? Looks like not making you a wife was wise indeed. Emilia, eh? Subaru, Emilia, no. It's not enough to stop him. Normally, this would be the finale of the act. Emilia's judgment wasn't off. However, her opponent simply, exceeded the limits of humanity. Regulus, TCH. With a sigh, Regulus began twisting his frozen limbs, that slight motion began to disintegrate the ice trapping his legs. As the rest of the ice began melting off, the frozen prison shattered to dust. Faced with this reversal, Emilia had nary the time to even draw breath before Regulus seized her by the neck, and allowed her to dangle, suspended by only his hand. Regulus, such arrogance, without even knowing how to keep yourself decent for a man. It doesn't matter that you're physically and mentally a virgin, your impure spirit finds you. You whore. You filthy slut. As if toying with my innocent heart weren't enough, you took it a step further, and tried to force my hand. Never have I seen such an unforgivable woman. Emilia, coo, who? Ooh. Regulus, your cute face, just how many men has it deceived? Just a brief smile, and you'd warm all their hearts. Just a small sound, and you'd win all their attention. Just a gentle touch, and they'd pour gift upon gift onto you. Ah, ah, what a dirty woman. Subaru, stop. Take your hands off her, you fucker. Sighing to himself, Regulus's voice was filled with disdain as he spoke to Amelia, still caught in his grasp. His eyes, cold and inhuman, cut through Subaru's outrage at those unspeakable words. Regulus, how stupid are you, that you can't work this situation out? Or are you one of those fools who've already given up on understanding? Here am I, ceaselessly trying to explain, but people like you, who thinks no thoughts of self-improvement and abandons all conscious thought, don't you think you're too wasteful of generosity? Do your best to, to stand in someone else's shoes, can't you even do that? Still playing cards like that, isn't your skill in interaction just too outrageous? Reinhardt, let Emilia Summer go, and I'll hear out your requests. From beside Subaru, who found himself speechless with rage, Reinhardt spoke to Regulus. Hearing that, Savage raised his eyebrows. 
seemingly judging that conversation could come to flow more smoothly with Reinhardt than with the seething Subaru, Regulus. Regulus, not bad, not bad, that modest attitude. Precisely because people have all sorts of means of communication, if they want a topic to flow in the direction which they desire, they have to learn to use these methods effectively. Those who don't understand this, the majority, can only rely on brute force to see a message through. How off-putting. Shouldn't it be clear that matters which can be settled through negotiation don't require a show of strength? Well, people like that aren't impressive in the least. Fellows like those stand no chance against a pacifist like me, isn't that just nature? Reinhardt, no need to spin it so dramatically. Allow me to listen to your request. Witnessing Emilia Summer's suffering is painful for both me and my friend, Regulus, all right. Then I'll say it straightforwardly. Drop that sheath from your waist and come stand in front of the altar. As Emilia's face turned ashen, Regulus, in a deliberate motion, hoisted her higher. Her feet dangled in midair, and her sword of ice clattered to the found. Faced with that display, Reinhardt hesitated no longer. He freed the dragon sword from his waist, and handed it to Subaru. Subaru, if this were a play, I'd really have loved to draw this sword and end that bastard. Reinhardt, that's quite the idea, but, regrettably, I doubt you'd be able to unsheathe it either. Rest assured, I will rescue Amelia Summer. Concluding their whispered conversation, Reinhardt complied with Regulus's orders. The sword saint stood, unarmed, in the middle of the temple, stopping when Regulus commanded, Stop here. There were only about five meters left between the two, a distance which Reinhardt could cross, in an instant. And yet, the issue lay in how Regulus currently held Amelia in his hands, and would obliterate her the second Reinhardt drew near, and the true nature of Regulus's invincibility had yet to be solved, even with the hints they possessed. Freeing himself from Amelia's prison, and setting off a path of destruction. Somewhere in those actions lay the principle behind his, invincibility. Subaru. Holding his breath, Subaru monitored Reinhardt's movements carefully. At this moment, unable to find an opportunity to break the stalemate, he could only rely on Reinhardt. Eager as he was to leap into action, he knew that he nothing he did would solve it. Reinhardt, as you wish, I'll stop here. What next? Regulus, let me kill you. Isn't it easy? It's a little cliché, I think so too. But are you here for my wives, or for this slut? I can't feel any sincerity in your thoughts. It's not that I want to force your hand. I just don't want to be misunderstood as a selfish and self-centered person. I'm just a normal man, satisfied with the simple joys of my everyday life. I do hope you fully understand, Reinhardt. Regulus, so, there's only one condition for me to free the hostages. You stand in this place, and bear one strike from me. No defending yourself, and no evasion. As long as you do this, I'll free everyone. Won't your unfair attack on me be forgiven, that way? Reinhardt, one strike, yes? Faced with Regulus's proposal, Reinhardt stroked his chin as he mediated upon it. Watching his thoughtful figure, Subaru mentally shook his head desperately at the absurdity of the proposal. Regardless of how Regulus appeared, the power behind his attacks were obvious. An obscene power which could disintegrate seemingly anything, even Reinhardt wouldn't be able to withstand such a strike. Even if he barely clung to his life, if he were left indisposed, this battle couldn't possibly continue. Reinhardt, I understand. I accept. However, contrary to Subaru's internal fracas, Reinhardt accepted the condition easily. Stunned, Subaru watched Regulus nod with approval. Regulus, a wise epiphany, I see. You have my respect. Although you're an enemy who tried to kill my wives, you seem to have at least some basic human humility. Subaru, hanging onto hostages even as some invincible person, and he doesn't feel as if he's in the wrong. At a glimpse, Regulus and his mellifluous, flowery words were truly disgusting. However, it seemed that Regulus didn't hear Subaru's spite, for he kept his hand laid on Amelia's neck as he turned his right hand to face Reinhardt. Subaru, 
a Reinhardt, you. What are you thinking? Reinhardt, Subaru, as promised. Where I'm lacking, you'll find a way to fill in the gaps, right? Subaru, quit being so discouraging. Even the hardest battle has a chance of being won, was the answer that Subaru had been hoping to hear. However, before he had time to respond, Regulus waved an arm at Reinhardt. He couldn't see. Fingertips sliced through the air, as if tossing something at Reinhardt, however, the projectile was invisible. That attack might well very have been something like an unseen hand. Whether or not the speculation was true was left unanswered. Reinhardt. Reinhardt's figure, which had been standing in front of Subaru, collapsed into a splatter of blood. His bisected body toppled to the ground, as if stuck by an oblique sniper, completely absent of its normal refined temperament. Subaru, eh? Blood flowed forth from Reinhardt's fallen corpse, dyeing the crimson carpet a shade of aubergine. His body trembled like a spring, convulsing in its death throes. Finally, the moment came where even those movements subsided, and the corpse entered the realm of true death. This was Reinhardt van Astria's certain demise. Regulus, no matter how a person acted in life, death is a simple matter. Those who have accomplished great feats, those who have committed great sins, death treats them equally, stealing their lives in the same way. In this gravely unjust world, it's one of the few truly just parts of life. Having killed Reinhardt with only a wave of his hands, Regulus, simply shook his head. The murderer wore a serene look, as if this had nothing to do with his own actions. Regulus, precisely because they know that the end will inevitably come, the living shouldn't pursue too much happiness while they live. Therefore, I am extremely satisfied with the low threshold of my happiness. And if I am, greed, it's only because I'm always eager to appreciate what I do have, and what I will come to have. If I were never satisfied myself with the amount I have, I would never be happy in my lifetime. But fortunately, I was born with a unique gift. The sensibility of finding satisfaction in simple joys. Holding the arm which had killed Reinhardt to his chest, Regulus began to laugh. Then. Regulus, my satisfied self wants to know, are you satisfied with death? If so, congratulations on your death. If not, then those are the words of fate. Subaru, ah 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 ah. Before the echo of Regulus's ridiculous words had even faded, Subaru sprung into action with a roar. He grabbed a chair and flung it at Regulus. Facing the projectile, Regulus swept it away with a single swipe, as if it were a mere insect. To say that the impact shattered the chair would be an understatement, and Regulus stepped away wearing an unpleasant expression. Regulus, compared to that graceful one, you really are really both noisy and crude. Subaru, being a knight without a trace of knightliness happens to be my specialty. Treading on the carpet stained with Reinhardt's blood, Subaru unclasped his whip from his waist, and directed the tip toward Regulus. In response, Regulus simply made a show of tightening his grip on Emilia's neck as he lifted her. Regulus, are your eyes just for decoration? Can't you see that I have leverage here? Reinhardt, this is all very strange. According to what you promised, you should have liberated the hostages. Regulus, eh? The instant he heard that sound, Regulus's face became stricken with horror. Tearing his gaze away from the center of the church, Subaru saw a slender, blood-stained figure, and felt his throat close with shock. Regulus, wah! Reinhardt, the divine protection of the phoenix. With brevity, Reinhardt responded to the wavering Regulus, and three figures moved as one. Subaru leapt toward the altar, allowing his whip to yank a blonde-haired woman to safety. Even as her throat was being choked, Emilia kicked her sword of ice over to Reinhardt. Reinhardt, who had appeared out of nowhere, caught the sword and pointed it at Regulus. With the women shielded from the line of fire, the wielder of that blade hesitated no longer. In the next instant, sound vanished from the world, a brilliant blue light accompanied the shockwave that engulfed the church. Arc 5, Chapter 50, The Shackles of Love When the supernova faded and Subaru's vision had returned to him, 
the state of the church had completely changed. Subaru, though I know I've said this before. Witnessing that scene with his own eyes, Subaru took a soft breath. In order to avoid inhaling the scattered dust particles and wood chips, he covered his mouth with his sleeve. Standing in the now open-air church, bathed in the evening breeze, Subaru stomped on the floor and jabbed a finger at the man in front of him. Subaru, sure enough, this guy's a fucking monster. Reinhardt, though I've said this before, how depressing. Even my heart would be hurt by such words. Subaru, is this really an occasion to complain about heartache? Your physical wounds are obviously the bigger issue here. The hell do you think this is? In the face of Reinhardt's apparent aberrance, Subaru couldn't help but frustratedly bury his face in his hands. Reinhardt returned him a wry smile, as the sword of ice in his right hand shattered and dissipated. Although it has only been swung once, being able to withstand the sword saints might indicated that its durability was deserving of praise. The one who'd made that sword, Emilia, was currently being embraced by Reinhardt's left arm. In that instant, he'd freed Emilia's neck from Regulus's grasp, keeping her safe. As a result, Regulus was the only one who'd suffered that bombardment. Aside from that initial blow, everything seemed to have worked out. Subaru, on that note, what a close call we had. Hey, are you okay? 184. The object of his concern was the woman who he'd yanked out of danger, just as Reinhardt had, before chaos had fallen. Although the golden-haired woman was rather beautiful, her empty eyes and expressionless face gave off a foreboding air. Sure enough, the shock of the situation had gotten to her, was Subaru's thought, and so he met the eyes of the woman as she sat. Subaru, sorry if we surprised you, but in order to take advantages of his weaknesses, we didn't really have any other choice. If you're hurt anywhere, tell us and then we can help fix you up. 184. Although Subaru called out to her, she still gave no reaction. Although this situation was worrying indeed, he couldn't worry about just her and her alone. Leaving the still-sitting woman where she was, he strode toward the altar, or, rather, where the altar had once stood. This place, which strongly resembled what Subaru knew as a church, had been completely desecrated by Reinhardt. The front of the building, where the altar and the corridor leading to a side room had been located, had all been demolished in the wake of the supernova. All that had barely survived were the very edges and the back of the building. Fortunately, due to the protection of Emilia's wall of ice, the seated women had remained untouched. Subaru ran where Emilia and Reinhardt were standing near the crumbling altar. Stepping out of Reinhardt's arms, Emilia immediately gave a pained cough. Subaru, Emilia Tan, are you okay? Emilia, HK. Ah, I'm fine. It's just that my throat feels itchy. Subaru, how are you? Did anything strange happen? Did that creep lick your face or anything? And this wedding dress is spectacular. Did he put it on you? Damn, that fucker, I won't let him go. But this dress truly is amazing. No matter what you wear, you look cute, Emilia Tan. Emilia, Subaru, calm down a bit. I can't quite figure out what you want to say. Faced with the frantically concerned Subaru, Emilia retreated gently. Looking at his distressed appearance as he carefully ascertained that she was safe and sound, Emilia sighed with a smile. Emilia, right, thank you for coming to save me. I knew all along that you'd come. Subaru, I also knew that Emilia Tan believes in me and would wait for rescue. But if I'd crashed the wedding even a little later, who knows what could have. Emilia, it doesn't matter. I wouldn't have married him. If I were to marry, it would have to be someone I like. Subaru, that, that's great. Really reassuring. Then, this person you like. Emilia, ah. Reinhardt. Your injury, how is it? Just as Subaru prepared to go on an offensive strike, Emilia caught sight of Reinhardt and cried out at him. Seeing Emilia's interest in Reinhardt where it mattered, Subaru paused and scowled. The Reinhardt who'd saved Emilia, unexpectedly, he'd sustained a heavy injury. 
The front of the white clothes had been almost exaggeratedly torn and stained entirely with red. Witnessing this explosive scene, Emilia sucked in a cold breath. Subaru, Ak, how brutal. You sure this is fine? Emilia, yes, what a grievous wound. Let me take a look, I'll heal you. Reinhardt, thank you. But don't worry about it. The wound has begun to heal. Responding to the fretting, flustered pair with a smile, Reinhardt wiped at the blood with his own white sleeves. And on his cleaned chest, the traces of the injury were indeed disappearing. The wound was completely gone, leaving only Reinhardt's pristine skin. Subaru, the wounds, vanished. Hey, what happened just now? You hid it even from me. Did you sneakily hide some blood packets on your person or something? Reinhardt, and by just now, you mean. Subaru, stop putting on airs, or are you being for real right now? Just now with Regulus's hostage situation, I didn't know how you planned to deal with it, so I just watched silently. But how did you survive? Ah, just tell me already. Reinhardt, let's put it this way, watching silently was a huge help. Thanks for taking care not to set him off. Even faced with Subaru's impatience, Reinhardt responded in, in an even tone. Thinking that he was just trying to maintain a lighter atmosphere, Subaru sighed. Subaru, I just thought that since it's you, there must have been some trick up your sleeve. But seeing you fall in that shower of blood had me thinking you really were dead, how terrifying. Reinhardt, even so, you reacted in time. I'm very happy you had such faith in me. Subaru, who told you to give this dramatic speech on shortcomings and whatnot. He lightly knocked Reinhardt's shoulders, responding to that guilelessness with coarse words. Listening to their conversation, Emilia's eyes widened with surprise. Emilia, only with those words, you worked that entire scheme out? Subaru, Emilia Tan, when you passed the Sword of Ice to Reinhardt while I was moving, that's what happened too. Reinhardt, that really was a huge help. Not having a weapon on hand and having to strike his body directly was an uneasy notion, for some reason. But I'm glad that it worked out. Subaru, yep, it ended with half the building collapsing. Please take responsible for it. Well, this also counts as a survival flag. Having had numerous encounter with Elsa in the past, Subaru couldn't be too optimistic. Now, while talking like this, there is no slack in his alarm toward Regulus. Subaru, so, Reinhardt, the correct answer to the mystery of that scene is? Did you use an avatar? It couldn't be some kind of cloning technique. Please don't tell me that in addition to being a knight, you're a ninja as well. Reinhardt, although I don't know what a ninja is, I'm sure it's not such a huge mystery. This, divine protection of the phoenix, is just a blessing that can be used to revive the dead. So your observation that I looked like I was dead was correct, I was just a little bit dead. Subaru, just a little bit dead, my ass. Did that mess you up, or are you just an idiot? Being met with such an unexpected answer sent Subaru into another frenzy. Dying under the, divine protection of the phoenix, or whatnot, wasn't it just making a mockery of death? Those were word better left unsaid to Subaru, or, rather, perhaps it was better to say that only Subaru could speak like that. Subaru, what are you doing, stealing my niche and all that? Reinhardt, dash? Sorry. But at the time, I felt that it was the most effective way to deal with the sinner archbishop. And it did in fact work rather smoothly. Ah, but, if possible, I'd prefer to avoid dying again. Emilia, dying in order to save only me. I can't help but feel guilty. Subaru, coo. Emilia, Subaru? What's with the expression? Struck by the force of her reply, the psychological burden of those words was quite something. Moreover, it seems that this dialogue could continue no further. Reinhardt, Subaru. Subaru, understood. Narrowing his blue eyes, Reinhardt called for Subaru. Subaru raised his head at the call, and Emilia glanced to where Reinhardt was looking. The predator, emitting an ominous aura, filled their line of sight. 
he stood atop the collapse's remains of the church, overlooking the other three. White hair, white clothes, and a blank expression, this predator, made of white, snorted and spoke. Regulus, leaving me out, and just bantering and laughing in a place like this. Speaking of which how can you stand to maintain an air of normalcy, isn't that too inhumane? Unless, you felt like you've just stepped on an ant or something? Is blowing me away no different from stepping on a bug? Well, how about it? As he found the flames of his own exaggerated outrage, Regulus leapt from the smoldering wreckage to the remains of the church. As he landed, he straightened out the coat of his white suit, brushed at the sleeves of his shirt, and readjusted the legs of his matching trousers, before turning his narrowed gaze upon them. His body was unchanged from Reinhardt's blow. Whether injury or filthiness, neither showed even a trace on his form. Reinhardt, I see, as I heard from Subaru, you truly are a fearsome opponent. Emilia, just now, the sin archbishop that you mentioned, Subaru. He's the one? Regarding him, Reinhardt and Emilia each offered their own input. Hearing this, Regulus turned a spiteful glare upon Emilia. Regulus, ah, that's right. I'm the witch cult sin archbishop of greed, Regulus Corneas. Speaking of which, without knowing even the identity of the other party, you tried to go through a wedding ceremony. This is a problem that precedes not having an awareness of being a wife. Impudent, immoral, iniquitous. Really, your deficiency as a woman knows no bounds, honestly. Emilia, iniquitous and what not, you didn't tell me anything at all. Impure and immoral are also groundless. And you're a sin archbishop of the witch cult. Witch cult, witch cult. Faced with the resentfully cursing Regulus, Emilia was about to refute his points before she suddenly sank into silence. Her hand on her head, Emilia's eyebrows lifted as if she were thinking hard. Emilia, the witch cults, sin archbishop. You, have you ever faced me before? Regulus, ha? Huh? How would I know? Although, right now, if you were to say that our meeting was fate, that would just be a ridiculous farce. Such a face of rare sweetness, but in spirit you're such a degenerate, how endlessly infuriating. Uwa. Subaru, the fuck are you rambling on about aimlessly, you bastard? Aiming at the endlessly ranting Regulus's face Subaru flicked his whip. Under that impact, Regulus's face snapped to the side, and he snarled with fury. Unsurprisingly, his face bore no trace of the blow. Subaru, at this point, for real, if we can't solve the mystery of his, invincibility, we can't secure out victory. Reinhardt, whether at close range or from afar, every attack is negated. Even Emilia Summer's magic does nothing to stop him. There has to be some kind of trick to defeating him. Subaru, watch out for yourself, all right? Subaru, why does it sound like you're saying something acrimonious? Reinhardt patted that confused Subaru's shoulder briefly, then, he vanished. In the next moment, Reinhardt slammed directly into the predator's body, sending him sprawling backward. Regulus, ha, ah. Uh. With a cry, Regulus, who'd had no time to brace himself, flew backward and slammed into a mountain of debris, further causing it to collapse and disintegrate. Reinhardt, his opponent will me. Hopefully you can solve the mystery of his, invincibility, as quickly as you can. I'll buy time for you. Subaru, right, buying time is nice and all. But wouldn't it be better to just defeat him in one fell swoop? Reinhardt, if I could, I would have done so already. Take these women to safety. If they remain here, they'll be dragged into the battlefield. Emilia, wait, Reinhardt. Although it's probably not too effective, use this. Calling out to stop Reinhardt in his tracks, was Emilia, holding a sword of ice freshly shaped with magic. Emilia, I've been concentrating super hard to make this, it should be a little more durable than the last one. Reinhardt, my thanks is inexpressible. Accepting her proffered blade, Reinhardt offered her his ceremonious gratitude in return. Then he turned and leapt away from the ruins of the church to Regulus. In a single step, he vanished from Subaru's field of vision, crossing an impossible distance. Immediately following his disappearance, 
a shock wave slammed into Subaru's skin. As he bathed in this feeling, he turned to look at Amelia. Subaru, Amelia Tan. In order to avoid getting caught up in Reinhardt's battle, for time being, help get these women somewhere safe. They all have to leave. Speaking of which, are they all married to Regulus? Both now and before, the uniformity of the women trapped in the Wall of Ice felt unnatural. Being Regulus's wives made them all members of the witch cult. At a glance, there were more or less fifty of them. If they attacked as one, how could Subaru handle them without Beatrice's help? Only now had be begun to worry. However, Emilia shook her head, denying this uneasiness. Emilia, it's fine. Although they are his wives, most of them are probably only here through force and coercion. So don't worry. Subaru, right, yeah. If they were a threat, Reinhardt wouldn't have overlooked. Gar, watch out. Just now, flying missiles have started attacking us. How dangerous. Outside of the church, Reinhardt and Regulus were engaging in a battle that resided far beyond the limits of humanity. The wreckage and stone fragments, swept away by various impacts, flew like missiles. If he were to be struck by one, there was no guarantee that he'd stay intact. Although Reinhardt had an absolute advantage when it came to offense, as long as the nature of Regulus's power remained a mystery, that advantage faded bit by bit. Subaru needed to come up with a countermeasure before the predator could overwhelm him. Amelia, hey, are you okay? No injuries? During his moment of reflection, Amelia had started shaking the blonde woman by the shoulders. That was the same woman Subaru had just rescued using his whip. Based on her position in front of the altar, her status seemed unique. However, her expression was just as blank, bearing not even the faintest trace of irritation. Looking up at Emilia, the woman shook her head slowly. 184, I, we have to stay here. If you want to escape, please take care. Emilia, stay, why? Are your feet injured? Then I'll heal you right away. Just this wall of ice isn't enough to keep you safe. Hurry up, we have to leave. 184, please allow me to refuse. Only you can leave this place. Emilia, why? Staying here will involve you in the fight. Regulus will, regardless of your presence, attack anything he wants to. Please, hurry and come with us. 184, Master Summer did not give instructions to leave. Emilia's persuasion was interrupted by the woman's cold voice, conveying her feelings, equally devoid of warmth. Her cold, frozen gaze met Amelia's own amethyst eyes. 184, not listening to husband Summer will make him angry. If that happens, there's only one possible result. Amelia, that's... not... Subaru shared Amelia's speechless reaction. To call her determined would be wrong, for she had no selfhood. To call her unwavering would be wrong, for she had no resolve. Her speech and attitude spoke a heavy despair that had long become inexorable. She, or rather, they had given up long ago. Those hearts, shattered by Regulus, could no longer consider anything other than him. This was a cursed brutality which no longer required words or actions. Subaru, Regulus's opponent is the, sword saint, Reinhardt. I know you're terrified of him, but Reinhardt's not going to have any issue killing him. So, don't stay here. There's no need to endanger your lives. 184, it doesn't matter who the opponent is. Sword Saint? Please, don't kid. How could anyone match husband Summer? Regulus Corneas? The woman dismissed Subaru's reassurances with naught but contempt. That was her first time, showing any sort of genuine emotion. The scornful dismissal of an adult, looking down upon a child's ignorant delusion. Only then, did Subaru understand the true nature of this distorted relationship. The wives of Regulus Corneas had absolute faith in their husband. Even the knowledge that his opponent was the, sword saint, Reinhardt did nothing to loosen the shackle of the curse that no one could undo. The unparalleled, overwhelming power Regulus possessed held complete dominion over the hearts of his wives. The wife trusts her husband, 
and the husband maintains a firm grip on his wife's heart. In a sense, it was the ideal state of a relationship. But that serene surface gave way to inner distortions. Subaru, damn it. Subaru came to the painful realization that mere words would not move them. The women before him all unanimously believed this, the lack of dissent and dead silence only served to prove so. To force them to leave would take nothing less thorough than knocking all of them out and moving them one by one, but they were pressed for the freedom to take such drastic actions. Subaru, Reinhardt. Change of plans. Do what I mentioned before. Dispelling the idea of persuading the women, Subaru climbed atop the collapsed church and called out to Reinhardt, who was currently defying the law of gravity as he dashed across the side of a building. He flicked his eyes to the side. Reinhardt, are we speeding up the battle? Hey, Subaru, have you ensured the women's safety? Subaru, dash. The hell? Where's this sound coming from? Reinhardt, this is the, divine protection of telepathy, which can spread my voice to those within a certain range. Subaru, could you stop being so superhuman? Even to the borderline non-combatant Subaru, Reinhardt's movements were clearly beyond the scope of human comprehension. Running and kicking off from a wall, Reinhardt flew into the air and spun rapidly. The instant before he landed, he allowed his clothing to spread, slowing down his momentum, and swung his slender legs to send a blade of wind slicing toward the ground, sweeping up both dust and brick, the wave slammed directly into the predator waiting at the end, Regulus's figure, unable to stay standing, was blown away again. Subaru, that murder circus just now, what was it? Reinhardt, he attacks by throwing stones or sand. There's really no gap of safety between the particles being scattered around. Subaru, in my case it sounds like I want to hide from the rain. More importantly, move the battlefield. Those women won't move. They're so terrified of Regulus, they don't dare to. Reinhardt, I see, understood. Then, allow me to try. Lowering his voice, Reinhardt leapt lightly toward Regulus. Climbing to his feet once again, Regulus, stomped on the ground, sending bits of wood and sand flying. However, with economic movements, Reinhardt evaded and drew Amelia's ice sword, slashing at Regulus and sending him flying once more. The screaming of the predator overlapped with the crisp sound of the shattering of the ice blade. Amelia, Subaru. What are we planning to do? Subaru, lead that bastard away from here. Wow, Amelia Tan is bold. Amelia, this dress is pretty, but really inconvenient. Standing in from of Subaru was Amelia, who had yanked away part of her dress. The restrictive parts of the white wedding dress had been daringly torn open, revealing more of Amelia's white thighs than should have been visible in an enticing sight. Amelia, it doesn't matter. Anyway, what do you want from Reinhardt? Subaru, a plan we thought of before the battle, since we don't know what the true extent of Regulus's power is. We'll have to test possible weaknesses one by one. Emilia nodded as Subaru retrieved Reinhardt's loved sword from the church. Then, he and Emilia rushed straight toward Reinhardt's battlefield. Regulus, gar. Fucker, quit jumping up and down. Cursing loudly, Regulus waved his both hands up and down. His target was Reinhardt, who weaved rapidly back and forth, and his weapon was the plentiful gravel laying about. Normally, bits of gravel could only serve to blind an opponent. People who used it as a weapon had character is unworthy of praise, but if Regulus were the wielder, the power of this despicable tactic would skyrocket. Buildings began to crumble where the gravel came into contact with them, and the surrounding scenery fell into ruination. Reinhardt, TCH. Watching the cataclysmic destruction unfolding in front of him, Reinhardt launched into a dramatic evasion. He lowered his body as if he were planning to drop into a crawl and sped into motion. Contrary to his seemingly unsightly appearance, he was moving so fast that he'd ventured beyond the reach of ordinary people. And thus, Regulus, who was no different from an ordinary person, had no way of catching up to Reinhardt. Regulus, damn. Hey. Where'd you run off to, looking like a bug? Faced with the threat of losing his target, 
Regulus attacked indiscriminately from all directions. The rising of goosebumps on skin a sure sign that approaching would be terribly dangerous, a survival instinct everyone was born with, warning against enemies close at hand. In actuality, this has little to do with the presence of a clear threat. Any living creature was susceptible to this feeling. Regulus was no exception, the tingling of his nerves, all throughout his body, tipped him off that something was wrong. Only, this incredible threat was approaching from all directions, an oppressive ring of menace. Regulus, you fucker, what in the world are ye? Reinhardt, I am but a knight to the king candidate felt summer. Please also be sure to give her all your support. Regulus, dash. With a line that may or may not have been a joke, a steady voice spoke. The shocked Regulus took a sharp impact on his head, perhaps it was smashed by steel. The weapon had been bent completely out of shape, and a squeaking sound indicated that it had been cast aside. Humiliated, Regulus glared at the ground as he bit his lip, with crisp footwork that prevented ease of attack, Reinhardt assumed his stance. The offensive and defensive battles of the, sword saint, and, greed, were clear to both parties to the confrontation. Exerting the conventional combat power, the strength of Reinhardt, which could toy with even the deadliest of sin archbishops, could not be said to be of world. But, even so. Regulus, the one to win will be me, can't you understand? Although I have no clue how well you've been doing with this violent power that can only think of oppressing others, someone like you, whose happiness is built upon the sacrifice of others, will be stopped here. With this power, how many people's lives have you trampled upon? That greed really is despicable. Reinhardt, that really is distressing to hear. It is true that, because of me, some have lost sight of their happiness. Without question, the reason why I do what I do is none other than for the sake of atonement. In the face of Regulus's ridiculous rhetoric, Reinhardt's eyes narrowed slightly, seeing the sword saint's responsive movement, Regulus widened his own. Regulus, the hell is this? Some kind of you don't need to say it because I already know ploy? I'm aware of my own sins. I'm aware so I'm trying to fix my bad qualities, I tell you. So it's an attempt to let it all be water under the bridge? Jokes can only go so far. No one's holding any expectations to what you'll do in the future. All that matters is what you did in the past. Your feet were once planted on the ground, where someone licked your souls. To such a person, whether you help tens of thousands or hundreds of millions of people, it's all meaningless. Sinner, just die. You, able only to beg of others, stop pretending to be a good person already. Reinhardt, talking to you, I really do get the feeling of being shown a mirror. This must be the reason why Subaru told me to avoid seriously lending an ear to you. Regulus, speaking of which. That guy over there, is that this Subaru? The rotten man who snatched by bride from me, that hateful bastard. Even if she ended up being a dirty whore, his transgression can never be forgiven. To those who try to take what belongs to others, due punishment is, uwa. Halfway through his tirade, Regulus's world suddenly spun upside down. At that moment, Reinhardt had dropped his stance and grabbed Regulus's left ankle, spinning him around. A rotating field of violent destruction, Regulus's back hit a wall. Under that impact, a shower of dust scattered as Regulus's body, still being swung back and forth, crashed through and collapsed a building. Reinhardt, although direct contact with you feels rather dangerous, but I'll try to get it over with as soon as possible. Regulus, what, are you doing this so you can call him a friend? What a goddamn fake show of hypocrisy. Your debased self naturally has no decent friends. With someone known as a rapist, sharing a friendship is. Reinhardt, dealing with you really is unbearable, doubly so when you slander my friends. The wind suddenly wrapped around their bodies, and the sense of rapid rising followed closely. If you were to take a glimpse, the figures of the two are suspended in the midst of the night sky, and right next to them, the full moon shines brightly. At that place, where the light of the moon lay within reach, Regulus stst. Regulus, so, it is not a matter of strength at all. Dropping me from such a height will end this, 
You can't be truly naive enough to believe that. Are you playing me for a fool? Reynard, indeed, I could try slamming you down and lodging you in the earth. But those weren't my instructions. Regulus, what are you? In midair, without any foothold, Reinhardt alternated between drifting up and down by shifting his body slightly. Regulus, still being gripped by his foot, was subjected to centrifugal force and, still being swung by Reinhardt, his eyes widened as he glanced downward. Regulus, no way. Reinhardt, what's coming seems to be known as the first wave. I hope that I will not see you again afterwards. It was a rare sarcastic line from Reinhardt, but Regulus had no leeway to pay attention to it. Reinhardt, with all his might, swung Regulus downward. Whipping through the air, Regulus's dense form sped into the canal directly beneath him with the momentum of a bullet. Regulus, bathed by the wind, could only watch as the surface of the canal approached. Regulus, the only threat is the water. Rotating back and forth as he sailed downward, Regulus stretched out his hands, intending for them to slam into the water. The unprepared Reinhardt, hovering defenselessly in the sky, would follow in a moment. Then, that calm face of his could be shattered in a single blow. At that thought. Subaru, Emilia, go. Emilia, all Huma. Hearing the voices of that hateful man and woman, the lingering light of the corner of his eye immediately illuminated the detestable pair. A black-haired boy gesturing with a finger, and a silver-haired girl who chanted quietly. In the next moment, falling from above Regulus, were icicles shooting forward at a speed which matched his momentum. The icicles caught his clothes' limbs, accelerating his fall. Further, the last one slammed directly into Regulus's back, freezing his body solid. A total of five icicles bound Regulus's extremities, using his body as a freezing point as it plummeted into the canal. Immediately, a hand of ice stretched forward, centering on where Regulus had fallen tracing the flow of the water. The canal was sealed in an icy tomb, without so much as a single opening. Subaru, Operation, Splash, nicknamed Operation I was a complete success. Reinhardt, I hope it was effective. Next to Subaru, who gazed into the frozen waterway, landed Reinhardt, cloaked in moonlight. After having thrown Regulus from the sky, the trajectory of that fall should have meant that he would not be able to avoid the falling water, but in fact even a droplet brushing him would have been a miracle. That Reinhardt could move so well in midair was hardly even surprising. Emilia, sealing his range of movement and tossing him into water, freezing it afterward. There's no way he'll ever surface again, is there? From Reinhardt's other side, Emilia stared into the water. The one who had drawn up the battle plans had been Subaru, and the one who had facilitated them had been Reinhardt. However, Emilia had been the one who had pushed Regulus into a state of desperation. Even if the other party had been an unreasonable murderer, Emilia still wore a rather timid expression. If everything proceeded smoothly, he'd soon be naught but a drowned corpse. Emilia felt that she'd overstepped, this feeling was not without reason. Subaru. Regarding that Emilia, Subaru crossed his arms in consideration. Although he felt rather sorry for her, to have Regulus drown was the best outcome of this. If that weren't possible, leaving him in a state mirroring death would be best. However, the worst possibility must also be expected. For example. Subaru, Reinhardt. Reinhardt, TSK. Right in front of their eyes, the ice's surface cracked, and immediately after, a jet of water spouted up, blasting straight toward them. At the sight of the spouting water, Reinhardt grabbed both Emilia and Subaru as the jet of water closed in on them. His arms wrapped around their waists, he jumped backwards in one leap, after they were well out of the reach of the jet of water, Reinhardt narrowed his eyes. Reinhardt, it seems that it hasn't been settled yet. Subaru, right. On that note, this guy, he's really bad news. Reinhardt and Subaru had each fixated on something different. Reinhardt was watching the figure standing atop a drifting piece of ice, whereas Subaru was looking at the outcome that had been caused by the jet of water which that figure had capriciously unleashed. Water droplets flew about, 
pouring down near where Subaru and the others were standing. The outcome was nothing so charming as the pitter-patter stopping and just dampening the earth below, each part of the spray bored thoroughly into the earth, carving through the ground as if biting with the force of a gigantic beast. This destructive power was not inferior to that of stones and sand thrown by Regulus. Which is to say, whether wielding solid or liquid, Regulus's attack power stayed constant. Emilia, his body, it's not frozen at all. Just like what happened at the church. Muttering this, Emilia looked at Regulus, still perched atop that piece of drifting ice. Subaru had entrusted her with the task of freezing his body and limbs using magic. As per Subaru's instructions to show no mercy, the icicle pierced right through the middle of Regulus' body and limbs, such an act should have left him more than half dead. However, when he'd fallen into the water, the tip of the icicle hadn't penetrated his body, and so Regulus was merely frozen on the surface, just as he had been in the church. To Regulus, neither freezing nor magic was effective. Like projectiles and strikes, he could also invalidate those types of attacks. Subaru, although, when he shrugged off, Roth's flames, I did suspect a little. The fundamental of his invincibility, is a unilateral specialization cancelling out any physical or magical attacks. Reinhardt, is there something I can try to confirm with combat? Subaru, about that, if we don't close in to try? Interrupting Subaru's response to Reinhardt's words was a change in the canal. A vortex appeared on the water's frozen surface, a distance from where the crack was. Gradually, its momentum increased, pulling in the drifting ice which Regulus occupied. And then... Subaru, water dragon. Leaping from the heart of the maelstrom, the dragon bared its fangs at Regulus, who was standing on top of the ice. Usually occupying the waterways surrounding the city, was one of the domesticated water dragons. The supposedly docile water dragon opened its jaws wide, aiming to lunge at Regulus's slender back. Perhaps, even that water dragon had received quite a bit of, Roth's influence, a tragedy that never should have taken place, however, its jaws did not have a chance to close. Subaru, HK. Subaru's throat involuntarily clogged up at the gruesome spectacle unfolding before him. What happened in this moment, how could it even be described? The water dragons more jerked out of place at the very moment they had clamped down onto Regulus. As if in a game of Daruma Atoshi, the water dragon's lower jaw was dislocated, keeping its momentum as it flew toward Regulus, its mandible shifted. A more which should have dragged Regulus into the canal. However, unable to correct the dislocation, it split in two with a great shudder. The halves of bisected water dragon poured blood into the water as they were submerged. After a moment, an exaggerated amount of blood and viscera that once been a water dragon floated to the surface, this had been its gruesome demise. Reinhardt, Emilia Summer. If possible, could you make me a spear? Emilia, huh? Reinhardt, a spear. A spear of ice, please. I've troubled you. Faced with the same sight, Reinhardt muttered this to the befuddled Emilia. Connecting the dots, Emilia hurriedly focused her mana. After several unsuccessful attempts, eventually Emilia created an ice spear, and handed it over to Reinhardt. After testing its balance. Reinhardt, excuse me. Grasping the ice spear, he drew his wrist back back to aim Regulus, and let the missile fly. The spear flew true, however, it wasn't the sharp tip that had been pointed at Regulus. As it turned to its side, its shaft scored a direct hit. But the fact of matter was that when the shaft of the spear crashed against Regulus, it fell straight into the waterway, broken into two. Emilia, what is the meaning of this? Subaru, I see. I get it, Reinhardt. Seeing the state of the broken spear, Emilia tilted her head in confusion. From beside her, Subaru grasped the meaning behind why Reinhardt had done this, shuddering at its outcome. Hearing Subaru's acknowledgement, Reinhardt nodded and said, Reinhardt, Emilia Summer, did you see what happened to the spear when it hit him? Emilia, it broke, right? A spear of ice is different from a real one, so it's natural for it to have broken in two after it struck with such force. Reinhardt, not quite, 
The spear didn't break. The part of the spear that hit him is missing. The part that hit him is missing, separated, the spear was broken not into two, but three. Reinhardt's explanation served as an answer to what had happened to the spear and with the water dragon. Neither object, upon contact with Regulus, managed to penetrate his body. With an ordinary barrier, the collision would have caused a projectile to bounce off or shatter from the impact, but neither had happened. Regulus's body literally rejected anything that collided with it. Regulus, what cluelessly naive expressions you're all wearing. This is just how it is. Just as the three reached a consensus, Regulus's voice suddenly sounded from the ice. That calm voice made it sound as if he were just whispering to himself. The instant Subaru thought that, an unpleasant shock hit him in the back. Regulus, ununderstanding, ununderstanding gun understanding gun understanding. All of you, really, really really understand nothing. It won't amount to anything. You have no chance. You'll achieve nothing. No matter how much you strain and struggle, it's meaningless. Why can't you see that? I'll say it to you, show it to you, force you to see. You could never understand. Regulus whispered to himself as he leapt from the ice. Having jumped forward only slightly, his body plummeted into the canal, for a moment, his figure vanished. However, with one hand on the edge of the canal, he pulled himself from the water, climbing back onto the street. Then, once again, he squared his gaze at those who were watching him. Reinhardt, his body isn't wet in the slightest. His breathing remains unchanged. Naturally, the fragments of ice need not even a mention, nor has a single a drop of blood splashed onto him. His clothes are completely clean, and equally unstained by water. Observing Regulus, Reinhardt gave a quick report. Upon hearing it, Subaru nodded and tried to consider all his concerns even as he suppressed his horror. It seemed that everything he'd intended to confirm with combat had been checked. However, there was not a trace of good news, this was the worst forecast possible. Reinhardt, Subaru, my sword. Subaru, oh, ah, right. At Reinhardt's request, Subaru quickly handed over the sword that he'd been holding all along. As Reinhardt gently tested the handle of his beloved sword, Emilia looked on from the side, wondering timidly. Emilia, can the sword be unsheathed? Reinhardt, no, the handle is still fixed. It seems that it won't be obedient. But there's no other weapon that can be used to confront him. Emilia, since your sword can't be drawn, what are you going to do? Attack him directly with the sheath? Reinhardt, not exactly. But that's not too far off. With nary a trace of tenseness in his voice, Reinhardt stepped forward. He placed himself in front of Subaru and Emilia, shielding them from Regulus's line of sight. Reinhardt, Subaru, please allow the task of buying time to be handed over to me. You can continue to decipher his power. Subaru, feels like the difficulty just rose a setting, but I'll be cheering for you. Emilia, I, I'll also cheer. Reinhardt, then, I will also cheer. Go. As soon as the sound of his voice fell, Reinhardt flew forward. Regulus, who had been kept waiting, met him with only calmness. Regulus, I say, did you not see? If not fate of the dragon, then the spear, is your imagination truly so lacking? Reinhardt, only paying attention to a coin by your foot will draw your attention away from what is important, as my master once said. Regulus, is that so? Regulus's sigh, deep and uninterested, overlapped with Reinhardt's opening strike. The sound of the muscles and bones being penetrated by something sharp tore through the air, and Subaru's throat couldn't help but stiffen. He watched as Reinhardt gripped the scabbard, slamming the hilt of the sword into Regulus. Regulus, oh, seems that you don't even have a strategy. The sound of these blows was different from the fate of the water dragon and the ice gun, at least Reinhardt's beloved sword would not break upon hitting Regulus, no matter what he did. However, Regulus gave no reaction to the attacks. Reinhardt's previous attacks, although dealing no damage, had at least been enough to send him flying, now, even that effect was lost. Reinhardt, 
Feel free to be proud. You are the second to force me to use Dragon Sword Reed. Regulus, I can't hear anything but belittlement. Do you truly disregard me so? This isn't the nature of sword, is that what you mean? Such a denigrating gaze, such disparaging words, to one as enlightened as myself, it's only natural that I'd understand. Reinhardt, that's all rather, ah. As he provoked Regulus, Reinhardt weaved in and out of close proximity. Faced with those murderous fingertips Reinhardt's evasive movements put his whole body into motion. Suddenly, his legs stopped moving. No, they were kept from moving. Reinhardt collapsed onto his knees, kneeling in place. His right calf had split open, spilling forth copious amounts of blood. Subaru, were you hit? What happened? Subaru cried out, and Reinhardt frowned through his confusion. Neither Subaru, observing from a distance, not Reinhardt, from right up close, could discern what had happened. The one who had posed this question gave his evaluation of failure. Regulus, with your inhuman eyesight and reactions, you can escape the bit's gravel and water. But you're too naive, aren't you? If you truly want to confront me, prevent me from breathing. You can't, can you? Just now. I exhaled. Reinhardt, even breaths. Against Reinhardt, who'd fallen to the ground, Regulus approached without mercy. With a direct hit, his attack would be enough to send Reinhardt flying, into pieces. Toward this attack, Reinhardt no longer had any time to dodge. Hastily, he quickly lifted the sword in his arms, blocking the blow with its black scabbard. Reinhardt, coup. Regulus, just what do you think you can do, with that annoying scabbard in the way? Clinging to something that you're unworthy of, why do people like you do such things? I can't understand at all. With this defensive action, Reinhardt's body was sent flying as if it were a toy ball. Although protected from the fatal power of the kick, he fell into the street, crashing through the surrounding architecture. As Reinhardt's body rolled and rolled, the destruction only continued. In that moment, Reinhardt's form, sent flying, became nothing but a bullet. Regulus, right, and now. Subaru, dash. Seeing Reinhardt off well into the distance, Regulus seemed to remember something as he turned around. Being firmly fixed by that gaze, Subaru immediately tensed. Emilia, from beside him, immediately chanted a canto, and in an instant the sky was covered with a multitude of icicles, which ruthlessly flew toward Regulus. However, the results spoke for themselves. Regulus, a woman who can't read the situation is just the word. Having to spend time on disciplining them is such a shame. However, because women are just ignorant creatures, they must first be taught. That's just how it is. They're much better after they've been tamed. Slamming into his body and shattering into shards, those icicles were unable to even budge him before they fell to the ground. Languidly, Regulus approached them. Subaru, Emilia. Trying to fight is useless right now. If we still don't understand the mystery, even if we attack, it won't have any effect. Emilia, but... Subaru, right, for now let's just get out of here. Seizing the wrist of the stubborn Emilia, Subaru tried to pull her away from Regulus. Subaru's actions only served to excite Regulus further. Regulus, ha ha, are you trying to flee? Well, that's only natural. Now that the situation is like this, where you stand no chance against me, though you should have understood that well before you childishly knock upon my door. If you want to flee, then run. Just what was he thinking? Regulus watches them flee with nothing but smiles. However, given this chance to escape, they needed to capitalize on it. No matter what, right now, they had no time to even. Regulus, but, you'd have to get away first. As he spoke, Regulus approached Canal, Leaning over, he hoisted half of the water dragon's corpse out of the water. Grabbing its tail, he began to whip it back and forth with a ferocious smile. Emilia, H. Hey, Subaru. I, have this feeling of foreboding. Subaru, what a coincidence, so do I. As for what he would do, neither had any clue. However, 
every unremarkable action he took had completely extraordinary results, that much was plain as day. Therefore, Subaru and Emilia's pace increased rapidly. Taking his time, Regulus laughed pleasantly as he raised his head, before leaping into motion. He set foot on the roof of an adjacent building, then jumped over its upper floors, landing on another, taller structure, until he finally reached a building the height of a clock tower. After that period, both parties now stood a sizable distance apart. However, despite the distance they'd gained, Subaru could still make out Regulus's face, showing so clearly, was that murderous smirk. Regulus, come, if you want to try to hide, see if you can. Poor undeserving of becoming a bride, and bastard who regards this woman as a treasure. I will deliver to you a rain of blood. Regulus lifted the half of water dragon with both hands, and twisted the corpse mercilessly. The dragon's flesh split with an unpleasant squelch, and the slowly dripping blood gushed forth. The bloody wreckage was gleefully waved by Regulus from his high platform. Holding the corpse's tail, still drenched in blood, as if waving a wet towel. As it rotating over his head, endlessly, blood scattered in a halo. Father, father, until its momentum brought it to where Subaru and Emilia had fled. Then, the result was. Emilia, Subaru. Subaru, run 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 run. The downpour of blood became a rain of destruction, further blighting the city, this carpet bombing aimed directly at the retreating figures of the pair that had been forced to flee. Arc 5, Chapter 51, Malice in Trickery. Ricardo, why are ye making that face? Something bothering ye? Just before reaching the control tower, Ricardo spoke to the knight, who wore a stiff expression. Halting in his step, Julius raised his brows in surprise. Julius, how surprising, Ricardo. I never expected you to be concerned about others' worries. Ricardo, don't mistake that phrase for something else. The one with Yars just me. Even if you say something, it'll be a secret from Miss too. Julius, you're not wrong, ha. Huh? Though it was rare, Ricardo often made correct observations of people. If not for that, he wouldn't have been able to, to take up his role as the head of the Iron Fang hearing only fragments of his splendid career would lead tell so. Looking at only one's self and ignoring surroundings was no way to stay alive. Slave, mercenary, this applied to both roles. Ricardo, now that's quite the brutal brat. Even so, I'll play the role I'm supposed to, so you can depend on me. I'll also take son-in-law's consultation. Julius, that son-in-law is scary. I do not hold any such strange feelings for Anastasia Summer. Ricardo, what's that, Zmiss affair ha? Huh? Maybe it's about Mimi. Besides, she hasn't managed to convince Miss yet. Julia smiled bitterly. This gesture of quietly shaking his head was graceful as always, but this time he lacked precision when choosing appropriate words. And at that gesture. Ricardo, something's off about the recapture of the city hall. Miss agrees too. Miss hasn't heard much about it, but I'll force it all out. Julius, it seems you are rather unforgiving. Ricardo, of course, it's life-threatening. Don't want to leave my back to someone who's in th dark. Are you going to fabricate some kind of excuse as a rebuttal? Julius, no, it is indeed as you say. It was I who was mistaken, certainly. I am increasing our risk by hesitating to speak. Julius earnestly nodded to the pursuing Ricardo, and curved his brows with elegance. However, no more words came out of the mouth of his troubled self. Facing that attitude, Ricardo got out of his own numbness and let out a sullen voice. Ricardo, why are you stopping there? It's sad that you're so lost. Just let it out of your mouth and frankly speak it all out, can't you do that? Zhu what's stopping ya? Ricardo, Julius. Julius, I apologize. I am unable to decide which words would be appropriate to express what I want to say. The reason for my worry is just as you guessed, the sin archbishop that was encountered in the city government building. Roy Alfadov, gluttony, was that person, unmistakably. Unmistakably, but. 
Julius confusedly cut off his words halfway as uncertainty wavered in his yellow eyes. Julius, similar to the other Sin archbishops, perhaps, gluttony, also possesses an inexplicable ability. The power of eating memories, eating names, was noticeable back at the time of the battle with the white whale. However, Ricardo, Julius. Ricardo called out the moment he felt unease touching his very core. And Julius instantly recognized the meaning behind it. The atmosphere trembled, all sounds disappeared from the world, and a light rose into the sky. There could be only one situation in which that extraordinary light would pierce the night sky. It must be the aftermath of a slash by the strongest individual in this world. Ricardo, such a fancy move. I'm correct to assume it's the sword saint, huh? Julius, ah, Reinhardt, isn't it? It seems that Subaru and the others have already come in contact with, greed. We cannot afford to make any delays either. We must also hurry. When one Sin Archbishop was attacked, the other Sin Archbishops did not come together in defense and retaliation. Julius and Ricardo sped up their pace, aiming for the approaching control tower. Ricardo, so, what's so strange about that, gluttony? Did you say he's an extraordinary monster? Ricardo tapped on his shoulder in hopes of hearing Julius' story to its conclusion and interrupted Julius' forward momentum. Julius turned his head and looked back, with a gaze which denied what he had just said. Julius, no. Although it does seem like he was not completely serious, the skill of, gluttony, does not seem to exceed human knowledge itself. If we both are his opponents, then that may just be enough for him, however, the enemy's creepiness is a totally different subject. His unavoidable worry itself was because of the fact that Julius himself did not know the extent of its true creepiness. And it was Julius' unusual selfishness which made him avoid mentioning this argument in the previous strategy meeting. Julius considered, gluttony, to be an unfathomable and eerie opponent, but still believed that he must cross swords with him. Ricardo did not know the reason behind it, it could not be said that even Julius clearly knew, either. They kicked the stone pavement and passed the curve of the street to its exit. There lied one of four control towers, colored differently compared to the other buildings, and in front of that was. Question mark colon ah, we thought that you'd come. We expected that you'd come. That's right, that's exactly right, that's completely right, perhaps that's right. Maybe that's right, probably that's right, isn't that right, isn't that probably right, because that's right Sue. The wait was well worth it Sue. Before the entrance of the control tower, a lone boy stood on the cobblestone square. Dressed in dirty rags, dark brown hair left to grow for a long time till it reached great length. His crazy eyes twinkling and shining with happiness, sharp canine teeth and a dripping tongue hung from his mouth. With both arms slouched down, he was a young boy. No matter how you looked at him, he barely seemed to have any power and looked like simply a vagrant child, but an aura of dreadfulness emanated from his body. Ricardo, one more thing, Zhu to confirm. It's him, right? There wasn't any need to ask, whether it was. There was no doubt, it was completely convincing. As a response to Ricardo, Julius only lowered his jaw quietly. There was no possible doubt, no possible mistake, that it was the sin Archbishop of, Gluttony, standing there. The worst kind of blasphemer who chewed on the names and memories of others. Julius, Roy Alphard. Roy, yes, correct answer. That's our name. We're happy that you remember it. Quite happy. Pretty happy. Really happy. As we're happy. Because we're happy, drinking Sue gluttony sue. It would be worthwhile to eat, and dry nk. And also. Declaring his name, Alphard laughed with terrible brutality. His eyes glared directly at Ricardo standing right next to Julius. He opened his mouth and rings his nose as his eyes filled with ecstasy. Roy, this time it seems that we will be even getting a puppy chan. That makes us unbelievably happy. After all, our stomach might have had gotten a bit troubled if it was due St. Julius Duocalius Cun. Whatever you say, it would have had been completely tasteless, won't it? Julius, 
it seems I have gotten rather bored by your words of insult. Henceforth to settle this quickly, I asked my friend to accompany me this time. Though it is definitely inelegant to have more than one person. Roy, a uh, h, it's nice, that way of starting. Doing that to raise self-consciousness may be nice and it is typical of Julius Kun Bouti, it's rather weak. We are gourmand so tasting that is a bit problematic, but still, we are intrigued as Julius Kun is one of the top class we have seen till now. Tidy a uh, n d consistent. Julius, well, well. In addition to the big welcome we received, I am grateful for those words as well. Roy, well that cannot be helped Sue. Our, our honesty is something that gets overlooked. What we want you to overlook right now, is this slight mismatch of characters. Waving his hands, Alphard did not bend his posture till the end. Provocatively, Julius kept his calm, but Ricardo was unable to hide his feeling of unpleasantness. He clicked his tongue and cracked to the bones of his neck. Ricardo, O.H., say what you wanna say, oi. It'll be mistake to overlook you as just some brat. What you'll get for your sins won't be very pretty. I'll even travel across dimensions just to beat your ass. Because, boy will I break that. Roy, oh, scary scary. Don't stare at us with that scary face. We apologize if you got offended that we called you a puppy, Ricardo Welkin. But still, we still longed for you a bit, you know? Don't scare us, in that rough loud voice of yours. Dash? Calling Ricardo by his name, he shouted, as Julius frowned. Seeing his eyes, Julius shook his head. Strange. Alphard's remarks were merely a madman's delusion, but the enormous sense of discomfort could not be easily wiped away. For example, when did he, learn Ricardo's name? Ricardo, damn spooky brat. From where, and when, did you learn our names? Roy, it wouldn't be very wry wise to try and investigate. It's just that, it's obvious that we would know your name. Isn't that true, Julius Kuen? Julius, no matter how much you consent, I cannot respond to you. You too, I am completely ignorant regarding you. If this is the way you will do it, I will break the flow just as much. Roy, look, there's that boring conclusion again. Even though we care about it quite much, it's uneasy it's uneasy it's unpleasant Sue. Hiding it in the chest, putting aside thinking about oneself for later Sue. It's pretty virtuous as a knight, but it's pretty boring as a person. Pulling out his knight sword, Julius's lips silently whisper something. And immediately afterwards, Six extremely brilliant lights surrounded Julius. They were the six quasi-spirits Julius is always accompanied by. This mix of swordsmanship and spirit arts was what made Julius the knight impeccable. Roy, neither the aroma of the feeling of inferiority, nor the rich texture of experiencing frustration, even the sweetness of a strong desire, or the rare taste of a sense of satisfaction after you've aged, you have no knee of them Sue. Julius, Ricardo, give it your everything from the very beginning. Let's work together. Ricardo, yeah, leave it to me. Shaking his arms, Alphard revealed the daggers attached on his wrists. Wielding two daggers was, gluttony's, fighting style, but it did not seem to be enough to stop Julius' magic or prevent Ricardo's blows. As long as the battle wasn't an ambush, their respective victory and defeat were already in sight. Regardless, in Ricardo's eyes, Alphard did not seem an opponent that could provide a rich and challenging battle experience. Julius, Spirit Knight, Julius Duocalius. As per his manners, Julius gave his name ahead of the fight. However, Ricardo, who was standing next to him, had no such obligations to follow. They fixed their eyes, waiting for, gluttony, to give his identity. Seeing Ricardo's line of sight, Alphard shouted. Roy, how nice, quite nice, perhaps it is nice, isn't it nice, maybe it is nice, possibly it is nice, probably it is nice, because it is probably nice Sue. Gluttonous drinking Sue. Gluttony Sue. Gourmet, bizarre eating, satiation, overeating Sue. Spiciness, blandness, deliciousness, delicacy Sue. We will eat everything up Sue. Even a life without taste, 
is also a taste that's new to us too. Julius, L. Clausel. The vibrance of the six colors draw a circle in front of Julius's eyes, and an extremely bright light emanates from the tip of his sword that aimed to stab through Alphard's center. Multiple affinities mixed, the destructive power develops into a rainbow-colored blow that could swallow up everything. Ricardo stepped on ahead with momentum that crushed the cobblestone, just behind the dazzling light. As if in an attempt to have Ricardo push Alphard aside, right into the extremely vibrant light. Against the heavy slashes and the rainbow-colored extremely vibrant light, Alphard uncovers his fangs. Roy, truly, Ni Summer is as magnificent as imagined. We will be enchanted, Jisoo. Beneath the moon, flashes of silver sliced through wind, as sparks spilled forth from a symphony of swordplay. The first musician was was a sword demon who swung a pair of blades with crisp notes. His partner welcomed him, a swordswoman whose movements flowed reminiscent the path of a gentle stream. Flashes of metal danced through the air, the clash of steel should have sounded cruel, and yet, somehow, this symphony was wistfully melancholic. The ringing of sharp, precise collisions resembled the gentle caresses of a pair of lovers. The reason for this was simple, these two swordsmen complemented each other on a level beyond perfection. Wilhelm, ha! The sword demon steeled his breath, as he let loose a flurry of elliptical blows. Those precise arcs were practically a form of art, their clean movements the ideal standard for all aspiring swordsmen. His sheer skill was so overwhelming that anyone who was worthy of calling themselves a knight would have been so captivated that their battle would be guaranteed a loss, and yet he merely, almost casually, unleashed flurry after flurry. Theresia. One single, light blow would have been more than fatal, in this reign of unending death. However, meeting this peerless hurricane was a longsword whose owner was truly extraordinary. Moreover, that longsword had an odd quality. The length of the blade, as tall as its owner, was too unwieldy to make a proper weapon, and yet, the slender slender swordswoman swung the huge blade with ease, as if it were weightless. Although the longsword's owner was draped from head to toe in a black cloak, impeding on her vision, the tip of her sword flowed as if dancing through water. Whether it be in terms of speed or polish, the twin blades greatly outstripped the longsword. Even so, each and every one of the sword demon's piercing attacks were, without fail, absorbed and deflected. Between the sparks and sharp clangs, with an almost pitying hiss toward the sword demon, the swordswoman leapt backward. A beat too slow to react to the unexpected move, just as he was about to push forward, the gleam of a blade pierced his forehead. Wilhelm, H.K. Flashing before him, was a blow that he couldn't allow to make contact. This was a specialized killing blow that flashed faster than the blink of an eye, which disguised the approaching blade. If not for his extensive experience in dueling her, he would have been unable to see through the imminent death he'd nearly been dealt, and Glum would have passed through the brain and killed him. The skin between his brows burned at the close call. In an instant, the sword demon cast off his misgivings, and began to pursue a woman who'd frozen in her stinging pose. Wilhelm, who, Ku. Theresia. Before he'd even gathered himself enough to act, the woman had driven her toes into his flesh. Her slender feet pierced between his well-exercised abdominal muscles and jolted his organs, the weight of her kick bent his body double, as a silver flash drew an arc, which hung over his head. The glittering sword flew straight as true, as if meaning to cut down the moon. Having reached the peak of its flight, the sword began to glide back to earth, and slicing straight through the atmosphere, meaning to bisect the sword demon. The power behind that attack was incomparable to any previous ones, both the deadliness of the blade itself and its owner's skill were more than capable of slicing through any human body. Approaching in the briefest of flashes, was this certain death. Wilhelm, stop looking down on me. Still bent double, he immediately swung both his arms upward, staggering as they met the crushing force overhead. The sword demon's own blades overlapped as they caught the weapon bearing down on him, as his jaws clenched from its sheer power. Unable to fend it off entirely, his arms began to fall, shallowly, the blade pierced his forehead. Blood spurted forth, splattering his field of vision red. However, he hadn't fallen to knees, not had his own swords been broken. Wilhelm, 
Kuu. The arms holding the sword back strained upward, pushing the fallen sword back again. Sweeping the heavy blade aside, the residual aftershocks shook the form of the swordswoman before him, taking advantage of the moment, he kicked forward. The force that should have slammed back into the ground was instead redirected into the woman's airborne form. The combination of the force from the falling blade and the kick slammed the woman's body into the distance. The aging sword demon lunged into the slender body that had nowhere left to flee. An opening. Against the swordswoman who had flown into the air, with no escape route, the sword demon lowered his shoulder and unleashed an attack. Catching up to her fleeing form, the attack came simultaneously from top and bottom. As one, the two blades drew an arc, tearing toward her slender form with the bite of a wild beast. In midair, with her back turned toward him, she could make no counterattack. Even so, that clarity of that attack found itself shaken. Theresia. The hood that had covered the swordswoman's head, unable to withstand the tug of gravity as she flipped her body, swished back, revealing what had once been hidden. Cascading down was long hair the color of a beautiful, raging flame. Theresia. At the time of its entry into her field of vision, the swordsman's attack carried a flaw which existed for briefer than a single instant. A incredibly subtle, slight deviation from perfection, was this mistake. Even so, no one else would be able to parry this attack. However, considering the sword demon's current opponent, this mistake was fatal. To an existence which had once won the favor of the god of swords, the turbid blade could not reach at all. Theresia. At the scene in front of him, the sword demon's throat was frozen by a shudder. That certain blow had been interrupted midway. It hadn't been anything special. The woman merely drew her sword in midair, and wedged it between the swords that came from above and below. As easy as sliding a brace between a pair of fangs. The blade and the pommel of her longsword completely caught the advance of the two swords right in their tracks. What had the sword demon shudder was that bite of steel on steel rang out only once. Catching the two blades with only one crisp sound, meant that she had calculated the timing of both of them colliding with her own weapon down to the millisecond. What was truly horrifying was the necessary clarity of vision, skill, and sheer nerve to even attempt such an act. Wilhelm, coup. The stunt, so far beyond what common sense dictated was possible, drew a sigh from the sword demon's throat. At that moment, the leg of the woman who was still caught between the swords flew in a wide arc, kicking away the sword demon's hands, which still rested where his attack had stalled. The impact jolted his weapons from the hands which wielded them, and, in that moment, he found himself completely defenseless. Then, with a flash of steel, the longsword made a cross. The combination of the speed at which the blade approached, and the range that couldn't have been shorter. Even with a little time and distance, the empty-handed swordsman had no way to block. The longsword pierced his thin skin and continued drive into his organs and sever his spine, driving through his left side in one single motion and splitting his body into halves, coughing up blood and internal organs, the body already shackled by old age breaking with blow. That was the unavoidable fate that awaited him. That was the end that could not be evaded, and the conclusion of the matter. After the end of his life, having lost everything, he couldn't even cling to a chance at redemption. That kind of conclusion was simply impossible to accept. Wilhelm, ra a a a a a a a He rebelled against the bloody end that flashed through his mind. The throat of the sword ghost burned with the final scene of the illusion, the vitality of his twilight years erupting forth. Breaking the limit's concentration so that even passage of time stalled, only he and his opponent existed in that moment, the sounds and colors of the world fading from focus. The impending blade traced an unexpected orbit to stab into his body. Slowly feeling the touch of the blade piercing through his fragile skin, as well the heat and pain of bleeding, whilst feeling as if the natural force of gravity had increased tenfold, he planted all his the power into his two feet. Digging his heels in hard enough to shut a stone, he redirected the force of swinging his arms to the right into a reactive motion, reversing his body with the shortest distance and best angle, turning to the side as if approaching the blade that brushed his body, a form of evasion which allowed him to roll along the blade that slid across his side. 
Theresia. Having been thwarted in her attack, the swordswoman's follow-up attack was delayed by but a brief moment. In that time, the sword demon retreated several paces, plucking his twin swords from midair. With a sigh, he placed the palm of his hand onto his side, checking the depth of the wound. This was certainly no minor scratch. He turned while a blade had been invading his body, after all. Spinning while being pierced, he'd naturally draw a wound on his own body. Fortunately, by a hair's breadth, he'd kept the blade from plunging into his organs, but the amount of blood dripping from the wound mere centimeters away from his innards was by no means a small amount. To ordinary people, this was a serious injury. Although that was natural. Wilhelm, from the very start, I didn't feel that I could persist in this battle for long. He'd already been running on a time limit, it had only grown shorter. The sword demon, Wilhelm rolled off his shirt and violently staunched the bleeding from his waist, exposing his healthy flesh during this emergency treatment, he was not pursued. The woman opposing him merely watched quietly, her gaze devoid of emotion. At his own anticipation of any swaying or subtle changes in those eyes, Wilhelm gave a bitter smile. Pressing on his open the wound, he awoke himself with the pain. Wilhelm, such weakness is useless. Stop dreaming, this sacred reunion, you will one day be able to indulge in as much as you want, in the heavens. Theresia. Wilhelm, I don't think I'm hallucinating. Nor do I expect miracles. My wife was a woman who was reluctant to follow the way of the sword, but pushing the responsibility of wielding the sword onto others, was something she never once did. An emotionless corpse, a revived construct. Crimson hair silky and flowing, smooth skin snowy and transparent, eyes bijou of precious gems, closing his own, he recalled that cute face that he would never tire of. All this was before him, and all this shouldn't have been before him. Wilhelm, Theresia, how lovely you are. Therefore, you can't remain here. Wilhelm tightened his grip on his swords, taking up fighting a stance again. At this moment, standing here, was not the husband of Theresia van Astria. The one who prayed to stand here was not Wilhelm van Astria. Who stood here at this moment was sword demon Wilhelm. Facing his dead wife, Wilhelm steeled his spirit, his gaze becoming clear and clean. Even if his blood were boiling, he wouldn't allow his anger at the sinister presence to come to a breaking point. But, right now, at this moment, at this time, anything else was superfluous. His old friend, his comrade in arms, his wife, had said to Wilhelm. Don't allow heat to besmirch the blade, don't allow your blood boil, you must learn to love the coldness of steel. How about now? Was it growing hot? Wilhelm, no it's frigid. Like the blade of a knife. Under the moon, the sword demon pierced his opponent with a gaze of steel. The talent swordswoman who was his opponent, also waved the tip of the her long sword again, without any flaws. In an instant, their swords once again flashed again toward each other. The sounds of steel intertwined with each other was a wail, a plea, a courtship. The expectation of an end, and the hope that it would never come to an end as if exchanging endless dialogue without a single word. The sound of swordplay played ceaselessly, echoing. Garfield, ah, damn it. No response to you all, what a joke. Kicking off the ground, kicking off a wall, kicked off a roof, and soaring up. Flying diagonally in the air, his short blonde hair fluttering as it bathed in the wind fluttering, exposing his teeth, a picture of desperation. Time and time again, gnashing his fangs, fighting the burning sensation in his body and chest. Garfield, bastard. What's up, hello? His clothes fluttering, he broke into a run the instant he touched the ground again. This was a feat that only those of exceptional strength and endurance, far beyond a human level, could achieve. However, the one who flew over the city with only his own body expressed no pride in his abilities. Instead, he kept roaring into an unresponsive hand mirror. The one sprinting was Garfield, who was howling into the magic device in his hand, the conversation mirror. The conversation mirror, which should have been able to link him to others who possessed one, remained silent. No one picked up Garfield's call, 
even though, clearly, there were two groups of people capable of responding. Garfield, City Hall guys, or, Roth, fighting guys. Th Heller yeah not reply in four. The conversation mirrors were supposed to have been assigned so that everyone could stay in contact during their respective battles. In fact, they'd been working perfectly fine just after he'd left the city hall. But now, when contact was necessary, the function of the dialogue mirror had fallen silent. This needed to be be communicated immediately. Garfield, gotta tell him that they've to evacuate the city hall now, damn it. As he said so, he leapt upward, skipping the street in front of him as he took a shortcut. Although his rough landing shattered the roof he landed on, Garfield had no attention to spare. Compared to damage to the city, ensuring the safety of his companions was far more important. The goal of his rapid travel was the city hall. Garfield was rushing back to the place he'd left only dozens of minutes ago. Leaving behind Wilhelm, his comrade in arms, he desperately called to the conversation mirror. There was no other reason. Danger was quickly approaching the city hall that was serving as their base. Wilhelm and Garfield had arrived at the control tower occupied by the Lust, at about the same time that Reinhardt began to engage with Greed. Having witnessed the distant aurora, the two entered the control tower. None of the witch cultists nor the troublesome people who they'd expected had appeared to intercept their path. As expected, the witch cult minions in the city seemed to only consist of insignificant opponents. Everything had been smooth sailing until then and hadn't been any other rooms worth checking out aside from the Watergate control room. So, the pair naturally headed to the top floor to prepare for a decisive battle with, Lust. In the imagination, the proportion of the power of the, Lust, camp is the most dangerous. In addition to, Lust, there were two outstanding fighters, which meant that the two would have to face three enemies, naturally, they were both engulfed in tension. Wilhelm, if possible, I'd appreciate the swordswoman being left to me. Garfield, T.H. Kappen also told me so. Seems like there's something between ya. But, my amazing self also has a bone tea pick with that woman. Can't let ya have er so easily. Wilhelm, that is my wife. Those bastards made a mockery of my wife's death, trampled upon her soul, and forced her to point a sword that which she'd sworn to protect. Garfield. Wilhelm. No matter what, this is impermissible. On the way, Wilhelm had revealed his reason for wanting to fight. That was a reason that Garfield, who should have had no basis to give up, couldn't help but keep his mouth shut against. And his inability to form reply in that moment, may have been just what decided the most fitting opponent of the swordswoman. Garfield. Although he'd said nothing, Garfield conceded the opponent to Wilhelm. Wilhelm also indicated his understanding of this, silently bowing his head to express his gratitude. So, when he stepped into the control tower, Garfield felt his the cold sensation of his hair sticking straight up. If Wilhelm is going to fight the female swordsman, then he'd have to deal with the remaining two by himself. The swordswoman went without mention, and the giant accompanying her was no less powerful than she was. Although, lust, was seeming lacking in terms of combat effectiveness, Subaru had repeatedly emphasized that what was fearsome about the witch cult was its direct combat ability, silent tension and pervasive fighting spirit. As his sense of smell caught an increasingly strong scent of blood, Garfield equipped the silver shields which had been strapped legs, and rushed into the room. There, he saw it. Why the hell would I just be obediently waiting here? Fool! Words scrawled in blood, occupying an entire wall of the room. When he realized what they meant, Garfield's head seethed. Fleeing from a battle as if it were a matter of course, a type of personality which could straightforwardly say that there was no obligation to wait. Wilhelm, neglectful. Those bastards are exactly the type to pull this kind of trick. Wilhelm lowered his voice, and retrieved the conversation mirror from his sleeves. The reason for trying to get in touch with the city hall so immediately was because Wilhelm had thought of the notion first. Wilhelm, if our forces are sent out in raids, then our base's combat power will naturally diminish. These guys won't have any shame in exploiting this gap. Before the pale-faced Garfield, 
Wilhelm grimaced at the unresponsive mirror. At the same time, along the roof of the control tower, emerged a deep, oppressive hostility. A feeling that his back was being stroked by a blade, was what tipped Garfield off about the existence of the enemy. Wilhelm had also felt the hostile presence. Wilhelm, Garfield Summer, I'll entrust the city hall to you. Garfield, if it comes down to it, my amazing self can get there faster. They exchanged ideas in a flash. The enemy was as a razor-sharp, clandestine blade. Exposing their backs as they tried to flee would only result in the both of them being cut down from behind. Between them, one of them needed to stay. Then, one of them needed to return to the city hall. Wilhelm, please, continue to try to establish contact. My master, I entrust her to you. Garfield, goes without saying. Zay, Libre's voice rouses the blood of soldiers. Garfield caught the throne conversation mirror and sped out of the control tower. Like so, he flew across the city, crossed the waterway, and continued into the mirror that offered no response. Wilhelm's battle was also probably starting. Garfield, damn it. All that, for nothing. If, Lust, launched a surprise attack on the city hall, there would be very little forces capable of greeting her. Anastasia and Ferris had no combat power, and Crush had collapsed from her injuries. Although several members of the, Iron Fang, stood on guard, their combat power wasn't enough to compare with Mimi. The instant that he thought of Mimi, Garfield's chest grew sore. The girl who, even now, hovered in the abyss of death, who he'd rescued, saved, protected. Keep her alive, saving her, clearly should have been his duty. That duty had been conceded to another due to sentiment, and his chance at vengeance grew further by the second. However, even the work that was taken as an alternative could not be completed satisfactorily. What was he doing? Looking as he did, what was he doing? To Mimi, Subaru, his sister, Ram, or anyone, he couldn't lift his head to face them. Garfield, my amazing self, once again. Can't do anything? The unresponsive conversation mirror reflected such an unpromising face. In the moment that he cursed himself. Garfield, dash? As he smashed the roof whilst leaping, he was a beat too slow in reacting to the shadow flying in from the side. That form, far more massive than his own, met him with a horizontal impact. The reason why he couldn't even issue a cry of pain was because his throat was hooked under an elbow. Blood and oxygen unable to circulate through his brain, maintaining his consciousness grew steadily more difficult. Pulling him back into gradual consciousness was the force of the impact over his whole body. The body that had greeted his obliquely from the air and slammed into a nearby building. Breaking the wall with his entire body, Garfield tossed up a cloud of dust. The dull pain and broken bones drew a groan from Garfield, as he felt himself being liberated from the restraint. Using his body's elasticity, Garfield slammed the ground as hard as he could, pulling himself upright again. He found himself in a structure with no lighting. The smog that filled the room had become a white smoke under the moonlight, and, before his own blood-coughing figure, he could detect another presence. That was undoubtedly the culprit who'd sniped him and landed them in here. Garfield, ya bastard, why really know how t? The instant when he'd taken a battle stance, a fist slammed into his stomach. Garfield's entire abdominal area took the force of his opponent's huge fists, and his body flew upward. Then, he was smashed by the fist that had been swung from above, and the already decrepit floor broke beneath him and he fell another level. Garfield, coo, what? Goo? The sole of a foot slammed into his downward falling body. The damage caused by both the momentum and the mass caused him to spit blood, and his body, stomped on once again, crashed fiercely and directly through to the entrance to the building, where it was smashed into the street. From this striking impact, Garfield continued to cough and he climbed to his feet. At the same time, he applied simple healing magic himself, knitting broken bones as he raised his head. The one who'd chased Garfield from the top of the building to here was a hulking figure who he needed to crane his head to see. Although covered head to toe in black robes, even that could not disguise the thickness of his arms and legs. 
Rather than saying he was muscular, it would be no exaggeration to say that he wore an armor of muscle. To Garfield, this would be the third time facing that enemy. That name was already known as well. Garfield, Kurganov, Eight Arms. He was one of the Volachia Empire's sword-swinging heroes. Although he was said to have died in battle during the Imperial City Defense battle decades ago, for him to be here right now, could he have suffered the same humiliation in death that Wilhelm's wife had? Kurgan. When Garfield spoke that name, the giant, Kurgan, extended his arms. At that moment, the clasp of his robes gave way, revealing his figure, that is to say, the hero Kurgan revealed his expertise in close-range battle. As expected, his strong body was covered by a thick armor of muscle. A powerful physique which could rival the giants, and face on a neck which could be described as demonic, filled with the domineering expression of a war god. And what made this war god a war god, were the eight arms which enabled those strange fighting techniques. In addition to the two arms that usually grew from the shoulders, two more arms sprouted from the same place. Move down his body revealed two more arms using his shoulders as the starting point, and the rest stretched their palms forward from behind. That was in accordance with Kurgan's name, Eight Arms. Someone capable of sapping his enemies will to fight with just his natural body. Kurgan. Facing Garfield, who'd swallowed a deep breath, Kurgan kept his silence as he drew his weapon. Strapped to his thick legs, coincidentally mounted in the same style as Garfield's shield, were a pair of thick, long, distorted blades, the, ghost cleavers, that this war god swung. This war god drew two other ghost cleavers from his back, for a total of four. Although the remaining four arms are still unarmed, Garfield would nonetheless be completely overwhelmed. He had no leisure to underestimate the enemy in the slightest. Garfield. His body trembled. In front of this real hero, Garfield's body trembled from his core. Garfield stared at the hero, the legendary figure, the great man who'd made a mark in history. To not know the name of the Kurgan of, Eight Arms, was impossible for him. Garfield indeed took great interest in his myriad legends coming from every which way. And today, he stood in front of his very own eyes, as an enemy. This was a nightmare. A ongoing nightmare that had begun yesterday. What else could it be, malicious as it was? Garfield, ha, ah, ha. Garfield's breath quickened as he reached toward his legs. Mounted there in the same way as Kurgan's ghost cleavers were silver shields. Unaware of how many times his fingers slipped, finally, the straps came undone. Placing his shields on his arms as if to cover his fists, he knocked them together for confirmation, creating a sharp note which echoed in the night sky. His equipment is ready, and his injuries had healed enough to not be debilitating. However, his mind was still, at the moment, frazzled. Garfield, there's no time to say stupid shit. Clenching his fangs, Garfield hit himself in the face. Shaking his head from the dizzying pain and shock, he turned his gaze forward again. Assuming his stance again, he bared his fangs at the war god before him. Garfield, if your Jew standing there, th hells my amazing self for. Whether's th Capon, Or the other guys too. They're all fighting. Obviously, all you're good for's fighting, so th fucker you're Stalin for? Kurgan. Against the screaming Garfield, Kurgan remained impassive. The silent war god that Garfield was facing would only watch him quietly. With a pout, he broke the line of the street, then rushed forward with a single step. Through the soles of his shoes, he absorbed the power of the earth, allowing his, divine protection of earth spirits, to redirect all that energy into a blow. His fist was truly infused with the power to shatter a stone building. His silver shield reinforced the fist's blow, one strong enough to break even a hero. His arm flew straight and true into Kurgan's waist. Garfield, how's this? Kurgan. Using the full force of his body, Garfield's attack was blocked by Kurgan's demon cleaver. The demon cleaver, Blocking the direct attack to Kurgan's abdomen, withstood the power of Garfield's blow. He did not evade, nor did he flinch. With only a hard block, a full-bodied attack was dispelled. The hero of, 
eight arms, had used only a single arm. Garfield, coup. Garfield's stiff expression ushered in a punch from the shoulder. The body that turned backwards was caught by the arm that protruded from a side, and, unable to escape, he could only take a wild beating. His cheekbones were broken in an instant, and his fundus was crushed. The field of view of his right eye was stained bright red. A razor fang shattered and blew away. His body still caught, he was thrown to the ground, kicked down the street by a powerful leg, and rolled, 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 rolled into the nearby waterway. Garfield, A. A. Everything went in a flash, and he stared at the moon that floated so high above him. That moon seemed to laugh at him. Afterward, Garfield's body sank into the waterway. The surface of the water was slowly dyed crimson. Arc 5, Chapter 52, The Stars and the Sin Archbishops That shower of fresh blood, each drop and every drop, like a malevolent hand grasping gallant destruction, trampled over the city. Wherever the droplets touched, more so than striking a sheet of paper with the edge of a blade, it unresistingly lost its cohesion. The destructive propagation demolished buildings, and the aftermath, in turn, spread further collapse around it. Subaru, ah ah ah. Amelia, TSK. Fully aware that he was being unreasonable, yet ringing out breath from his lungs, Subaru continued powering through his sprint. Jogging alongside him was Amelia, her gleaming silver hair fluttering through the air and her mouth tightly shut, similarly mid-stride. However, the scenic water city's specialty canals stretched out from them in all directions. Simply put, finding a straight path to properly escape on was proving difficult. In front of the dashing pair spread waterways, while destruction from the rear threatened to swallow them both. Subaru, watch out. Amelia, we're sailing close to the wind, but, Subaru, grab on. As their escape route cutting off caused Subaru to raise his voice, Amelia instantly conceived of a different notion. He grabbed onto her outstretched arm without hesitation, and in that same moment, a chill came over the surrounding air. It was the effect of both magic born of the spirit's borrowed strength and the power of Amelia herself, acting together. Amelia, please, everyone. Once Amelia commanded them so, from each luminous point blue light surged downwards. In the next instant, the ground beneath was instantly soaked with white, and in the blink of an eye a whole world of frost had spread. Subaru, or? Amelia Tan is amazing. So clever. Amelia, control is difficult, so don't let go of my hand. Subaru looked up, his right hand still linked with Amelia's own. Tightly grasped in the half-elf's raised left fist, was an icicle directed ahead, which had shot forward moments before. Freezing the ground and thrusting from it an icicle, her borrowing of the propulsive force from her magic had thus hastened their escape. Even more surprising was the course of ice formed by the spirits in the air. On the edge of the waterway in front of them, something like a ski jump had been formed, and the Subaru and Emilia pair, gliding with their built-up momentum, had sailed over the channel. Subaru, E.R. On the other side of the waterway, another course of ice had been created. While she was touching down and skating over it, Subaru honestly praised Emilia's skill. Subaru, nice, Emilia Tan. I fell for you all over again. Emilia, but, I can't think of a way to stop. What should we do? Subaru, E. Emilia had already released the icicle, but the leftover momentum was still plenty to cause unavoidably high damage once they hit an obstacle. Using only her ice magic, conveniently making something like a cushion for two to absorb the heavy impact wasn't a possibility. In the meantime, the pair was drawing closer and closer to a wall. Moments before impact, feeling Emilia's hand tightly squeezing his, Subaru made a snap judgment. Subaru, Emilia Tan. Install curve. Emilia, coup, curve eh? Subaru, a gently bending kind of wall. In a circle. Hearing Subaru's desperate call, Emilia with her magic meekly obeyed. Right in front of their sliding forms, a gentle curve formed, and following along it while turning widely, those two avoided impact. Subaru, just like that, don't let the curves cut off. 
twirl, twirl. Amelia, T, twirl, twirl. Just so, turning widely like that, as to not cut off at a wall, more curves of ice formed. Viewed from above, an ice wall shaped like mosquito repellent coil was created, and the two bodies reaching the midpoint just barely lost enough speed to safely come to a stop. Subaru, who, after wasting a bunch of Emilia Tan's magic, we did it somehow. Emilia, more importantly, the attack from earlier. As the stopped Subaru let out a sigh, Emilia whacked her ice formation with her hand and shattered it. Watching the crushed ice returning to minor particles, and turning to see the traces of the destruction they fled from, a shiver ran up Subaru's spine. Centered around the tower on which Regulus' attack had originated, the scenery of the city had changed. Especially near the center, where the impacts of blood had been strongly felt, the destruction was severe. Further outwards in the perimeter of destruction, deviations in its traces formed. But even then, few buildings still held their original shape. In other words, it was an attack with an abnormally high area of effect. At Subaru's location, the attack had crossed the waterway and reached over. That it had barely failed to reach Subaru was the result of chance and a desperate escape, not Subaru, Reinhardt. On the building Regulus had stood up to this moment, there was now no one. Instead, in its vicinity thick smoke was rising, and the sound of tremendous destruction was echoing. Regulus sent the water dragon to its death by tearing it apart, smirking while it sprayed blood. In that moment, he could already see two small figures desperately trying to escape down an alley. How puny, how very petty, how truly trivial. Laughing mockingly as his scattered blood trampled on the city, he eagerly awaited the moment that destruction would catch up to the fleeing duo, a prostitute and a rapist. For them, death in a hail of blood was fitting. Regulus, scatter. Scatter away. You heinous fiends who trampled on my heart. Reinhardt, my apologies, but I can't let you do that. Immediately after declaring his rage and victory with those words, he was startled by a voice speaking close to his ear. As he turned around, a head of red hair with the appearance of flames fanned by the wind came into view. Regulus, how foolish you look. Getting in the way of someone's love with such zeal. Reinhardt, if your method was proper and respectful of rights, if once rejected you could promise to pull away cleanly, then I would not even hesitate to cheer for you. At Regulus' infuriated voice, Reinhardt responded with a laugh and a tease. While that ever so composed posture was indeed hateful, what now took hold of Regulus' feelings was an inexplicable suspicion. Then, leaping in a single burst, came Reinhardt's leg. Certainly, that right leg, on its shin it had suffered a serious injury, though not entirely torn off, to say it was held to the ankle with a mere strip of leather was no exaggeration. Far from battle-worthy, it was in no state to bear walking on. That it had left that state meant. Regulus, that is so dumb, it's not just swordsmanship, is healing magic your specialty, too? With all those talents of yours that better than others, just how much did you trample over their hearts on the way here? Shattering the hearts of others without even trying filthy does that feel good, huh? Regulus, among your misconceptions in one respect, I will definitely correct you. Reinhardt twisted, the wind shrieking as it shrouded his body. His released spinning kick blew through the air, landing directly on the water dragon's body wielded by Regulus. That corpse which had already become a simple mass of meat now shattered. Regulus, wah. Reinhardt, I cannot use any kind of magic, let alone healing magic. It was simply the spirits in the air that came to my aid, hastily healing the wounds on my foot. As the force from his leg demolished the body, with a twist of his ankle he rescued it from Regulus' grasp. Through that very skillful footwork, the water dragon's remains was not excessively ill-treated, and was then gently tossed onto the roof of a partially wrecked building. Then. Reinhardt, perfect. Next on the checklist, Tactic J will commence. Regulus, choir. At the same moment he begrudged Reinhardt's hypocritical act, his sword's pommel knocked him upside the head. Smacked away, Regulus' body rolled down the slope of the roof. 
Askew over the ground and headed straight downwards, in his ear again was. Reinhardt, I'll put it to the test. Regulus, dash. Leaping at the same angle with a bullet speed, Reinhardt drew close, grasping Regulus' leg as he inverted mid-fall, and with a shake his form was swallowed up by Reinhardt's actions. Now Reinhardt, while carrying Regulus, leapt in the direction of the fleeing Subaru with an awesome storm, accelerating quickly enough to tear off the leg of any ordinary person. Regulus, just what the... Reinhardt, nothing particularly special. Claiming so, Reinhardt lifted up Regulus' body as he stopped. With the attitude of a child grasping a doll's leg and playing roughly, while Regulus' temper at that treatment was exploding, he came to understand the finer details of Reinhardt's plan. Wielding Regulus's body, Reinhardt flung him into the falling droplets of blood. Even demolishing buildings formed from stone, that shower of blood imbued with force by Regulus. If it had such power, then that attack made by Regulus' ability may even be effective against whatever protection he had on his own body. If that had been the idea, it proved a foolish one. Regulus, if it's my own strike then it must work on me. I don't know just how naturally gifted you were born but don't viciously look down on others so much I say. There's no way I myself would be done in with some stupid method like that. Reinhardt, this too was ineffective. Those droplets of blood, touching Regulus' body, became simple droplets on the spot and splashed off of his form. Obviously, the priority was different. At that same moment, Reinhardt suddenly released his grip on Regulus' leg. He was an intelligent fellow. If he had let the droplets reach him as such, his palm would have turned into a mess which couldn't possibly grasp a sword again. The force of the swing disappeared. Landing there onto the street, Regulus once again faced Reinhardt. He narrowed his eyes in warning. Reinhardt, somehow, it no longer seems possible to touch him again. Regulus, it seems you have a keen nose, do you want to get hurt again like you did a while ago? Reinhardt, from now on, I will be wary of your breath and vision both. If there are any other precautions to take, I would be glad to hear them. Regulus, get out of my sight, right now. Stepping forth with both hands raised, Regulus ran at Reinhardt. With unbelievable speed, Reinhardt turned in a broad arc to dodge, giving him a wide berth. Using the pommel of the dragon sword, he rained blows down on Regulus from a distance. Regulus, you just love to run, no matter where you go. Reinhardt, being unable to solve the problem with sword strikes, how impotent. Truly, I am ashamed of myself. Regulus, you haven't even drawn that sword of yours yet. Facing Reinhardt as he weaved back and forth, Regulus made a relatively unseen motion of reaching out his hand. However, such a flippant attack could never reach a hero like Reinhardt. Not only that, Reinhardt's bright blue eyes were still wary of the heavily breathing Regulus's petty tricks. Regulus, ah? But then, a spear suddenly flew straight forward. Aiming at Regulus, who faced the straight-backed Reinhardt, an icicle spear through the ground at his feet. However, the ice under his feet, after he'd taken a single step, shattered before the image could even become concrete. Flippantly, Regulus cast his gaze about, settling on the silver-haired maiden who stood at the other end of the canal, hand outstretched. Undoubtedly, the ice magic had been one of her little tricks. Disgusting, was this visceral feeling of tumbling and boiling. Regulus, each and every one of you, what can't you understand already? The fact that we're different. What we have from the moment of our birth is different. You all can't reach or compete with my completed self. Accept that you're lackluster, be satisfied with it, and die. No matter what no matter what, enough of the relentless opposing evildoers. Such an absolute gap could not be reduced. Why, was this so hard to grasp? Reinhardt, tactic A has also failed. What next? Regulus stomped his feet, splitting the alleyway, no space left in his ears to listen to Reinhardt's mumbling. Emilia, no good. As expected, that attack was ineffective. Subaru, it didn't. Which is to say, the possibility of his feet being an Achilles heel is also gone. Emilia, as per her instructions, 
had attacked the soles of Regulus's feet however, they'd rent the ice without any trace of injury. Reinhardt, tactic J failed as well. Apologies, my capabilities are lacking. In an instant, Reinhardt had also used the divine protection of telepathy to send a psychic message, and Subaru no longer found himself thrown off balance by these superhuman idiosyncrasies. Closely examining the injury on his right foot revealed that it had stopped bleeding, but even if it had been entirely shredded, this wouldn't have been the least bit surprising. Besides, the implications of a shredded foot, Subaru had already experienced. Subaru, if his invincibility is a barrier, it may not extend to where his feet come in contact with the ground, so I came up with tactic A, soles of feet. The grounded parts of him had to have disabled the power, or he'd just sink into the ground. Subaru had thought this might be the case, but he turned out to have been wrong. According to Reinhardt's report of Tactic J, self-destruct, the idea that Regulus would have to disable his invincibility to launch his invincible attacks was also off. In that case, Tactic I, ball in pool, was also a no-go. It seemed that reality denied the notion that there would be a weakness in his invincibility. Subaru, is, is there anything else? An invincible enemy's weakness, weakness. Covering his mouth, Subaru furiously ordered his mind to spin. Before encountering and even after having met Regulus, what he'd often been troubled by, was the means of defeating someone with an ultimate shield, and whatever other ways there may be. Flying through Subaru's mind were answers from a variety of subcultures, as though he'd almost figured it out, but there was no clean-cut answer. Subaru, is the way I'm thinking about this off? Is the direction wrong? What was needed, was perhaps not a way to break through the invincibility. Rather, something more fundamental Regulus's authority, what was its nature? Amila, Subaru, what else is there? I, what should I do? Emilia questioned Subaru, who'd fallen deep into thought, before them, across a large canal, the fierce battle between Reinhardt and Regulus continued, but she was unable to offer any help, which left her feeling discomforted. Whether Emilia or Reinhardt, both trusted in Subaru, both had expectations of Subaru. And not just the two of them. The allies stationed elsewhere, and the citizens of Pristella he'd called with his broadcast, all shared those sentiments. Dash. Thinking, 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 thinking. Although those memories were distasteful, Subaru began to think back to everything since his first encounter with Regulus, up until this instant, his actions and words, the attacks and schemes he'd tried to pull. There should have been something. There should have been some reason. Not just Regulus was fine. Including the other Sin Archbishops, there should have been something. They were all scum. That much was already clear. It wasn't that. Subaru, the names of, the stars. Emilia, Subaru? Suddenly, Subaru realized it. Before, he'd thought of the same thing, and now he cast aside the joke to think of it seriously. Now that things had reached this point, he began to consider an abandoned idea anew. Regulus, Capella, Alphard, Sirius, Petelgeurs. These star-related names gathered in one place, could he really treat them so casually as a coincidence? In retrospect, the Water Plumage Pavilion, the customs of Kararagai, Hoshin of the Wastes. In this world, so many places had been touched by the influence of Subaru's original world, that he couldn't simply treat it as a joke. Why had he only realized just now, that the witch cult did not originate from here? Petelgeurs, was Betelgeuse. The hand of Orion, unseen hand. Regulus was Leo, little king. Thus, he had a title. This, little king, was truly a title commensurate with him. Subaru, Emilia. I have something to ask you. Subaru spoke quietly, and Emilia opened her eyes to nod. Subaru could feel the attention radiating from her snow-white face, and closed one eye. Subaru, that man grabbed you about by the neck once, right? It's about that time. Emilia, um. Subaru, Regulus's hand, was it warm? Or was it cold? Emilia, dash. At Subaru's inquiry, Emilia widened her eyes. 
and so, she touched a hand to her slender neck, with a tap, and replied. Amelia, no. Thinking back on it, I couldn't feel anything. Neither heat nor cold, there was no temperature. Hearing Amelia's response, Subaru held his breath. From when he'd been cast into the canal, his undisturbed breathing and unsoaked body. The ineffectiveness of attacking the soles of his feet, the ineffectiveness of the cancellation of his own attacks. Impeccable in both offense and defense. If this was no simple, mere, invincibility. Subaru, Reinhardt. He called across the canal, the name of the hero doing battle against the evil. In relentless battle, Reinhardt determinedly looked towards Subaru. In order for him to hear, Subaru raised his voice high. Subaru, that man, check if his heart is beating. Subaru's loud words had Emilia, had Reinhardt widening their eyes. So, Regulus, he. Regulus. Otto also left the city hall for fulfilling the duty imposed on him after he confirmed the simultaneous raids on the four control places had been carried out, and after each of the parties had departed to conduct them. Anastasia, I don't think it's strange to think that he should be stopped. But it is also true that right now, we have to reconfirm where the Book of Wisdom, that the witch cult had requested, is. Pitiful, isn't he, that Otto Kun? was what Anastasia said at Otto's departure. It seemed to be true that Anastasia wanted Otto to remain in the city hall as well. It was the place where Subaru and the other camps had already clashed with a Sin Archbishop. Though the city hall is expected to function as the headquarters, there were not many brains that could scout for information from several different places at the moment. However, leaving the Book of Wisdom in the hands of others was not something that could be done either. You can establish a relationship of cooperation with the opposing Sin Archbishop, but once out of that situation, they will return to being an enemy. When that happens, the effectiveness of the Book of Wisdom being watched over by others was something that should be avoided. Truthfully, it was about the Book of Wisdom being completely away from the situation in which it would be negotiated over but Subaru and Garfield were fine with that. Otto wanted to sigh as he felt his own personality was at fault here. Otto. I wonder, when did I become someone who ran around for others like this? Hitting his grey hair with his hand, Otto worried over the question that had come to his mind several times in the past year. The position he stood in was unexpected, his relationship with people was unexpected, his current emotions were unexpected. What will his family think when they get to know that he is doing all this? Otto, if I am fine and successful, I'll try writing a letter. If Subaru was here, he would definitely point out a death flag, saying something strange, as Otto stepped onto the city's third avenue. The Sin Archbishops should be concentrated in the control towers, and considering that, they should not be in the city. They should not, be. Otto, ha a. Ha tsk. Grabbing his chest tightly, Otto felt his heartbeat quicken. Which cult, Sin Archbishop, which cultists, Otto had bad memories of them. A year ago, Otto recalled his first encounter with Subaru. He couldn't forget how scared he was of the Sin Archbishop back then. The eyes of a madman who wouldn't think twice before taking away one's life. That madman, the figure of fanatics, who would dedicate their blood and flesh by his own will. When he truly hoped for help, only the silence and loneliness had dominated. He had never been as scared at any other time. He had never felt so empty in any other moment. Comparing the fear of then to fighting Garfield, facing the Bowel Hunter, encountering herds of witch beasts, that was nothing. The encounter with the witch cult dropped an immensely dark shadow on Otto's heart. Even though he knew how horrible that thing was, it was not something that could be erased so easily. Emilia, who, due to her similarity with the Witch of Envy, could not escape prejudice due to the witch. Subaru, who was fated to become her knight and fight for her, and aim for the devils of the witch cult. Beatrice, who fought along with Subaru, and spent all the strength she had in that small body. Garfield, who put his everything to his fist in order to protect his family. Ram, with sweetness that cannot be ignored, but on the flip side, with a stinging tongue. Frederica, who lived in negative feelings for her brother, 
and has a sense of responsibility for her position. Petra, who acted with a clear smiling face with everyone while being treated as a child. I love everyone. Though he had not intended to stay in one place too long, unfortunately, it was too comfortable. Even though he knew to stay away from scary things, he was unable to avoid them. In order to save this place, I would like to stand by their side and support them, even in my fear, I want to help them where their hands cannot reach. That's why. Otto, somehow, I must fulfill my role. Saying this, he stepped onto Third Avenue. There stood a small figure in front of him. Beyond the stone bridge on the waterway there was a square, and that was where the shadow was. Besides that shadow, several more figures could be seen. But right now, Otto's eyes were fixed on only one small phantom. Sound disappeared. Everything went terribly quiet, and nothing could be heard. A situation where living beings sucked in their breath and held it, trying desperately to conceal their existence, Otto Suin knew this situation well. Subsequently, the figure in front of his eyes gently clapped its hands and, as it disheveled its long hair, raised its face. But still, his heartbeats were surprisingly calm. Question mark colon welcome, Oni I San. Dash. Lay, welcome to the witch cult Sin Archbishop, representing Gluttony. Lay Batonkato's dinner banquet Sue. Opening his mouth, full of fangs, the Sin Archbishop who shouldn't have been there, laughed gruesomely. The following is a short story that gives context to one of the upcoming scenes. Re Zero, Joshua Duokalius Careful Encyclopedia Second Verse. As a breeze flew through the sky, it took a letter with itself. Question mark colon w wait. Please wait. Shouting, the boy raised his hand into the sky, aiming for the floating letter. However, the letter left him behind and flew away, as if flapping wings, with utter grace. Chasing it down the slope was an elegant-faced youth. His tied purple hair, his clear face, and his bright twinkling yellow eyes, along with glasses on just his left eye, were features characteristic to him. Wearing a well-fitting dress of black, it could be safely said that he came from a noble household. That was also another factor that made his dash down the slope look like there was something wrong. Question mark colon khhk. If only, I had taken a look, at the content. Ah. Ihk. Sitting beside the window in a quiet room, immersed into the world of literature. That was the kind of scenario befitting the youth, but here he was, looking upwards and shouting. People in the surroundings wondered what he was doing, as they witnessed the youth fall flat in the middle of the slope. And, where the letter, which was sought after by the youth, had landed was visible. The letter hung onto a dragon ferry traveling in the waterway, and went along with it. After borrowing the power of wind, this time it borrowed the power of water. Rather, it would be more appropriate to say that it borrowed the power of the water dragon, but that was not the issue here. Question mark colon, hey you there, are you all right? Passing by the fallen down youth, who gave off the impression of being asleep, was a huge man who asked that question. Seeing the lack of response, the passerby looked at his face, sensing that the problem here may be severe. Question mark colon darn it. I cannot just stay fallen at this place. Question mark colon ha? Huh? Forcefully swinging his long legs, the youth sprang and stood up. At his sudden movement, the passerby was visibly surprised, to whom the youth responded to with a kindly excuse me, bowing gracefully. Question mark colon though I have shown you an unpleasant sight, I assure that there is no need to worry. I have been given the responsibility of completing a certain task, and I will surely complete. Question mark colon I is that so? So then, what should be done? By the end of the energetic youth's words, the passerby pointed towards the waterway. Where he pointed to, there was visible a swimmer swimming leisurely, a ferry carrying a letter, and a street. Question mark colon w wait. Please wait. Changing his expression, the youth continued his chase for the letter. Reaching the age of seventeen this year, was Joshua Duocalius, the younger brother of Julius. The Duocalius household has been a noble family, and had a long history with the kingdom of Lagunica. 
Traces of the family's prominence and the outstanding members of the household go back to several generations. Although there are several noble households who do not do so, in the Juicalius household, being born as a male directly meant that you must become a royal knight. Naturally, the child also received the necessary education for that, following the words the correct way of life for achieving elegance that have been passed down the generations since ancient times. However, Joshua's body betrayed the expectations of his parents, who also held the same belief. When he merely held the sword in simple playful imitation when he was a child, just that affected his breath, before even receiving any proper training. His education plans were changed, after he got bedridden due to a fever. As far as he could remember, he could only see most of his days and time being spent sitting on a bed, reading a tome. Turning the pages, he looked outside the window, where he could see the garden of his mansion, and his brother practicing the way to uphold the sword. He was under the same teacher that Joshua was supposed to be under, had received the same education as what Joshua was supposed to receive, and had taken the responsibility upon himself which Joshua was supposed to take. Seeing his figure, young Joshua narrowed his staring yellow eyes. At a great distance from him, in the garden, red spheres hung onto the trees. Joshua, ha, ha. With both his hands on his knees, Joshua panted hoarsely in a desperate attempt to regain his strength, making an expression as if he was on the verge of death. It had been a total of five minutes since he had started his pursuit for the floating letter and his body had already reached its limit. On top of that, instead of flying, the letter was now on a ferry, distancing itself away from Joshua further and further. Joshua, if I, am unable to, get hold of it, again. It'll be, quite a, problem. Joshua shook his head, as he tasted a bit of blood in his saliva accompanying his immense breathlessness. The letter was important. He cannot just lose it, and his apologies will not be accepted either. The content of the letter included instructions that will have a severe impact on the future of someone who may become the ruler of the kingdom, and he knew, that person was also waiting for the letter. He did not believe in something like hope, but in what was spoken in jest was the undeniable strength in the tone. The letter surely held sincere, heartfelt feelings. For a year and a half now, Joshua had been working with his master, Anastasia. Not just her being a royal candidate, but even ties to the Supreme Council that she represented. Being able to help someone like her with housekeeping was an honor for him. However, the stimulus for fascination and joy for Joshua, was stepping into the outside, unfamiliar world. Unlike when reading books, he could feel the true essence of the reality that was this world and had witnessed the scene of a person's life transforming with his own eyes in the Chamber of Commerce. And, in those scenes, the person was somewhat having the exact the same expression always. The heartbreaking belief of the young Joshua, was that this was an expression of sincerity. Henceforth, no matter how discomforting the other party was, they would not tolerate such an attitude. Moreover, using your own mistake to cause harm to the opposing party was simply unspeakable. Joshua, so, if the letter gets away now. Question mark colon mister. Please, take this. Joshua, eh? Joshua tried to lift his eyes and head with his further strength and determination. What was in front of him was the letter he swore to chase to the edge of the world. Eyes widened, hands shivering, Joshua held the letter. He was not dreaming. It really was there. Joshua, R, 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 H. Question mark colon, very well. If this made you happy then my spirits have also been uplifted, that is. Joshua, yes, yes. Thank you very much. If I was to lose it, I would. I would, be unable to face anyone in future. Question mark colon then I am truly glad. It is an honor I could be of help. Hugging the letter to his chest, Joshua bowed his head. A smiling young boy stood in front of Joshua. With soft, pink hair, and two cute large, round eyes. Perhaps around ten years of age. Despite his youth, he was well dressed in robes, and though his nature and disposition was unknown, he gave off a friendly aura. This young boy had recovered the letter. He could be called nothing but impressive. Joshua, by the way, how you did you come to understand that this letter belonged to me? 
Question mark colon I saw Mr. Dashing down the street shouting about the letter with his hand raised to catch it, that is. That is why, I realized that I must not let it go. Joshua, you are right, this letter is indeed important. And I was running behind it, though I was not fast. He had been running slowly due to his heavy breathing, feeling sincere embarrassment when the young boy said that he was dashing. Question mark colon afterwards I hurriedly called out to the master of the ferry. I asked for it politely, and I was able to receive the letter, so I was simply fortunate. Joshua, no, that is simply your modesty. I am truly grateful. The young boy had a modest attitude, and he was quick to point out how what he did was not his feat. Regardless, Joshua wanted to truly show gratitude to him for his help. Joshua, however, I must thank you for this. He had nothing on himself right now, but he was just heading to the inn. However, taking the young boy that far with himself would not be good either. Joshua, if there is something I can help you with, then please ask anything. Question mark colon R, then. On Joshua's suggestion, the boy blushed in embarrassment. And, hesitating for a moment, said. Question mark colon the truth is I, seem to have lost my way. As embarrassing as it is, I am currently a vagrant child, that is. And, explaining his position, provided the perfect opportunity for Joshua to pay back his favor. Walking down the street was the unusual and perfectly matching pair of the young boy named Schult and Joshua. Schult, that's why, I am trying my hardest to serve the one who showed the grace of taking me in. I am working hard, just so that I am not crushed by my debt to them. Joshua, that is really splendid. It's truly splendid, Schult Kun. Schult, why why yes, thank you very much for such words. Schult turned his head downwards and smiled at Joshua's praise. Seeing him, Joshua was sincerely awestruck. He was surely a well-natured young boy. From what he said now, it could be said that he had not been brought up in a favorable environment. However, fatefully encountering someone, he was now striving to accept the happiness and fortune he was blessed with at face value. That was somewhat not like Joshua. Joshua, it seems Schult can highly respects that person. Schult, of course, that is. So much so that respect is an understatement, that is. Ah, but, I truly do respect Al Summer and Ye Summer too. Heinkel San, I am unsure about him. He was usually smiling like a flower, but now he made a difficult face. Shaking his head and doing away with his tired expression, Schult glanced at Joshua. Schult, Mr. Must also be having someone he respects. Is there someone like that? Joshua. Hoo hoo, I awaited that question. Schult, oh. How cool. In front of Schult, who widened his eyes, Joshua raised his face and his pointed his palms forwards. The sun was visible through the gaps between his fingers, making him narrow his eyes and inhale lightly. That was because. Joshua, when you look at the sun, you become unable to see the beautiful wind flowing by. To me, my elder brother was a similarly dazzling existence. Schult, Mr.'s brother, ha. Huh? He really seems to be someone amazing, that is. Joshua, ha, h, you are right. Ni Summer is truly amazing. He is always working hard, as if he can do anything and will try to do anything. His form, his mindset, he is truly the greatest. Schult, greatest. He really does seem like someone amazing. As Joshua clenched his fist, Schult clapped. It was not rare for Joshua to talk about his brother, but it was rare for him to hear about his brother. Joshua's heart experiences an unexpected warmth, as it gets charmed by him. Joshua's brother, Julius Juicalius, was unquestionably a person who deserved to be respected. The will to live was strongly etched onto his soul. He had a habit of underestimating himself, but was able to sincerely and objectively acknowledge his own effort and was fully capable of helping himself. If nobody tells you that you are an amazing person, you will inevitably stop believing in that. Henceforth, for Joshua, who was only cheaply imitating Julius. An incident that happened, that negative incident, and calling back to it, Joshua sealed his lips. 
As soon as he heard those words of praise, Joshua stopped his footsteps. The walking Shelt looked backwards and glanced at his face. And. Shelt, it really seems like Mr. Truly likes that only I san. Shelt, hearing this about him, even I have gotten excited. If there happens to be a chance, I would love to meet Mr.'s brother. Seeing his smile, he sighed. Doing away with the conflicting feelings in his heart, Joshua smiled and blankly nodded. Joshua, yes, you are correct. Ni Summer is perfect, so he will surely treat Shelt Khan well. If there happens to be an opportunity, then please do. Shelt replied with understood energetically. He really wanted to meet his brother. The sight of Shelt, who heard the praise of his brother and his desire to meet him, was heartwarming indeed. Behind his eyes, that observed that soothing sight. Question mark colon him. Though it's between all this work, something calming. An eccentric feeling ran up his spine. They were on a street. With a number of people passing by, with a number of voices sounding by, that voice alone shook up Joshua's eardrums with a complete lack of constraint. Regardless of even that, he could immediately make out the fact that those words were directed at him. Joshua, Shelt Khan, listen to my instructions and dash ahead with all your strength, please. Shelt, mister? Looking back at the street and glancing at the owner of that voice, said Joshua as he patted Shelt's shoulder. Shelt was puzzled, but he had no time to explain the details. No, even he himself did not know any details, including the opponent's identity. However, staring at exactly that place among the crowd-filled street, the petite youthful boy's aim was Joshua, and it could be understood at a single look that the boy was not someone harmless. Joshua, here, please take this. Please convey it to my niece Summer or Shelt Kun's master. Gently handing over the letter he held, Joshua stepped forward. Shelt, who had received that letter, was confused on what he should do. But, before even that, Joshua, run. As per how he was instructed, Shelt turned and started running. The little boy did exactly what Joshua told him to, swimming between the crowd of people. Seeing his back, Joshua then turned his head forward. The one standing on the other side of him was now directly in front of him. Joshua, KHHK. Question mark colon sorry for the surprise, only I san. Even we wanted to play it round a bit more. The time promised to Mama is coming close. At this point, let's just wrap this up. Joshua, I don't even have anything to say regarding that. A sound was heard. Joshua, who had received those words, unfortunately had no way of stopping the youth. Swordsmanship, magical talent, body handling, everything would be ineffective in his body. However, the safety of the letter, and Schultz was. Joshua, truly. Question mark colon well then, deepest apologies, but there's no time. Thank you for the treat. Insanity could be felt within that voice, as a shout echoed through the street. Hearing it, above all. He unclearly thought whether he had managed to do something even minimally substantial for his greatest brother, right before his consciousness left him. Arc 5, Chapter 53, A City of Strife. Subaru, check if his heart is still beating. Intuition was the instinct that had aroused Subaru's awareness. He wasn't absolutely convinced, nor did he have a basis for thinking so. All he could think was that that thought was not without meaning. The Sin Archbishops, the names of the stars, the Karara guy which bore influences from his original world, and those other than Subaru who found themselves summoned here. The world still bore the marks of their claws. If the witch cult were also engraved with this etching, then the names of the stars Subaru had thought of didn't necessarily have only a passing relationship with them. If Regulus Corneas's power could not be treated as straightforward, invincibility, then, he'd need to think outside the box, and thus an idea emerged in his heart. Hoping that there would be no connection, Subaru had already said a sort of prayer asking thus. And, in the next moment, Subaru. A noxious sense of oppression came, casting an illusion that had Subaru feeling as if the sun had been blotted out. The air hung thick with pollution. He'd be hard-pressed to find words with which to express this discomfort, this disgust. 
the disgust of the peeling of a scab, the discomfort of a stench exhaled to the face, the aversion of a sticky tongue over bare skin. The origin of this turbid air, was the evil which had turned his head to look back. The instant that he met its gaze, Subaru's body began to tremble involuntarily. Expressionless and empty, those eyes, like a curse, plunged deep into his soul. As if pierced by a rusted needle, even his lungs and heart were frozen by terror. However, even as Subaru found himself immobile, overcome by such feelings. Reinhardt, don't look anywhere unnecessary. Your opponent should be me. Turning to regard this Subaru, meant turning his back to the sword saint. Raising his hands high, Reinhardt had clasped in his hands what could only be described as broken signposts and scrap metal. Such materials which were only ever destined to be waste, but in Reinhardt's hands, they were no inferior to a treasured blade. A long blade slanted through the air struck the back of Regulus's suit. The bursting shockwave expanded in midair, leaving a sorrowful wail from the assailed atmosphere in its wake, raising vortexes in the large canals where thin sheets of ice floated. This was the aftermath of that sword's strike. Had the force of evil been shattered to pieces, it would have come as no surprise. However, before he could take a single step. Regulus, don't get me wrong, sword saint. I've been entertaining you because my heart is obliging and considerate. But even my gracious self has limits. Reinhardt. Lightly, Regulus patted the place where he'd been struck by the sword, and tilted his head. Reinhardt, alerted by this motion, tossed aside the scraps in his hands and made to leap backward at a wide angle, just as he prepared to jump, his feet froze in place. Reinhardt's superhuman intuition. It informed him of dire, imminent threats to his self, and preemptively detecting incoming attacks. His keen instincts told him that he could not dodge to the rear. He immediately straightened and began to search for alternative routes. Regulus, the air there, has already been touched by me. Due to the sharpening of his senses locking him into place, at that moment, Reinhardt had been left unprepared. His opponent had him trapped in an invisible yet present envelope. Reinhardt's judgment told him to slip by the force of evil's side, but, in order to do so, he'd be forced to make a defensive strike. Reinhardt, ha! The blow that he dealt had enough force to shear through stone. The hilt of the dragon sword pierced into Regulus's chest, but the force of evil grasped it easily. Regulus, futile effort, thanks for your trouble. Just pray that you won't be hurt too badly. Reinhardt, just as Subaru said, your heart doesn't seem to be beating. Regulus, dash. Regulus's relaxed smile hardened, as he glanced down at his chest. The hilt that was buried in it, and the Reinhardt who was straining his sharp senses, he wouldn't have missed any movement of life, no matter how subtle. Having taken that blow, Regulus leapt high in the air, agitated. Directly, as if reproducing the scene from earlier. Reinhardt blocked the kick with the sheath of the dragon sword, his body was sent flying from the impact, however, what unfolded next was different. Subaru, Reinhardt. As declared, the air behind Reinhardt had filled with countless traps of breath set by Regulus. Shot into them in his unguarded state, the results weren't difficult to imagine. His white clothes stained with blood, Reinhardt's entire body was torn. He leapt up, but how much that could mitigate his wounds was uncertain. Buried in rubble again, Reinhardt amplified the collapse of the city, making it impossible to estimate his condition. But what could be determined for certain was Reinhardt's answer. Subaru, not bad, Reinhardt. Emilia, Subaru. Subaru, it's okay. Reinhardt, he should be fine. So worry about him later. Emilia, I understand. I, what do you need me to do? He'd thought that Amelia would be concerned foremost with Reinhardt's safety, and was taken aback by her response. The Amelia looking at Subaru was attentive, and fully understood where she needed to stand on this battlefield. There was both a strong reliance on Reinhardt and perhaps a trust in Subaru. Amelia, Reinhardt too, he went through all that hassle because he trusted you. What should I have realized about Regulus? Tell me. Heavy trust. 
heavy expectations. The reality of that belief was too heavy, enough to stir up his fighting spirit. He'd certainly need to give Reinhardt proper gratitude as well. Later, he'd definitely go and help retrieve his remains. Regulus, the two of you, always rambling on, but acting in simplicity and your desperation, wouldn't that be easier? Your despicable and evil behavior has angered me, so it follows that you should be punished, doesn't it? Yes. Isn't this right? Impoliteness, infidelity, no matter which, are rebellious acts worthy of ten thousand executions. Having kicked Reinhardt away, Regulus sneered at the inconvenience. Across the canal, a spirit of evil began to swell forth, and, in truth, Subaru almost couldn't bear to bring himself to face it. However, running away right now would be meaningless. Natsuki Subaru would be unable to repay Emilia and Reinhardt van Astria. Subaru, a pure heroine, yet unseen of this century, suspecting her of infidelity makes you the slut, idiot. Regulus, ah? Subaru, isn't it uncouth to list all the reasons we should be afraid here? Try in the slightest to redirect that empty mind of yours. Hearing the sudden strength of his speech, Regulus widened his eyes. Subaru knocked his own head, as if boasting. Subaru, just how much of a lovely, smooth life you've had until now, I don't know, nor do I want to know. But have you noticed yet? The you of right now, is in checkmate. Regulus, checked. You're so vague that I can't even laugh. What are you trying to say? No, you're incapable of explaining yourself in comprehensible language, is also a possibility. Well, there's no need to force yourself to say irrelevant things, isn't that right? Subaru, eh, don't say that, after all you have the right to listen, your favorite right, Regulus, my right? Regulus frowned, and Subaru, with a light, ridiculing smile, continued yes, after all. Subaru, losing without even knowing how your regret came about, would certainly leave you with regrets. Regulus, enough of you. Just disappear. This movement shrinking in on himself becoming a fuse, Regulus leapt from the edge of the canal. Lacking sufficient jumping power, his body plunged into the water, however, his movements were unaffected by the flood, and he found himself with no water resistance. Before him, Subaru confirmed patted Emilia's shoulders. Subaru, Emilia, right now. Emilia, all Huma. Receiving Subaru's instruction, Emilia gathered magic to release the icicles. So enormous that they needed to be gazed up at to seen fully, the spears of ice were aimed directly at Regulus, formed an overhanging railing of ice to surround him as he surfaced. Regulus, I'd actually thought you'd try something, but no matter what you do, it's futile, looks like no matter how many times you're taught, you'll never learn. What, are you planning to stick with your mistakes? Without even that degree of wisdom, repeating the same thing over and over. Do you always treat others with such futility while despising them? Don't get carried away, how incomplete. Regulus bared his teeth, cut down the railing of the ice, smashed it, and, with overwhelming force, shattered it. The barrier collapsed with ease, and despite her best efforts, Amelia's magic couldn't sustain the cage of ice. But it was enough. This was fine. Amelia, I can't, I couldn't even buy time properly. Subaru, that's not right, Amelia Tan. Seeing the ineffectiveness of her power, Amelia wore a gloomy face, but Subaru shook his head. A look from a different angle. This had been enough to accomplish Subaru's purpose. Subaru, that man's character is insidious. He can't help but crush what he despises. Even if it's unnecessary to destroy whatever obstacle he's facing, he can't feel that he's won without shattering it completely. Singing ballads to fulfillment, spouting his self-satisfying rhetoric, was Regulus. The pitiable nature of his heart, the scarcity of his tolerance, and the volume of his vanity were plain to see. Subaru, in the first place, there was no need for him to break through the obstacle. But he took that superfluous action. Even a second, even a millisecond, is the result. Emilia, with that one second, can you defeat Regulus? Subaru, as long as I accumulate them, I'll definitely show him the victory. 
I'll pare that monster's skin from his body. For this, Reinhardt had laid the foundation. Testing Regulus's heartbeat, conveying that it had no movement to Subaru. There was no heat, no heartbeat, no breath, and no outside influence from his surroundings. Although this is undoubtedly an invincibility, its essence was not undefeatable. Subaru, Emilia, over here. Subaru took Emilia's wrist and crossed the dented alleyways with her. Emilia kept pace with Subaru, as she turned back to attack Regulus with an icicle. Regulus, seeing the two flee, pursed with rage brewing in his chest. Regulus, even after all that boasting, why the hell are you running? Calling someone stupid, proclaiming that you'll kill them, just how much do you plan on making fun of me? Who the hell do you think you are? You coward. Since his physical abilities were no superior, the speed pursuing Regulus was little different from the speed of the escapees, rather, it could be said that he was slower than Subaru. However, since he was blessed with his unrelenting composition, the ceaselessly pursuing evil would eventually catch up. Emilia, Subaru. Where are you running to? Subaru, our destination is the church. Our target is, Regulus's wives. In between. Hearing Emilia's inquiry, he replied back. Suddenly, halfway through his words, he noticed from behind. Regulus, stop paying attention to extraneous things, you. Subaru, you are? The distance that had existed until now vanished without a trace, turning his head, Regulus had already appeared in front of him. Forcing an approach to only one step away, Regulus waved his hand toward them, and Subaru barely jerked his head out of the way. He felt that his opponent was already on his heels, so he swept up Emilia and approached a nearby wall, stepping on and along it in one motion. Emilia, Wawawa, Subaru's amazing. Subaru, Emilia Tan, hold tight to me. Emilia, stunned by Subaru's acrobatics, hugged his neck and wrapped her feet around his waist. Soft and fragrant, she filled Subaru, with a fresh wave of energy. Kicking hard on the edge of the wall, he flew across it. The results of his practice in parkour were revealed. Just gaining distance like this. Regulus, I've said already, that your commoner's efforts are futile. Saying so, Regulus touched the lower part of the wall Subaru was climbing with his palm. There was the sound of rock grinding, and the stone wall collapsed as if it were tofu. The wall lost its support and fell. Needless to say, the same happened to those climbing on the wall. Subaru, you are. In the process of falling, he yanked out his whip and flicked it without any real direction. The front end hooked onto something, and Subaru forcefully pulled his body upward. With a swing of his foot, he gave a hard kick the moment he touched the wall. Combined with the force of the reaction, the centrifugal force generated by the whip allows his body to be thrown further and further, achieving an amazing climb with Emilia still on his back. At a closer glance, the two of them had arrived at a warehouse that had already lost almost half of its volume. Subaru crashed onto the balcony that protruded from the eaves and looked at his palm. Subaru, wow, I didn't expect to achieve a brute force escape. Emilia, Subaru. In short, we just have to get to the church. The direction is? No longer gazing at his palm split open with faint pain, he followed Emilia's voice to see the surroundings. Fortunately, the height of the balcony, in addition to Regulus's, allowed everything to be easily seen. Far, far in the distance, he could see the church that collapsed from Reinhardt's first attack. Somehow, at some point, it had grown quite distant. Subaru, no. We fled in the opposite direction. What now? Emilia, is that it, there? Subaru, it's right there, what's that matter? Emilia, let's travel like this. Emilia, upon hearing Subaru's response, clapped, and a bridge formed on the balcony. The mysterious blue and white bridge began from the balcony and connected through the alleys of the church, imitating a large road in midair. Subaru, what? Scattering every which way were brilliant shards of ice, as Subaru slid forward on a nice structure created by Emilia. 
Using the slope of the bridge as a launch pad, using the principles of a ski jump, it leapt over the alley, and flew over Regulus toward the church. Subaru, Emilia Tan, you became so witty. Emilia, maybe Subaru led me astray. Subaru, that statement shouldn't be used in response to praise. Although he had a means of long-range attack, Regulus could only touch what was in reach of his arm's length. They kept well away from his figure, delirious with rage. Staring at the approaching church, Subaru's eyes narrowed. Emilia, what should we do, when we meet the women in the church? Subaru, I don't know if they've been threatened, or if they really do admire him. At Emilia's question, Subaru lowered his chin into his palm, interrupting himself. What emerged in his mind were the women, shocked by the Regulus's actions in the church. The fear he'd seen then, if only it were genuine, thus he prayed. But, if it really had been an act. Subaru, forget the mind, it may be that even their hearts were stolen away. Heart in the literal sense, that is. Greeting his face were burst of wind blowing on the head, and the height of the ice structure began to fall, as it approached the church. Behind, was Regulus giving chase. Reinhardt's life hung in uncertainty. The chances of victory were slim, but the dilemma still steadily approached. Was everyone else doing fine? Clearly, he had no room to even ponder such questions, but couldn't help but think of them. To take over the charge of the control tower from, gluttony, this was the battle between Julius, Ricardo, and Alphard. Julius, L. Clausel. With the power of the six colored quasi spirits, a rainbow colored radiance emanated from the tip of the night sword. What rolled out was a preemptive strike aiming straight for its opponent's death. Clausel, was a magical technique of the same type as, Clarista, which had managed to damage even Petelgeuse's body, however, unlike, Clarista, which had the destructive bright light stick to the sword itself, Clausel, was a long-range attack. The impression of the Sin Archbishops was still strong in Julius' mind thanks to Petelgeuse. The feeling which Julius got while fighting the madman, the Sin Archbishop of, Sloth, a huge sinner and someone who had given great suffering to the world for a long time, was completely different from the current situation, that is, the fight with the current enemy is completely different. Julius Duocalius, who had gotten the title of, Greatest Knight, often misunderstands people due to their behavior, but he believes in this so-called theory that all human nature is ultimately good. He believes that all human action is up to interpretation, but there are some things which humanity must think about, like the influence of one party's actions over the others. Then, for Julius, the Sin Archbishop named Petelgeur's Roman A. Conti and his self-conscious dolls, the witch cultists, were all too overwhelming. Someone who can't understand that, who disregards hard work and efforts of others will inevitably become an enemy for him. For Julius, the worst done by the witch cult to him was to harm his knightliness. No hidden tricks, no trump cards saved for the last. From the very beginning, Julius did not hesitate to cut down those devils. An extraordinary technique that simultaneously handled all six colors of magic with the help of six quasi-spirits. Not even the slightest of mismatch of magical power was allowed. This was established only after the bonding of the quasi-spirits, thanks to the efforts and talent of the genius spirit user named Julius. This was not the exact same thing as what Roswell L. Mathers could do, who sat at the pinnacle of magic. This had been created by Julius and was unique to Julius. At the first look, the magic doesn't feel too scary, and the opponent gets scattered away without an opportunity to rethink subsequently. Julius had one belief in his chest, that he must prioritize blowing away the enemy rather than investigating the incompatibility between them. The extremely bright destructive light shatters the stone pavement and preys upon both the arms of a small shadow. Long dark brown hair, dirty rags, dulled shining daggers, get swallowed up by the shine of the rainbow light. Roy, this is surely something Nee Summer didn't expect, he has a weakness of turning away your eyes from what he doesn't want to see, doesn't he? Ricardo, what? As he collapsed onto the ground, Alphard's muttering voice could be heard. The blasphemer, with his long tongue hanging outside, kicked the ground with a posture low enough that it could almost be said that he was lying on the ground. The speed of the bright light will never be late enough to not reach its opponent. 
In order to avoid this approaching arrow, you would need a physical ability comparable to that of Reinhardt or Roy, we admired you, Ni nee Summer, Ni nee Summer, who hates to show his hard work to others, would use such devilish skills in desperation, how would we not know that Sue? Julius, what are you saying? Roy, thinking we wouldn't know, Julius Ni nee Summer is truly innocent. But, we love that part of you Sue. Ya ha 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 Sue. Alphard jumps around the ground and avoids the magic, with a movement that suggested that he already knew that trump card would be used. Ricardo subsequently runs to strike Alphard, who had escaped the magic, but that pursuit too was a move which he had anticipated. Ricardo plunges into him in front of the river, as daggers collide and sparks scatter. Ricardo was overwhelmingly superior in strength. Alphard countered the strength difference with unimaginably skilled sword handling. The cobblestone breaks and reigns beside the blasphemer. At the same time, Ricardo cried out as Alphard slashed into his shaggy torso. Roy, low tilde okay, a stub of dog meat zoo. Hard and luscious meat, should be made sticky and soft to make it easier to eat to make it easier to bite to make it easier to digest to make it easier to shit out to make it easier to decompose to make it easier to fertilize vegetables and after it makes all that so easy the meat should be eaten to start the cycle 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 of the food chain Sue. Ah uh, H, how wonderful Sue. Ricardo, NGH, GH, GHK. The speed of Alphard, who had given that quick speech, and has daggers attached on both of his arms, was not something extraordinary, his growth period had not ended yet, and his body has still not toughened, however, his physical ability had contradicted those looks till now, as he rips into Ricardo's body, who was all defensive. Julius, Ricardo. Fur-like wires and thick muscles. Ricardo's body, which was like an armor itself compared to the normal human body, had suffered no wound by any technique till now with the exception of Alphard's attack. With eyes wide open, Julius was stunned by looking at Ricardo's bleeding wound. Alphard attacks with high-speed moves, each move targeting and aiming precisely at the joints and thin parts of the fur. Regardless of the qualities of Ricardo's body, if you get attacked at the key areas, you will get hurt, you will shed blood, and you will lose your life. Julius, H.K. At the moment Julius saw the bombardment of blows, Julius summoned the quasi-spirit once again. The slashes of wind mixed with the flames of a fire, the sword commanded the quasi-spirits of two colors Ya of, fire, and Aro of, wind. From the side, a slash with a reddish flame heads towards Alphard. Roy, yes, we knew that pattern already too Sue. Julius, wa? Roy, that surprise is completely honest Sue. Our stomach will not have any difficulty either Sue. However, Alphard was ridiculously unaffected by it, with one arm precisely attacking and with eyes at the back, to see whether what he thought would happen, as he kicked into his empty torso. His heel penetrates into the abdominal muscles, as if he broke into Julius, who was working extremely hard in this situation, just like the person he is. At the front, just when Ricardo started his counter-attack, his toe launched itself right into his lower jaw. Roy, how nice how nice, this has become fun Sue. That knee nice summer is. That Ricardo San is. They both are fighting this great battle and we are their opponent. Even though us, with our weak bodies, absolutely can't do it, can't reach it, can't see it, can't understand it, should have already had given up in this position Sue. Ah uh, H. To make it so fun, Ho oh, w unfair 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 Sue. Julius and Ricardo fell to their knees at the same time. Alphard, who stops their pursuit, repeatedly somersaults on the stone pavement, as if to keep the two under pressure. They must take his incredible skill and childlike brutality under consideration. Ricardo, this is, much more than what I heard. Even so, the hell is that guy, pisses me off. The way he walks, the way he talks, everything about him's you so creepy. Ricardo, who barely ever gets hurt and barely had any older scratches, said that with a foggy voice while licking the wounds on his arms. Julius rises, taking heavy breaths, and also agreed with Ricardo's anger. Julius, it's the same as City Hall. No, just his behavior is still equally incomprehensible. It may be an attempt to mock us, 
but it's counterproductive and nothing else. Roy, even if you say that, it's always the human knee summer hiding his feelings of worry from the non-human Ricardo-san, no? We said that we already know about that Sue. Julius, you bastard. Clasping his hands, Alphard laughs uncontrollably, and Julius sends the quasi-spirit of, water, Kua, under Ricardo to heal his wounds as he stepped ahead. Ricardo, ah. Hey, Julius. Don't go out there. Julius, you just quietly stay here, till your wounds heal enough that the bleeding stops. Pointing his night sword forward, Julius dashes towards Alphard. However, the movement now was clearly not the same as the one before. In the sharp steps and slashes, Alphard, who received the first attack, felt his eyebrow get slightly slashed. Roy, this is. Julius, the power of the quasi-spirit of, Yang, in, and at the same time. Roy, oh? Alphard's question overlapped with the responding voice. Julius' long legs jump up and kick down Alphard's head, pushing down the blasphemer's cheeks into defeat. This time, his defense wouldn't make it in time. His hanging arms lag behind, and rolling his eyes, Alphard turns and desperately attempts to dodge. Roy, Ua Kia. The one right now, was? Julius, my quasi-spirit of, Yang. The one with my sword is the quasi-spirit of, Yin, it is a mutual partnership that improves physical ability. This, was a first-timer for you, isn't it? Roy, oh, he he, as you'd ext Julius Summer is wonderful. Still loaded with charm that neither we nor us knew about, isn't it Sue? Julius, dash? With his cheeks dyed red, Alphard looks at Julius with flushed eyes. At the moment Julius frowned at that warm gaze, Alphard removed and threw away the dagger attached to his arm. A shrill sound echoed as it pounded on the cobblestone. Immediately afterwards, his heel breaks the cobblestone. Roy, as it seems like you cannot surprise us with swords, this time we intend to see it by using fists Sue. Julius, GHHK. Alphard closed the distance in the blink of an eye, as he launched the bottom of his palm while twisting his waist. Julius countered it with his empty left hand, but the shock penetrated right through his arm into his chest. Unimaginably, the forceful lurch from the ground and the twisting of the waist had increased the destructive force of his palm strike, and Julius, with no time lag, was sent flying. If Subaru would have had witnessed this sight, he would have had thought of a car accident. Roy, our fists that have taken down more than 800 people. We suppose they shook up Ni Summer down to his bones medulla's comma no? This was also an equally violent sight, like a car unable to stop runs over and sends the defenseless human beings flying. Julius could not afford to respond to Alphard's crazed smile. His chest bones, his internal organs all got crushed, blood floods onto his clothes and his tall body gets blown away. Ricardo, who was being treated, quickly responds to the situation. Ricardo, Julius, watch out. Ricardo hugs and defends Julius, who was unexpectedly going to crash into the wall straight from his head. Even the enormous dog got swallowed into the impact and got knocked into the building, crushing the stones. Ricardo, who had rushed to help Julius, shakes his head as a plume of dirt rose. The blood in his head concentrates in one side, and he spat out the blood in his throat to prevent choking. Ricardo, spirits. Don't know if you can hear me, but your master's in trouble. Get to work. Think about me later. Whether it was thanks to Ricardo's call or not, the blue light pours its power into Julius' dying body. When he was at least made safe from dying, Ricardo jumped out in frustration into the brisk situation after a good amount of break he had taken from the fight. Roy, welcome back. Would you like to have a meal? Would you like to have a treat? Or perhaps... DNNR. -er. Ricardo, get your tongue back inside your damn mouth, damn brat. I'll teach you what happens when you make fun of adults shoe like the brats at our place. Roy, oh well oh well, let's not take it any further. We don't want a dog as a meal anyway. If you don't want to play with swords or fists, are you fine with this? Alphard, with a smile, spreads his hands, and Ricardo immediately increased his alertness. Ricardo chews his teeth fiercely, 
and was unable to take off his eyes from that. In the waterway behind Alfard, a stream of water rises with a whirlpool which looked like the neck of a water dragon to Ricardo. Ricardo, sword skill, martial arts, and this time, magic. Zhu what the hell are ya? Roy, we are anonymous non-practicing magicians, who couldn't even be looked at with pride by our family. Something like that Sue. Immediately after Alfard rolled his tongue outside, the head of the water stream heads towards Ricardo. Although that's just water, its momentum and mass was enough to crush a living being's body. On top of that, there was Julius behind him, so he couldn't choose to avoid it either. Ricardo, you've done it now. Ha, ha, ha. Opening his large mouth and his body clamped onto the ground, Ricardo released a raw wave. Out of the three deputy commanders of the Iron Fang, two of them had already shown their ability to cooperate their attack of this raw wave. However, originally, Mimi had developed this technique by imitating Ricardo, and Ricardo argues that it is originally his. However, compared to Mimi who reduces the burden by dispersing it, raw wave used by a single person is a huge burden to the body. The destructive roar bursts out of Ricardo's throat as he felt muddy water fall on his body which was clinging onto the ground. Roy, wow, amazing Sue. Unable to hear the voice of admiration, Ricardo's roar wave crashes into the stream of muddy water. The wave collides right from the front, and splashes the water away, and the water with a mass of several tons scatters and evaporates into mist. After a few seconds, the destroyed muddy stream hits the plaza like rain, flooding the stone pavement, and sends the leaning Ricardo crashing down. Ricardo, that, sure was something, even the edge of my mouth, got a bit cut, huh? The residual damage itself left Ricardo blank for a long time, which further burdened him after the raw wave. Breathing on his shoulder, Ricardo, however, still managed to get up because of his feelings. Alfard was completely unaffected, without showing any signs of exhaustion, he was just dancing there. Roy, amazing amazing Sue. It's been a while since we have seen someone endure that. So long that there is not a trace of it in either ours or our memory. How nice, quite nice, pretty nice, maybe it is nice, isn't it nice, possibly it is nice, perhaps it is nice, probably it is nice, because it is probably nice Sue. Question mark colon your repetitive speech ends here. Roy, Velp, it's Nee Summer's grand return. Scarily, cutely, enviably. In front of Alfard, who shook his head, Julius was standing next to Ricardo. His face was pale, and his night uniform was dyed in blood. His breath was even faintly stuttering, and it was completely impossible to say that he was in his top shape. Although that cannot be said. Julius, thanks for the help, Ricardo. Ricardo, I sure did help ya. I'll have you report my efforts properly to miss so that I get that temporary bonus. Julius, about that, I assure you that you can feel absolutely unworried about that from my side. Grabbing his knight sword, Julius tapped on Ricardo's shoulder and subsequently glanced at Alfard. Sensing that gaze, the blasphemer smiled, with dyed cheeks, and twisted his lips irritatingly. His facial expressions, actions, even his way of fighting, were all packed with a sense of creepiness and spook. Or perhaps, that itself was related to his authority of, gluttony. Julius, with such prowess in using swords, martial arts, and even magic, why did you align with evil? That power could have had been put to use for something else, something better. Roy, somewhere else ha. Huh? Giving some examples, what would Nee Summer consider in that? Nee Summer, even his way of addressing was unsettling. Every time Alfard's tongue touches it, every time he says that with a flamboyant tone and stuck-up attitude, that word loses its value for Julius. Even though he has no family members that call him that. Julius, for example, a knight. For example, a mercenary. For example, a hero. Unkempt power easily falls into the hands of evil, and strength turns into forceful violence. That's why. Roy, we thought you'd say so Sue. We thought you'd say that, and Z Summer. We thought that the Nee Summer we know, that the Nee Summer we trust, would say that. We thought so Sue. Abruptly putting a halt onto the conversation, 
Alphard jumps and approaches Julius. He holds his knight sword vertically and slashes down that kick. As if he had plates of iron attached onto his heels, the slash fails to do any damage. Alphard sharply turns and continues his barrage of kicks from a low angle, as he swings and dances on the spot, as he further pushes Julius to make him crash into the scaffold. At his intense and strong moves, even Ricardo loses the track of his timing and becomes unable to interrupt. Roy, do you remember, when we were kids? When we had gotten sick and broken down, we had asked me summer whether we could bring an upper from the tree in the garden zoo. Julius, saying things on your own accord. Why would I remember? Stop enforcing your own arbitrary delusions onto others. Roy, us and Nee Summer were still small, and Nee Summer first said that it was impossible, told us to give up Sue. Do you remember? Don't you remember? But we, just because Nee Summer had tried to stop us, ended up wanting that upper even more Sue. When we had done what Nee Summer said was impossible, we thought that we did an amazing job. Our confidence increased. We really thought Tha T. Julius, what are you, what are you saying? I am unaware of any such thing. Unaware. Julius accepts his kicks, his heel, his round kick, his straight kick, his high jump kick, his somersault, his backspin kick with his night sword. His arms were numb, his internal organs were scarred with pain, and he could feel the taste of blood in his mouth. No, it was different from the taste of pure blood, as this was his blood mixed with vomit. He bit his lips. He, just now, for some reason. He could not help but listen carefully to Alphard's delusion. Roy, because of what happened afterwards, we are Sue. We are Sue. Ni nee Summer is Sue. Julius, H.K. Roy, we always, always thought about it Sue. We always, always felt it Sue. That it was different. That it was just some luggage Sue. How that used to be. How's that now? What a nice feeling. So it was such a feeling. At H, this feels so nice. We finally get it. Julius, I know absolutely nothing, nothing about you. Julius got pushed into becoming more and more violent. Holding back his knight sword with immense strength, he tries to attack whenever he found a gap in Alphard's position. Striking down, piercing into, kicking in, pounding, entangling, dodging. A slash dyed with anger and hostility cuts through the air, and Alphard's hair, which were too late to avoid it, get slashed off and fall to the ground. Even still, it was not just the slash which should be paid attention to. Julius, Ya. Kua. Aro. Ik. Nez. In. With the names of the quasi-spirits called out, they started spinning like a magical cast, and they were the spirits contracted with the spirit knight, with their names called out, the six colors of the quasi-spirits increase in radiance, turning the mere affirmation of their existence into a powerful force and pouring it all onto the opponent of their knight. The six colored lights surround Alphard from all six directions, blocking any path to escape. Julius, with this, it ends. Julius had firm belief in his victory as Alphard could no longer escape. The power pushes straight through the middle of Alphard's chest. Roy, palm of the fist king. The dark palm in front of his chest collides with the knight's sword in between and crushes it into pieces. Debris scatters, and the deadly stab loses its effectiveness. However, there was still the magic that was left. Roy, magic. An unexpected and confusing magical power swells up behind Alphard and slashes down all six of the approaching magic. The magic of one color clashes with the magic of that same color, and all magic gets cancelled out. Finally, the eyes of Julius, who had supposedly sealed this attack's victory, open. Roy, snake of the twin swords. Alphard's toes toss up a dagger which he was supposed to have had thrown away. It got pushed into this place by Julius' attack. Receiving the spinning blades with both of his hands, Alphard's body rotates. A storm of slashes blew up, and Julius used just his broken knight sword. Roy, Nee Summer threw that upper out. That's why we hate Nee Summer. An arm sharply cut from the elbow swings into the air and fell onto the cobblestone, making a sound. Arc 5, 
Chapter 54, Combat Power of Non-Combatants Gluttony. Sue. Before the nightmare that stood in front, Otto could not help but have cold sweat run down his back. The opponent who identified as a sin archbishop the name of Gluttony had already been heard by Otto. However, that name was. Otto, from what I heard, the name of the sin archbishop of Gluttony was supposed to be Roy Alphard though. Question mark colon arare, you have already met us before meeting us? If so, then, only I san, to be left uneaten and coming out normally is quite impressive indeed, especially when anything is a treat for Roy of bizarre eating. The boy, who claimed to be Le Batonkatos, smiled and laughed at Otto's question. Hearing that laughter, Otto knew that his terrible idea was affirmed. There are two, sin archbishops of gluttony. Otto, no, to be accurate, at least two of them. Lay and Roy, rather, the duo of Batonkatos and Alphard? At worst, it may be necessary to assume that they were a nightmare like the great rabbit of the myriads. Julius and Ricardo were supposed to go and capture Gluttony's control tower, but if the one waiting there wasn't alone, then, rather than a tough struggle, it would be an inevitable defeat. Question mark colon hey. Is this the time to talk and get along with that bastard? This isn't the time for all that. Otto had the nerves of his gut seemingly sharp and accompanying a burning sensation on his forehead. What interrupted his thoughts at that moment was an extremely feminine voice. Of course, Otto also noticed the owner of that voice, because he had noticed that there were puzzles as well. Otto, why is felt summer here? I'm sure Reinhardt San told you to stay quietly in an evacuation center. Felt, when the city is in this condition, as if I would ignore that and go and sit in a small corner of the evacuation center. The girl with blonde hair and red eyes said bravely. A person who stood out, with there being no possibility of mistaking her for someone else, that's who felt was. Otto, with that restlessness, what you first see after jumping out is an encounter with a sin archbishop, ha. Huh. Now that that has happened, my defeat is inevitable because of my bad luck. Lay, you don't need to be so pessimistic, Oni I san. For us, any encounter is a spice to gourmet. We are supposed to be gluttony but, we completely understand the importance of preparation Sue. Batonkatos was at the center, with Otto and Felt standing in a position that made a triangle. On the remaining vertice, stood another figure, with whom Otto seemed to be familiar. Otto, I am happy to see you again, Kiritaka-san. Kiritaka, quiet voice with dead eyes and unable to take things obediently, Kun. I don't understand the feeling though. The figure of Kiritaka, who was covered in thin bandages and was in pain, stood in front of Otto. Despite his presence, Otto was not rejoicing at seeing him. When Otto escaped the headquarters of Mew's company, he ran into gluttony, making his fate uncertain. He is happy to have had survived that, but the actors on the current stage still made things uncertain. And that is, Otto, along with Felton Kiritaka, got the same thought at the same time. Proper combatants were needed here. Otto, there are three groups, all of which are non-combatants, who have encountered a main force among the enemy. What a bad joke this is. Please just stop. Felt, I don't think that my allies, would be coming any time soon. Right back at you Ni-chan, you rely on just yourself too much, Felt told Otto. Otto, as well, could not make any excuses at this point. Behind Felt is a humongous-looking servant who wore a tough appearance. Kiritaka also had some members of the White Dragon Scales with him. It was only Otto who was alone. Lei, we're saying that it will be the same no matter how many people you gather. If it's you guys, then this thirst of ours can never be healed Sue. Oh uh, H, where are you, we're looking for you, we want to meet you, we want to meet you, let us meet you. Otto and the others were surrounded by pessimism regarding their fighting strength, but Batonkatos arbitrarily displayed his selfish attitude. Otto, want to meet? Just, what on earth are you saying? Otto tried to continue the conversation by picking up his words. On the margin of Batonkato's reasonability. If it came down to it, Otto could be knocked down in a moment. Buying even the slightest of time there was a need to create that gap, at all costs. Lay, 
It would indeed be troublesome to explain it so many times, ha. Huh? We can't afford to have our mouths broken by others either Sue. That'd be the worst, won't that be the worst, it would be the absolute worst, wouldn't that be the worst, isn't that the worst is what we're saying. With steep expressions, Felt and Kiritaka shook their heads at Batankato's words. Rather than being answered, it seemed as if they were being questioned by multiple people. And, as that conversation got unexpectedly established, Otto continued to stare as he was unable to talk to Gluttony. But still, Otto, with his divine protection of soul language, could talk to even those beings which could not possibly have a human's will. Let's negotiate. No matter what the challenge may be, it would still be better than the problem Subaru was surrounded by. Please, lend me your strength, Natsuki-san. Otto, by saying that, I might actually become stronger. Please, try and talk to me. The one which was mentioned in the request, could it perhaps be that you are talking about the artificial spirit? Quite a dangerous step. That choice of words, that stubborn tone could easily ignite Batankato's fuse. But, Batankato swung his head. When the young boy received Otto's words with the intention of responding to the conversation, he laughed joyfully. Lei, who we want to know is only one. The one, who did the broadcast from earlier. The hero who did it, is the one we are searching for. I take back those words. After all, Subaru did not lend me his power, and neither do I want to lend away his name. Lei, that beloved, beloved hero seems to have come to cast his judgment upon us. This small chest, is hurting in search of high M. Su. Otto, the coming of a person of such a troublesome nature, can he even manage to do anything at all, that person? If he was really here, keep Andrea Ming. Is what he would have had said, but there is no point in citing curses on part those who aren't present here in the first place. At Otto's reaction, Felt frowned. Felt, I told you that you will only waste time by talking. Who is going to sell away, their family anyway? Even for my merciless self, there are no doubts in that, except for Reinhardt Koma I'm not sure about him. Otto, I am sorry to hear such an evaluation, but I won't say anything because I saw Felt Summer captured in that descent. The rough Felt, did not say a word which answered Batankato's query. The same went for Kiritaka. Both of them immediately knew that Batankato's request was Subaru, and immediately discarded it. That judgment was good as a person, or was undoubtedly too hasty in this situation. With this rapid exchange, Subaru ended up not being sold away. Otto, this person messed it up. This girl and the others are just impatient, and by hearing the speech of the hero you are looking for, got excited and jumped out of the evacuation center, it's all just mere impatience. Felt, who h? Kiritaka, sh. Otto's story made Felt float on the blue line. And, the one who quietened her was Kiritaka. As expected of the head merchant of the Muse Company, he immediately understood Otto's judgment. At the same time, their gaze and line of sight match. On his gaze, Otto drew in his chin. Otto, if you don't want to answer any questions, then I shall guide you to the hero. I also want my life. I demand its security, however. Lei, really? You know? You know it? The place where our hero is. The figure of our beloved hero. That weak and fragile, unable to help anything unless he is supported, that person. Otto? Yes, ah, uh, yes. Otto nods, as he recognizes the sense of incongruity in the spirit of Batankato's words. As if he knew a lot about Subaru. Calling out for his hero, and also taking such deep notice of the person named Natsuki Subaru. Otto, no, I will guide you. However, Otto got confused about it. It was regarding Subaru. It would not be surprising if two or three Sin Archbishops already knew about his face. Maybe all the members should not be included after all, greed, gluttony, lust, wrath they were all of them. But that was all of them in the first place. Lei, you have a face that is frowning badly, only I san hu h. Otto, there is no need for you to care so much. Rather than that, what will you do? Killing every one of us at this place, 
or guaranteeing the lives of everyone here and encountering the hero in return. What do you choose to do? Lei, what a nasty way of talking, you are a dealer, aren't you? Such kinds of things in which you have to use your brains, neither we nor us are good at it. Otto, if that's the case, then choosing what is recommended and seeing it for yourself isn't so bad either. That is a saying among the merchants though. Lei, hum. There was initiative in the conversation. Batankatos was really obedient for a sin archbishop. It felt just like he was simply a child, and a distorted imbalance made him project himself as a monster. Maybe, he is just a pitiable young boy after all. Lei, just now, you pitied us, didn't you? Just when such feelings gathered inside the inner part of Otto's heart, Batankato said that with a brisk voice in a low tone, Otto, huh? Lei, those eyes, we remember them. Those are eyes which look down upon. Those are eyes which are scornful. With those eyes, thinking that we are some product? A H, is that so? We were getting a nasty feeling since earlier. Otto continued to watch as Batankato's eyes became filled with complete disgust and hostility. Lei, you, are a merchant, right? Putting price tags on things, they are people who sell them to line their own pockets. Human values and opinions too, everything, everything. They are dead people who put them on a scale and calculate, aren't they? Otto, that is. Somewhat, I think there is a little difference in opinions here. As clouds of doubt began to form, Otto, whose mind was already tight-roped, also got blindfolded. Did he manage to get his message across that was a question whose answer was clearly visible on the expressions of Felt and Kiritaka, who had done nothing but witness the discussion? Lei, who the hell will listen to what you guys are saying Sue? After all, this world is gluttonous drinking Sue. Gluttony Sue. Until we have eaten it, licked it, swallowed it, we will not trust it. Batankatos shouted while stepping ahead, displaying his fangs. The crisis could not be stopped. No explosion or word could get close to this explosive. Felt, so it did end up like this in the end, didn't it? Saying this with dissatisfaction, Felt held her knife in her hand. Strangely enough, what Batankatos had were also short knives attached on both his hands. Nonetheless, there would be a huge difference in the skill level. Kiritaka, if it has come to this, the ones to rely on are every one of the white dragon scales. Question mark colon hey hey. For once, I'm saying we're also here. The fellow who was next to Felt raised his voice, but Felt swung her head. Which means, it will be quite a lively show. Someone like Subaru would only prove to be useless in this scene. Otto, just by thinking that, the value of that person gets significantly reduced. Ha! Huh. Lei, is your talking, Duni? Batankatos, slowly, looked at the, the faces of Otto and the rest. An expression of fighting was on everyone's face. Looking at that, Batankatos nodded with satisfaction. Lei, in gourmet, preparations and ingredients are important. Starting from assembling the good ingredients available, only then will the virtue of the dish be eatable Sue. Otto, I sort of get it, I sort of don't get it. Lei, it's fine even if you don't understand Sue. Neither have we ever thought, that our aesthetics can be understood by anyone except a Sue. No W, well then, about time. Let's eat. The conversation cemented the fate. Batankatos, opening his large mouth, approached Otto with a tremendously powerful jump. Otto, who was standing next to water, pointed his finger towards the blasphemer. Otto, I am glad that the assurance has been given. Lei, who h? Otto, this is how it is. Otto makes a high sound twice with his shoes in front of the doubtful Batankatos. Hearing that sound, something was drawn closer. Lei, Sue. Behind Otto, a flock of water dragons jumped out of the waterway and charged towards Batankatos in a single stroke. Otto had managed to brainwash the herd of water dragons, accompanied by the immense influence of the authority of Roth. The authority of Roth, with its ultra-wide range, even if it didn't cover the entire city, greatly shook the emotions of people, planting the seeds of faint spirit among the citizens, resulting in enormous disarray and suspicion. Nevertheless, 
the recent speech by Natsuki Subaru raised the people's morale, which was also the basis of Otto's hypothesis of using the water dragon's strength. Lei, O, O H Su? Batankato's, midair, could not stop the largely numbered water dragons. With their limbless and serpentine body structures, and weight that was not below a hundred kilos, the multiple bodies crushed Batankato's. As they continued glaring with their blue and white scales, their fangs continuously aimed for the crushed Batankato's. Lay, hunting water dragons is cruel. With their fangs on their prey, they spin and tear the flesh apart. That small body would turn into countless pieces of meat, even without such an enormous number of water dragons. The aftermath won't be good. Due to the influence of the authority of Roth, the water dragons were in a strong and excited state, and were skillfully deceived by words with the divine protection of soul language. Felt, amazing. This, was done by Ni Chan. Felt ran up, as she rose to cheer. Despite not moving a single eyebrow seeing this cruel scene, only now does it seem that she had been moved. Otto, what I did was to give just a pinch to the water dragons. Whether it's a sin archbishop or not, he cannot win against nature. Kiritaka, possibly so but. You are, a person who can do much more horrible things than what I thought. Otto, anyway, I am glad we're okay. Kiritaka-san too, to think that you survived. Kiritaka, I did indeed get injured on my back but, White Dragon Scales, which is a famous mercenary group, helped me out with their expertise in medical treatment. However, it unquestionably looked painful. Still, what could be the reason for which Kiritaka was still on the move, even with such an injury? Understanding the meaning behind Otto's gaze, Kiritaka put his hands on his chest with a look that reeked of seriousness. Kiritaka, it is decided, isn't it? I have the position of executive in Priestella's management. I heard the broadcast, but I cannot leave everything to it. Otto, I believe that spirit is commendable but... Kiritaka, of course, there is a low possibility of me being able to fight properly and be of any help. But, for once, even I should be able to do something. Kiritaka shamefully made that remark after the effect of the authority of Roth and Subaru's speech. Indeed, it had been Subaru's speech which provided a support to the citizens, and it was a medicine too strong for people who already had strong missions to complete. To the extent, that it disabled the fear and reason that would normally stop a person from doing such reckless acts. Felt, that's just recklessness, don't go about thinking such things. Reading Otto's thoughts, Felt said this with sharpened lips. Felt, everyone has the right to fight for the things important to them. Nobody can stop the feeling of someone who wants to do something for those things, even if it is not backed by a great reason, can they? Otto, that is. An individual opinion, and such a judgment should not be taken by someone who is in a responsible position. Felt, it depends on the things. Also, I never said that this applied for this situation, did I both me, and those guys, came out only because we could win. Otto, win, you say? Following Kiritaka, Felt rubbed under her nose with her finger. Felt, I also heard Ni-chan's speech. That stupid Reinhardt too, along with you, went to the city government building. Everyone except me, isn't that right? Unfairly enough, what Felt was feeling right now was a misunderstanding. In this world, just as there are right words to fit, there are also some things that can only be done by those humans who are apt enough. Just as that theory, Otto stopped pursuing further, since he seemed to not know the reason why he was here. Otto, is Heinkel she properly captured? Felt, he is kept at Camberley's shelter. Me and Gaston were going back to take what was taken. What was taken, saying that, Felt turned her jaw towards Gaston. Gaston held a white packet in his hands, and it looked like a long spear. Otto, that is? Felt, old man Rom. It seems to be a secret weapon that he kept in our staff's bag. It's a magic tool, I mean. Otto, magic tool? How convenient for such a timing. Ideally, the intimidating power of the magic tool would make it possible to have results that would normally not be possible. After hearing that it was a magical tool, one's expectations were bound to increase. 
felt, the conditions for using it are a pain, but it's worth it for its power. Even so, this thing can come in handy in cleaning up the mess Ni Chan is in. Question mark colon HK, Felt's words may not have had, but what entered Otto's ears at that moment was a scream. Otto looks back to where it came from, and Felt and Kiritaka react by widening their eyes. They didn't hear that scream anymore. It's obvious. As it was the scream of a voice incomprehensible to humans. Lay, they seem to be a much more fun opponent than we thought booty. Mere water lizards are no food, are they? Whether it's for us gourmet or for any other gastronomer, they're unattable. A voice was heard, a voice that seemed to be able to beat up and defeat anything in this world. At the same time, the flock of water dragons which should have had been jumping around and preying upon that prey. Their figures, with their tails, torsos, heads now disheveled, were extremely excited at the time of the initial attack, but their painful suffering and their flowing blood conveyed the abnormality of the situation to everyone. Otto, felt summer, this magic tool. Is powerful, right? Felt, from what old man Rom said, even Reinhardt can't avoid it, you know? Otto, I see. That is certainly assuring. Kiritaka-san. Kiritaka, W what is it? Felt, who received that answer, and Kiritaka, who had an expression of despair after seeing the water dragons. Him leaving behind the white dragon scales were still, for the non-combatant Kiritaka, very dangerous. Otto, me, Felt Summer, and every one of the white dragon scales will buy time. In that time, Kiritaka-san should go to the city government building. No, first go to the eight evacuation center of the town. Kiritaka, go there, is there something over there? Otto, if you go there, you will understand everything. The one who can win, which Kiritaka-san will subsequently send here, is present there. Seeing Otto's determined face as he made that declaration, Kiritaka, changing his expression, nodded powerfully. He then turned back towards his guards. Kiritaka, it's just as you heard. I will, from now, just as Otto she instructed, head for the evacuation center. I want you to stay here, and fight along with them. To protect this city. Question mark colon our work is to be young man's guard. That's what it's supposed to be, when did it become such a bothersome position? Kiritaka, that's wrong. Your job is not to be my guard. Help me with my purpose, was the first contract. In front of the bitterly smiling faces of the white dragon scales, Kiritaka answered with a face that showed utmost seriousness. The reason why his way of addressing his way of self-reference became further polite, was because the city meant much more to Kiritaka than just having a responsible position in it. Kiritaka, help me with my purpose, white dragon scales. To protect our important workplace priestella, and let's fight to save our beloved songstress, Liliana. Question mark colon even though turning back would be impossible. Kiritaka, it has nothing to do with not being able to smile again, or what lies in my thoughts. I love Liliana, and I need no more reason to put my life in danger. Saying that, Kiritaka looked at Otto and felt. At the same time, he lifted the bag he was holding in his hands. Kiritaka, without fail, let's show that we can do it. Because no one knows the navigation of this city and Liliana more than me. Felt, for a moment, I thought it was cool but it's all disappointing in the end. Otto agreed with Felt's impression, but he did not mention it, he nodded silently seeing Kiritaka's preparations. Lay, about time, are you prepared? The movements of the agitated water dragons had stopped, and stripped of their white eyes, they were close to dying. Through the gap in that group, Batankato slowly appeared. The blasphemer shaped like a young boy, embraced his shoulders and happily asserted himself as an adversary, and glared. Lay, wasn't that nice, that counter-attack? Recklessness and braveness are different, and abandonment and persistence too are absolutely unlike. That's a face that knows about that. We're glad. Finally, you guys too, got the qualification to be taken to our dinner table. Felt, till now everything we did was just worth going into the trash can ha, huh? this guy, has everything messed up. Otto, whether being recognized as the enemy is good or bad is again different. 
Personally, I think that those who get disdained, can still do a lot. Did he get this idea by being around Subaru? Or could it be that his thoughts had been influenced by Subaru? How bad would that be? Anyway. Otto, Kiritaka-san. Kiritaka, I wish for good fortune in the upcoming battle for you. Following Otto's call, Kiritaka ran to leave this place. Just one person, Baton Kato's, tilted his head after seeing the figure of Kiritaka, who was trying to escape from the battlefield. Lei, just Shto P. After how you've gently stimulated our motivation and this feeling of hunger. Following the back of the escaping Kiritaka, Baton Kato's body jumped forward. Fully using his small body, his aerial speed in a single direction was unbelievably fast. With the same pace, Baton Kato's fangs pass straight through and reach Kiritaka they were on their verge to do so. Felt, Gaston. Gaston, if I die here, I'll cry and come to haunt you after becoming a spirit. Felt's voice ripped through the air and the giant, who jumped at almost the same time, interrupted Baton Kato's course. Crossing his arms in front of his face and curling his back, it was Felt's servant, Gaston. Lay, don't get in the wah why. Swinging the daggers of his arms, Baton Kato's tried to cut down the hindrance. The steel blade shines brightly, and its blow struck Gaston's exposed arm. Sounds echoed, and Baton Kato's dagger broke. Lay, who h? Baton Kato's questioning voice was accompanied by Otto's. They had seen what had happened. Gaston's position did not change at all. With his arm, he broke Baton Kato's dagger. Felt, my giant is pretty tough. Enough to be my guard. The happy felt, who seemed to think that they scared him off, threw the knife she held in her hands towards Baton Kato's. Baton Kato's avoided it with the same momentum as he avoided Gaston's kick. Just as he somersaulted backwards towards the open distance, the white dragon scales changed their positions and blocked the road. Kiritaka's retreat, had become a reality. Lei, hum, he why. We see. The overwhelming existence called Baton Kato's was outnumbered, but the pleasant smile that was sticking to his face did not cease. With the same pace, Baton Kato's glanced at the opposing Otto. Lei, the number of people Louis is likely to be pleased with, is three ha. Whispering with a trembling sigh, he removed the broken dagger from his arm. Now his left arm was bare-handed, and only his right hand was armed. Otto, for some reason, I feel the gap hasn't been filled at all. As usual, Otto's warning bell continued to respond to this, the greatest of threats. Ignoring that voice in his head, Otto looked at Felt. That unchanging face, determinedly, looked at the intense battle. Let's fight, without the option of running away. Otto, considering the amount of opportunities of fighting I have gotten in the past year, what will I even do as a merchant? The voice that spilled from that mouth did not reach anyone. Henceforth, no one noticed that the voice had a pessimistic tone not because of the content of the words in it.